The Senate will convene as a court of impeachment. The chaplain will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal Lord God, send your Holy Spirit into this chamber. Permit our senators to feel your presence during this impeachment trial. Illuminate their minds with the light of your wisdom, exposing truth and resolving uncertainties. May they understand that you created them with cognitive capabilities and moral discernment to be used for your glory. Grant that they will comprehend what really matters, separating the relevant from the irrelevant. Lord, keep them from fear as they believe that your truth will triumph through them. Eliminate discordant static with the music of your wisdom. We pray in your great name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Senators will please be seated. If there is no objection, the journal of proceedings of the trial are approved to date. The Deputy Sergeant at Arms will make the proclamation. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment while the Senate of the United States is sitting for the trial of the Articles of Impeachment exhibited by the House of Representatives against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. Mr. Chief the Majority Justice. Leader is recognized. The Senate will conduct another question and answer period today. We were able to get through nearly 100 questions yesterday. Senators posed constructive questions and the parties were succinct and responsive. So I'd like to compliment all who participated yesterday. We will again break every two to three hours and look to take a break for dinner around 6.30. We've been respectful of the Chief Justice's unique position in reading our questions, and I want to be able to continue to assure him that that level of consideration for him will continue. Mr. Chief Justice. Oh, the Senator from Washington. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. Senator Murray asks the House managers, yesterday when asked about why the House did not amend or reissue subpoenas after it passed its resolution authorizing its impeachment inquiry, the House managers touched upon the House having the sole power of impeachment as specified by Article I of the Constitution. Could you further elaborate as to why that authority controls despite any arguments brought forth by members of the defense team contesting the validity of those subpoenas. Mr. Chief Justice and uh, Senators, that's a good question. The answer is that these were validly issued subpoenas under the House rules. The White House argument to the contrary is wrong, and it would have profound negative implications for how Congress and our democracy function. 
On January 9th, 2019, the House adopted its rules like we do every Congress, and these rules gave the committee the power to issue subpoenas. They're not ambiguous rules, and here is the relevant portion of Rule 11 on slide 55. The House's standing rules give each committee subpoena power for the purpose of carrying out any of its functions and duties as it considers necessary. This investigation began on September 9th, before the Speaker's announcement on September 24th that it would become part of the impeachment inquiry umbrella. The President doesn't dispute that the subpoenas issued by these committees were fully within their respective jurisdiction. The argument is that somehow, by declaring that this investigation also falls under an inquiry to consider articles of impeachment, which gives Congress actually greater authority, that somehow it nullifies the traditional oversight authority, and this just doesn't make any sense. Now, the President counters that we have to take a full vote on impeachment first because that's what's been done in the past. In the Nixon inquiry, however, the Judiciary Committee needed a House resolution to delegate subpoena power, and that's different than the committee standing rules today. President actually compels the opposite conclusion. Several federal judges have been investigated, impeached, and convicted in the Senate without the House having ever taken an official vote to authorize the inquiry, and a federal court recently confirmed there was no need for a formal vote of the full House to commence impeachment proceedings. But even assuming a House vote was necessary, there was a vote. The text of House Resolution 660 declared that the six investiga investigative committees of the House were directed to continue their ongoing investigations as part of the existing House of Representatives inquiry and in whether there were sufficient grounds uh, for the House of Representatives to exercise its constitutional power to impeach. And the committee report which accompanies the res resolution specifically described the subpoenas that had been issued by the investigating committees and said, quote, all subpoenas to the executive branch remain in full force. So why didn't the House committee just reissue these subpoenas after the resolution? Short answer is they didn't need to. The subpoenas were already fully authorized. In any event, even after the resolution passed, the committees issued subpoenas to Mick Mulvaney, Robert Blair, four other witnesses, and the President continued to block those subpoenas. The argument about a full House vote really is just an excuse about President Trump's obstruction. The President refused to comply with the House subpoenas before the House vote and after the House vote. The only logical explanation is the one that President Trump gave us all along. He was determined to fight all the subpoenas because in tr President Trump's view, according to what he said, he can do whatever he wants. Now that's not what the Constitutional Republic entrusted to us by the founders had in mind. This argument doesn't just imply to impeachment. It would imply to ordinary oversight investigations. And it doesn't just apply to the House. It would also apply to the Senate. By sanctioning the President's blanket obstruction, the Senate would be cur curtailing its own subpoena power in the future, as well as the House's. And the oversight uh, obligation that we have, as we now know it, would be permanently altered. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from Kentucky. I have a question to present to the desk for the uh, House Manager Schiff and for the President's Council. The presiding officer declines to read the question as submitted. Mr. Chief Justice. The senator from Wisconsin. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk. Thank you.
The question from Senator Baldwin is addressed to the House managers. Given that the White House counsel could not answer Senator Romney's question that asked for the exact date the President first ordered the hold on security assistance to Ukraine, what witness or witnesses could answer Senator Romney's question? Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, you're right. They were not able to directly answer that question. Uh, and we believe that there is a, a tremendous amount of material out there in the form of emails, text messages, conversation, and witness testimony that could shed additional light on that, including uh, an email from last summer between Mr. Bolton, uh, Mr. Blair, uh, where we know from witness testimony this issue was discussed. What we do know is from multiple witnesses, Ukrainian officials knew that President Trump had placed a hold on security assistance soon after it was ordered in July of 2019. Uh, so we, we know that not only did U.S. officials know about it and OMB uh, communicate about it, but the Ukrainians knew about it as well. Uh, we know uh, from former uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine, Elena Zirkel, she stated publicly, in fact, uh, that uh, the Ukrainian officials knew about it and had found out about it uh, in July. We also know from the testimony of Laura Cooper uh, that her staff received two emails from the State Department on July 25th, revealing that the Ukrainian embassy was, quote, asking about security assistance, end quote. And that, quote, the Hill knows about the FMF situation to an extent, and so does the Ukrainian embassy, end quote. And that was on July 25th, the same day as President Trump's call with President Zelensky. What we also know is that career diplomat Catherine Croft stated that, quote, she was very surprised at the effectiveness of my Ukrainian counterparts' uh, diplomatic tradecraft, as in to say they found out very early on or much earlier than I expected them to, end quote. We also know that Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vidman testified that by mid-August he was getting questions from Ukrainians about the status of security assistance. So there is a lot of evidence surrounding it. Uh, the administration continues to obstruct wholly our efforts to get the emails and correspondence uh, that we have asked for. Uh, that obviously can be remedied by this body uh, with the appropriate subpoenas, uh, namely a subpoena to Ambassador Bolton to testify, uh, and a subpoena to the State Department and Department of State uh, and Department of uh, Defense and others to actually provide that material. Last thing I'd like to say is, uh, last evening, counsel for the president was asked the question about why did the, the hold for Ukraine differ from holds in the Northern Triangle uh, and other holds like Afghanistan. Uh, he provided an explanation that uh, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around uh, because he seems to be the only person in the administration that actually has an explanation. Uh, and, he, and, and as far as I could tell, the explanation was somewhere along the lines of one was public uh, and trying to put pu public pressure on uh, the countries in question, and one was not, was a private conversation and a private effort to put pressure. If that were true, then of course there would be plenty of evidence, plenty of emails, text messages, and other correspondence within the entire interagency process that we know is robust that would illustrate that to be the case. Uh, but they have failed to provide any evidence to corroborate that. And let me finish with this. I happen to know that a lot of people in this chamber, a lot of people in the chamber on the other side of the Capitol, including me, have often described uh, much consternation about red tape and bureaucracy and, and layers of government that run too slow. Uh, and I sometimes share that concern, right? That sometimes it takes a long time. There are memos for everything, emails for everything. There's paper trails for everything in this town. Uh, I think that is true with respect to this issue. Uh, and it is time that we actually see that information so we can get to the, the bottom of what actually happened. This body could get that information. 
Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Sass, McSally, Crapo, Thune, Young, Ernst, and Braun. Question from Senator Toomey and other senators is for counsel for the president. Given that the election of the president is one of the most significant political acts in which we as citizens engage in our democratic system, how much weight should the Senate give to the fact that removing the president from office and disqualifying him from ever holding future federal office would undo that democratic decision and kick the president off the ballot in this year's election? Members of the Senate, one of the concerns that we've raised throughout this process over the last several months, and going back to the time when the House was dealing with this in their various committees, is we're in an election year. There are some in this room that are days away from the Iowa caucuses taking place. So we're discussing the possible impeachment and removal of the President of the United States, not only during election season, in the heart of the election season. And I think that this does a disservice to the American people. Again, we think the basis upon which this has moved forward is irregular, to say the least. But I do think it complicates the matter for the American people, that we are literally at the dawn of a new season of, of elections. I mean, we're at that season now. And yet, we're talking about impeaching a president. And I want to tie this into the urgency that was so prevalent in December with my colleagues, the managers. It was so urgent to move this forward that they had to do it by mid-December before Christmas because national security was at stake. And then they waited 33 days to bring it here. And now they're asking you to do all the investigation, although they say they, you know, prove their case, but still need more to prove it. Of course, we believe, and I, I want to be clear here, that their entire process was corrupt from the beginning, and they're just putting it on this body. But to do it while the American people are selecting candidates for nomination to be the head of their party, to run as President of the United States, some of you in this very room, and to talk about the removal of a President of the United States, I think that's all part and parcel of the same pattern and practice of irregularities that have taken place with this impeachment proceeding since the beginning. The Speaker allowed the articles to linger. It was such a nationally urgent matter that they could linger for a month. So we think that this points to the exact problem what's taking place here, and that is, as my colleague Mr. Cipollone has said, this is really taking the vote away from the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Counsel. The Senator from Montana. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. Senator Tester asks the House managers. Yesterday, Mr. Dershowitz stated, quote, if a president does something which he believes will help him get elected in the public interest, that cannot be the kind of quid pro quo that results in impeachment, end quote. Do you believe there is any limit to the type or scope of quid pro quo a sitting president could engage in with a foreign entity as long as the intent of the sitting president is to get reelected in what he or she believes is in the public's best interest. Chief Justice, Senator, there is no limiting principle to the argument that we heard last night from the President's team. That is, if there's a quid pro quo that the President believes will help him get reelected, 
and he believes his reelection is in the national interest, then it doesn't matter how corrupt that quid pro quo is. It's astonishing that on the floor of this body someone would make that argument. Now, it didn't begin that way in the beginning of the President's defense, but what we have seen over the last couple of days is a descent into constitutional madness, because that way madness lies. If we are to accept the premise that a president essentially can do whatever he wants, engage in whatever quid pro quo he wants, I will give you this if you will give me that to help me get elected. I will give you military dollars if you will give me help in my reelection. If you will give me illicit foreign interference in our election. Now, the only reason you make that argument is because you know your client is guilty and dead to rights. That is an argument made of desperation. Now, what's so striking to me is almost half a century ago, we had a president who said, well, when the president does it, that means it is not illegal. That, of course, was Richard Nixon. Watergate is now 40 to 50 years behind us. Have we learned nothing in the last half century? Have we learned nothing at all? It seems like we're back to where we were. The president says it, it's not illegal. Or Donald Trump's version, under Article 2, I can do whatever I want. Or Professor Dershowitz's point, if it's if the president believes it helps his reelection, it is therefore in the national interest. He can do whatever he wants. In fact, much as we thought that we progressed post Watergate and we enacted Watergate reforms and we tried to insulate the Justice Department from interference by the presidency, we tried to put an end to the political abuses of that department, as much as we thought we enacted campaign finance reforms, we are right back to where we were a half century ago. And I would argue we may be in a worse place because this time, this time, that argument may succeed. That argument, if the president says it, it can't be illegal, failed. And Richard Nixon was forced to resign. But that argument may succeed here, now. That means we're not back to where we are. We are worse off than where we are. That is the normalization of lawlessness. I would hope that every American would recognize that it's wrong to seek foreign help in an American election, that Americans should decide American elections. I would hope and I believe that every American understands that and every American understands that's true for Democratic presidents and Republican ones. I would hope that we would understand it. I would hope that this trial would be one conducive of the truth. Uh, the senator asked what witnesses could shed light on when the president ordered the hold and why. Well, we know Mick Mulvaney would. That instruction came from OMB. You remember the testimony of Ambassador Taylor, the shock that went through the National Security Council and the shock he experienced in that video conference when it was first announced. And the instruction was, this comes through the President's Chief of Staff, OMB, but it's a direct order from the President. Well, Mick Mulvaney knows when that order went into place, and he knows why that order went into place, and he made that statement publicly, which he now wishes to recant. I'm sure he got an earful from the President after he did. But apparently it doesn't matter. None of that matters. Because if the president believes it's in his interest, it's OK. Now, there was an argument also, well, what if it was a credible reason? Of course, there's no evidence that this was a credible reason to investigate the president's rival. But let's say it was a credible reason. Does that make it right? What president is not going to think he has a credible reason to investigate his opponent? What president is going to think he doesn't have a credible reason or wouldn't be able to articulate one or come up with some fig leaf. They compounded the dangerous argument that they made that no quid pro quo is too corrupt if you think it'll help your reelection. They compounded it by saying, and if what you want is targeting your rival, it's even more legitimate. That way, madness lies.
Justice. The Senator from North Dakota. I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senator Young. Thank you. Question from Senator Kramer and Young is for the counsel for the president. Manager Schiff regularly states that if the president is innocent, he would agree to all of the witnesses and documents that the managers want. Is the president the first innocent defendant not to waive his rights? Mr. Chief Justice, Senator, thank you for that question. Uh, because the answer is obviously no, the president is not the first innocent defendant who decided not to waive his rights. And I think it is striking and shocking that one of the arguments that has been repeatedly deployed by the House managers throughout these proceedings, we heard Manager Nadler say, only the guilty hide evidence, only the guilty don't respond to subpoenas. And Manager Nadler, uh, excuse me, Manager Schiff say that this is not the way innocent people act. Well, of course, that's contrary to the very spirit of our American justice system, where people have rights, and asserting those rights cannot be interpreted as an indication of guilt. That is expressly forbidden by the laws and by the Constitution. And the Supreme Court explained in borden Kircher versus Hayes, a case that's cited in our trial memorandum, that the very idea of punishing someone, which is what the House managers are attempting to do here with their um, obstruction of Congress charge, to say that if the president insists on the constitutional prerogatives of his office, if the president insists that like virtually every president at least six, since Nixon and some going beyond further back to that, he's going to assert the immunity of his senior advisors to compel congressional testimony, if he's going to assert those rights grounded in the separation of powers and essential for protecting constitutionally based executive branch confidentiality interests, we're going to call that obstruction of Congress and impeach him. And it's this fundamental theme running throughout both their obstruction charge and their arguments generally here that if the president stands on his constitutional rights, if he tries to protect the institutional prerogatives of his office, which he is duty bound to do for future occupants of that office, that's somehow an indication of guilt and shows that he ought to be impeached. And that's fundamentally antithetical to the American system of justice and to our principles of due process, to our principles of acknowledging that rights can be defended that rights exist to be defended, and asserting those rights cannot be treated either as something punishable or as evidence of guilt. And there would be a long line of past precedents, presidents, excuse me. As Professor Dershowitz pointed out, there are a lot of presidents who have been accused of abuse of power. There'd also be a long line of presidents who could have been impeached for quote unquote obstruction of Congress if every time a president insisted upon the prerogatives of the office of the presidency and insisted on defending the separation of powers, that could be treated as something impeachable and as evidence of guilt. President Obama himself refused to turn over a lot of documents to the House in the Fast and Furious investigation. His attorney general was held in contempt. But no one thought that that was an impeachable offense. So the concept of saying that when the president asserts constitutionally grounded prerogatives of his office, that is evidence of guilt, is a completely bogus assertion. It's contrary to all the principles of our American justice system and to fundamental principles of fairness, and it ought to be rejected by this body. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. The senator from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I uh, send a question to the desk. Thank you.
Senator Jones's question is for the House managers. Aside from the House's constitutional impeachment authority, please identify specifically which provision or provisions, if any, in the House rules or a House resolution authorize the subpoenas issued by the House committees prior to the passage of House Resolution 660. In addition, please list the subpoenas that were issued after House Resolution 660. Uh, Senator, we will compile the list. Um, we don't have it accessible at the moment in, in answer to a question. Oh, we do have it? We do have it. We do have it. Um, let me just, if I could, and, um, specifically the subpoenas that went out after the passage of the House resolution were a subpoena to John Eisenberg, a subpoena to Brian McCormick, Robert Blair, Michael Ellis, Preston Wells Griffith, and uh, Mick Mulvaney. But let me underscore something that uh, my colleague uh, Manager Lofgren had to say, and, and let me break this down if I can in very practical terms. What is the practical import of what counsel for the president would argue? And it is this. Let's say that a Democrat is elected in November. And let's say that any one of you that chair a committee in the Senate determine that you think that the next president has engaged in something questionable, maybe even some wrongdoing, and you begin an investigation and I would imagine that your Senate rules, like our House rules, and it's House Rule 10, a senator that has the specific language authorizing the issuance of subpoenas as a part of our normal oversight responsibility. That power didn't exist at the time of Watergate, so they had to have a separate resolution. But that House rule passed each session empowers us to issue subpoenas as committee chairs as part of our oversight jurisdiction. So there you are, Democratic president, you're a chair, you start to do oversight, you issue subpoenas. You start to learn more, and what you learn becomes more and more concerning. And you issue more subpoenas. And the administration, in an effort to cover up their misconduct, says, we're not going to comply with any of your subpoenas. We're going to fight all subpoenas. And they come up with one bad faith excuse after another as to why they don't have to comply. And as you investigate further, and you're able to overcome the wall of obstruction, then you begin an impeachment inquiry. And that leads to the passage of yet another resolution. They would argue to you that all the work you did before you determined that it merited potential impeachment must be thrown out. That they were perfectly empowered to obstruct you in your oversight responsibility. That you must begin with your conclusion. That you must begin with the conclusion that you are prepared to impeach the president before you issue a single subpoena. Otherwise, they can say whatever you did before you got to that place should be thrown out. Now, we did not have the Justice Department do the initial investigation here. Why? Because Bill Barr turned it down. The same Attorney General, General mentioned in that July 25th call said there's nothing to see here. So there was no DOJ investigation. There was no special counsel investigation. It wasn't as if someone like Ken Starr handed us a package and said, here's the evidence. Now, you can take up a resolution, an impeachment resolution, because we have done the investigative work. Now, we had to do that work ourselves. And they would have you believe that any subpoena you issue as a part of your oversight responsibility that down the road reveals evidence that leads you to embark on an impeachment inquiry must be disregarded. That cannot and is not the law. It would render the oversight function meaningless. Court after court that has looked at the Congress's power to issue subpoenas have all reached the same conclusion, and that is, if you have the power to legislate, you have the power to oversee. Here we have a violation of the Impoundment Control Act. That is, Congress passes military spending, the President doesn't spend it, he gives no reason, he keeps it a secret. We're investigating that. That can't be more squarely within the oversight power of Congress to find out why aid we appropriated was not going out the door. They would say, you can't look into that, unless you're prepared to impeach the president and announce it firsthand. That's the import of that argument. It would cripple your oversight capacity. And without your oversight capacity, your legislative capacity is crippled. 
That's the real world import of this legal window dressing. They would strip you of your ability to do meaningful oversight. And particularly here where we're talking about misconduct of an impeachable kind and character, it would mean that a president can obstruct their own investigation. And if you need any evidence of their bad faith, of which is abundant, the shifting and springing rationalizations and explanations. When we had Corey Lewandowski in the Intelligence Committee, they said that under instructions to the White House, he wouldn't answer questions because he might, they might claim executive privilege. Now, this was someone who never worked for the executive. They made the claim they might uh, use executive privilege. I'm sorry, is my time up? Time has expired. Okay. Thank you. The Senator from Texas. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Hawley and Graham. Thank you. The question from Senator Cruz, along with Senators Hawley and Graham, uh, is for both uh, sides, the counsel for the president and the house managers. Yesterday, manager Demings refused to answer whether Joe Biden sought any legal advice concerning his conflict of interest on Burisma, the corrupt Ukrainian company that was paying his son Hunter $1 million per year. USA Today reported that when asked about it, Vice President Biden said, <coughs> excuse me, Quote, he hadn't spoken to his son Hunter Biden about his overseas business, end quote. That account was contradicted by Hunter Biden, who told the New Yorker that he told his father about Burisma, and quote, dad said, I hope you know what you're doing, and I said, I do. Why do Joe and Hunter Biden's stories conflict? Did the House ask either one that question? The White House counsel goes first. You heard our answer, I'm sorry, Chief Justice, Senators. Um, Senators, you heard our answer regarding that yesterday, but it is very interesting that he said he never spoke to his son about overseas dealings. His son said different things. Joe Biden was the point man for Ukraine, investigating at the time Ukrainians were a corrupt company, Burisma, and Zolchevsky, its owner, an oligarch, who by all media accounts we've discussed was extremely corrupt. Hunter Biden has paid $83,000 a month, a month, to sit on that board with no experience in energy, no experience in the Ukraine, doesn't speak the language, and we clearly know that he had a very fancy job description, and he did none of those things. He attended one or two board meetings, one in Monaco, and then he went on a fishing trip with Joe Biden's family in Norway. The entire time Joe Biden knows that, Joe Biden knows that this oligarch is corrupt. Everyone knows that. There are news reports everywhere. No one will dispute that. In fact, it raised eyebrows worldwide. But the vice president, by his account, never once asked his son to leave the board. We wouldn't be sitting here if he did. He never asked his son to leave the board. Instead, he started investigating the prosecutor who was going after Burisma and this corrupt oligarch who they say was corrupt even by oligarch standards, who had fled the country, fled the country, living in Monaco. He does not ask him to leave the board. He does the opposite. In 2015, what does he do? We know by reports he has close contact with President Poroshenko. He travels to Ukraine twice. He links it to the fire, he links the aid to the firing. Same thing in 2016 at a White House meeting. Links the aid to the firing of the prosecutor. Calls him four times in the eight days up to leading to the prosecutor. The, um, the prosecutor investigating Hunter Biden, yet he never says that 
all cases close. Days before Biden leaves office, he jokes to Poroshenko that he may have to call him every couple weeks to check in. Hunter Biden stays on that board for three years, three years. Then we hear the video of Joe Biden bragging about firing the prosecutor, linking it to aid. Then we have the six minute phone call. Mr. Chief Justice. Oh, there's the oh, other I'm half. sorry. I'm the sorry. Uh, House managers have two and a half minutes. Mr. Chief Justice and to our senators, senators, thank you so much for that question. I know you have asked about a conversation between a uh, father and his son. And what I can tell you, probably like just about everybody in this chamber, um, there are probably some conversations that I can't repeat to you about my conversations with my son. So I don't know the answer to your question, uh, Senator, what that exact conversation was. But what I can tell you is this. If we are serious about why we are here, and I have no reason to doubt that we are, if we are serious about seeking the truth, because the truth matters, not just for those who have paid the price in our history to form the, a more perfect union and protect our democracy, but it's important for our future. And in this case, if we're serious about that, then I can tell you this, that we are serious then about hearing from fact witnesses Looking at the Bidens, no matter how many times we call their name, we have no evidence to point to the fact that either Biden has anything at all to tell us about the president shaking down a foreign power to help him cheat in the next election. The precious election trying to steal each individual in this country's vote. I don't believe either Biden has any information about that, but let me tell you who I think does. Maybe we should call Ambassador Bolton. If we're serious about the truth, maybe we should call him because we have a good idea about what he might say. Or what about Mr. Mulvaney, who had day-to-day -day contact with the principal in our investigation, the President of the United States. That's not good enough? Well, what about, the question was asked about when did we know, or when did the President first put the hole on? Well, we do have reports that say on June 19th of 2019, Mr. Blair personally instructed the Director of OMB to hold up security assistance from Ukraine over a month before the infamous July 25th call. So, thank you, Mrs. Manager Thank Demings. you, Mr. Chief Justice. Mr. Chief Justice, oh, I send a question. The Senator from Nevada. I send a question to the desk. Thank you. The question from Senator Rosen is addressed to the House managers. Over the course of your arguments, you have tried to make a case that the President put his personal interests over those of the nation, risking our national security in the process. What precedent do you believe the President's actions set for future Presidents? Mr. Chief Justice, <clears throat> Senator, thank you for that question. It's one that I've wanted to, to answer for some time now. You've heard me speak before about some of my personal experience uh, in service to the country, and one thing that that experience has taught me is that 
We are strong not just because of the service and the sacrifice of our men and women in uniform, which is extreme uh, and uh, uh, pure in all of its sense, and something that I think everybody in this chamber actually appreciates and respects. But we are also strong because we have friends. We are strong because America doesn't go it alone. You know, when I was in Iraq and Afghanistan, I worked frequently with Afghan army partners, Iraqi army partners, and others, not because it was important, but because it was essential, that we couldn't accomplish the mission without it. But if those partners feel like our policies, what we say publicly, don't matter, if they feel like we are not a reliable and predictable partner, if they feel like the American handshake isn't worth anything, then they will not stand by us. They will not stand by us. And for over 70 years since the end of World War II, the partnerships, the alliances that we have built, that we have strived to create, that has ushered in an unprecedented period of peace and prosperity throughout the world, will start to fray. Because the American handshake will not matter. Ukraine has started to learn that. Our 68,000 troops throughout Europe deserve better. Because every day they get up and they do their job, the job that we have asked them to do. And they rely on our consistency, our predictability. They rely on the interest being in the national interest, not the whims and the personal interest of the president, whether that be President Trump or any other president. It will continue to call into question our broader alliances. And it will send a message that the American handshake doesn't matter. We have a slide that shows the evolution of some of the, the different arguments that we've seen on the other side that I think is important to see. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. Let's see if that happens. The campaign this time around, if foreigners, if Russia, if China, if someone else offers you information on an opponent, should they accept it or should they call the FBI? I think maybe you do both. I think you might want to listen. I don't, there's nothing wrong with listening. If somebody called from a country, Norway, we have information on your opponent. Oh, I think I'd want to hear it. You want that kind of interference in our elections? It's not an interference. They have information. I think I'd take it. Let's move to the third excerpt that I mentioned related to Vice President Biden. <clears throat> and it says, the other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son. This is President Trump speaking, that Biden stopped the prosecution and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you can look into it, it sounds horrible. Well, I would think that if they were honest about it, they'd start a major investigation into the Biden. It's a very simple answer. If we feel there's corruption, like I feel there was in the 2016 campaign, there was tremendous corruption against me. If we feel there's corruption, we have a right to go to a foreign country. And by the way, likewise, China should start an investigation into the Biden. Because what happened in China is just about as bad as what happened with uh, with Ukraine. The American people deserve to know what happened. The American people deserve to know when they go to bed tonight that there's a president that has their interests in mind that will put the national security of the country above his own political self-interest. The American people deserve answers, and yes, it is still a good time to call Ambassador Bolton to testify. Thank you, Mr. Manager. The Senator from Ohio. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senators Toomey, Cornyn, Crapo, Ernst, and Moran. Thank you.
The question from Senator Portman and the other senators is for the counsel for the president. I have been surprised to hear the House managers repeatedly invoke constitutional law professor Jonathan Turley to support their position, including playing a part of a video of him. Isn't it true that Professor Turley opposed this impeachment in the House and has also said that abuse of power is exceedingly difficult to prove alone without any accompanying criminal allegation? Abuse of power has never been the sole basis for a presidential impeachment and was not proven in this case. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for that question. And that is exactly correct. Professor Turley was very critical uh, of the entire process in the House and of the charges that the House, uh, the House Democrats were considering here, both the abuse of power charge and the obstruction charge. And he explained that this was a rushed process that had not uh, adequately pursued an investigation that, as the, the senators point out in the question, abuse of power is an exceedingly difficult theory to use to impeach a president, and it has never been used without alleging violations of the law. And I think that in the discussions we've had over the past week and a half, we've pointed, <coughs> excuse me, pointed that out multiple times. Every presidential impeachment in our history, including even the Nixon impeachment proceedings, which didn't actually lead to an impeachment, have used charges that include specific violations of the law and the criminal law. Andrew Johnson was charged uh, mostly in counts that involved violation of the Tenure of Office Act, which the Congress had specifically made punishable by fine and imprisonment, and even wrote into the statute that violation would constitute uh, either a high crime or a high misdemeanor, but one of those terms to make it clear that it was going to be used to trigger an impeachment. In the proceedings, uh, in the Nixon impeachment inquiry, each of the articles of impeachment there, um, except for the, the obstruction of Congress charge, was, was sort of treated separately on the obstruction theory, included specific violations of law. There were specific violations alleged in the second article of impeachment, which is often um, sort of referred to loosely as the abuse of power article. It wasn't actually titled abuse of power. It didn't charge abuse of power. The specifications there were violations of law, violating the constitutional rights of citizens, violating the laws governing executive branch agencies, unlawful electronic surveillance uh, using the CIA and others, specific violations of law. And clearly in the Clinton impeachment, President Clinton was impeached for perjury and obstruction of justice. Those are crimes. And while Professor Turley does not take the view that a crime is necessarily required. He pointed out here that there was not nearly a sufficient basis and not nearly a sufficient record compiled in the House of Representatives to justify an abuse of power charge. He also was very critical of the obstruction of Congress theory. Uh, and he pointed out that it would be an abuse of power by Congress under these circumstances, where Congress has simply demanded information, gotten a refusal from the executive branch based on constitutionally based prerogatives of the executive, a refusal to provide that information, than to simply go straight to impeachment without going through the accommodations process, without considering contempt, without going to the courts. That was Professor Turley's view of how incrementally the House of Representatives would have to proceed if they were going to try to reach, ultimately, some theory of obstruction of Congress. So to cite Professor Turley, it is true that in his academic writing and in his testimony, he did not adopt the view that you must have a crime and only a crime as the charge for an article of impeachment. He still thought that neither of the articles of impeachment here could be justified or were sufficient or could be used to impeach the president both the abuse of power article and the obstruction article. So taking snippets out of what he said really does um, an injustice to the totality of his testimony, because the totality of his testimony was entirely against what the House ended up doing here. Thank you.
Thank you, Counsel. Uh, the Senator from Ohio. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, on behalf of Senator Wyden and myself, I send a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. Senator Brown and Wyden ask the following question for the House managers. During yesterday's proceedings, the President's counsel failed to give an adequate response to a question related to whether acceptance of information provided by a foreign country to a political campaign or candidate would constitute a violation of the law and whether offers of such information should be reported to the FBI. FBI Director Christopher Wray, who was appointed by President Trump, has said, quote, if any public official or member of any campaign is contacted by any nation state or anybody acting on behalf of a nation state about influencing or interfering with our election, then that is something that the FBI would want to know about, end quote. And we'd like to make sure people tell us information promptly so that we can take the appropriate steps to protect the American people, end quote. If President Trump remains in office, what signal does that send to other countries intent on interfering with our elections in the future? And what might we expect from those countries and the president? Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, distinguished members of the Senate, thank you for that question. To take the last part, First, it would send a terrible message to autocrats and dictators and enemies of democracy and the free world for the president and his team to essentially put out there for all to consume that it's acceptable in the United States to solicit foreign interference in our free and fair elections or accept political dirt. Simply to try to cheat in the next election. I was certainly shocked by the comments from the President's Deputy White House Counsel yesterday right here on the floor when he said, I think the idea that any information that happens to come from overseas is necessarily campaign interference is a mistake. No, it's wrong. It's wrong in the United States of America. He also added information that is credible that potentially shows wrongdoing by someone that happens to be running for office if it's credible information is relevant for the voters to know to be able to decide on who is the best candidate. This is not a banana republic. It's the democratic republic of the United States of America. It's wrong. Now, the single most important lesson that we learned from 2016 was that nobody should seek or welcome foreign interference in our elections. But now we have this president and his counsel essentially saying it's okay. It is not okay. It strikes at the very heart of what the framers of the Constitution were concerned about. Abuse of power, betrayal by the president of his oath of office, corrupting the integrity of our democracy and our free and fair elections by entangling oneself with foreign powers. That's at the heart of what the framers of the Constitution were concerned about. Don't just trust me. We have several folks who have made this observation. The FBI director, the Trump FBI director said, that the FBI would want to know about any attempt at foreign election interference. And the chair of the Federal Elections Commission also issued a statement reiterating the view of US law enforcement. She said in part, let me make something 100% clear to the American people and anyone running for office. It is illegal for any person to solicit, 
accept or receive anything of value from a foreign national in connection with a U.S. election. This is not a novel concept. Election intervention from foreign governments has been considered unacceptable since the beginning of our nation. It is wrong, it is corrupt, it is lawless, it's an abuse of power, it's impeachable, and it should lead to the removal of President Donald John Trump. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from Missouri. I send to the desk a question on my own behalf and on behalf of Senator Lee. Thank you. Question from Senators Hawley and Lee is for counsel for the President. United States federal courts have held, most prominently in the Blagojevich case, that it is not unlawful for a public official to condition his official acts on official acts performed by another public officer. Is there any application to the allegations against President Trump? Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for that question. Um, I think an important threshold point to make here is that uh, we're not even in the realm of exchanging official acts because there's been no proof of a quid pro quo here. We're not in the realm of a situation where there's one official act being traded for another. Uh, I think that we've gone through the evidence that makes it quite clear that both with respect to an off, uh, meeting with the president, a bilateral meeting, and with respect to the temporary pause on the security assistance, the evidence just doesn't stack up to show that President Trump linked either of those. Both took place, the meeting and the release of the aid, without Ukrainians doing anything, announcing or beginning any investigations. There's nothing in the transcript linking them as a quid pro quo. The Ukrainians didn't even know that the, um, there had been a temporary pause on the aid. And I could go on with the list of points on that. I think if there were any application, hypothetically, it would come in the realm of the fact that in foreign policy, there are situations where there can be um, I would, situations where one government wants some action from another and wants that action from another in a way that will condition other policies of one country. You can say, we would like you, and this happens, for example, with the Northern Triangle countries. We want you to do more to stop the flow of illegal immigration. We're gonna be conditioning some of our policies towards you unless and until you start doing a better job stopping the flow of illegal immigration because it's a real problem on our southern border. That happens all the time. And when there's something legitimate to look into, there could be a situation where the United States would say, you've got to do better on corruption. You've got to do better on these specific areas of corruption, or we're not going to be able to keep having the same relationship with you. One example like that, I, I believe we've pointed out that um, uh, aid was held up to Afghanistan. President Trump held up aid to Afghanistan specifically because of concerns about corruption. And in situations like that, there'd be nothing wrong whatsoever with conditioning one policy approach on a foreign country uh, modifying their policy to be more in line, to attune more directly to U.S. interests. That's part of what foreign policy is all about. And that could arise in the situation of even um, investigations. And I think it's interesting to point out that in May of 2018, uh, three Democratic senators sent a letter to the then prosecutor in Ukraine suggesting that we've heard some things that you might not be cooperating with the Mueller investigation. And there is sort of an implicit 
um, indication behind the letter that there's not going to be as much support for Ukraine. This is something that's important. You've got to be helping with that election. And there's nothing wrong with encouraging the prosecutor general to assist with something that's important to the United States. That's part of foreign policy. It happens all the time. So to the extent that that case, uh, the, the Blagojevich case is relevant, I think it is in the general concept that were there uh, some linkage between we want your country to pursue these policies, it's going to affect our policies towards you, that's entirely legitimate. That's not something that is a violation of any law or is improper. But again, I come back to the point that here, there is no proof of that linkage. There is no proof that there was any sort of, as we've come to call it, quid pro quo in this case. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The senator from Washington. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk. Thank you. Senator Cantwell's question is for the House managers. In his opening remarks, Chairman Schiff said the Ukraine scheme was expansive and involved many people. Is there any evidence that acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, Secretary of State Pompeo, Attorney General Barr, or anyone on the outside were involved in this scheme to withhold military aid or obstruction of Congress? Mr. Chief Justice and Senator, thank you so much for that question. If we remember um, Ambassador Sondland's testimony where he said everyone was in the loop, but we don't just have to take his word for it. During his hearing, Mr. Sondland discussed a July 19th email he sent to the President's top aides, including Secretary Mike Pompeo, Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, Mr. Mulvaney's Senior Advisor Robert Blair, Secretary Rick Perry, and Brian McCormick, Secretary Perry's Chief of Staff. And we should at least start with, if we're serious about getting to the truth, issuing a subpoena for State Department emails. If you'll pay attention to the slide. In the email, Sondland stated, quote, I talked to Zelensky just now. He is prepared to receive POTUS's call. We'll assure him that he intends to run a fully transparent investigation and will turn over every stone. He would greatly appreciate a call prior to Sunday so that he can put out some media about a friendly and productive call, no details. Mr. Mulvaney in the email acknowledges receipt and responds shortly, I asked the NSC to set up the call for tomorrow, six days before President Trump, now infamous July 25th call, in which he told President Zelensky to conduct investigations into the Bidens and the 2016 election, Mr. Sondland sent an email to the President's top aides updating them on the status of the scheme. Again, quote, everyone was in the loop. On August 11th, Ambassador Sondland emailed Mr. Breckball to ask him to brief Secretary Pompeo on a statement he was negotiating with President Zelensky with the aim of, quote, making the boss happy, the boss being the president, enough to authorize the investigation. Ambassador Sondland wrote to Mr. Breckball, and I quote, Kurt and I negotiated a statement from Z, Mr. Zelensky, to be delivered for our review in a day or two. The contents will hopefully make the boss happy enough to authorize an invitation. And he's talking about the invitation for a White House Oval Office meeting, which we know was much more critical and important than a sideline meeting at the UN. Yet further evidence, and I quote, everyone was in the loop. Attorney General Barr reportedly responded uh, at some point, and there was a New York Times article that was done, and Attorney General Barr responded to that article by stating that he was aware of DOJ investigations into some countries and that he was concerned President Trump was giving world leaders the impression he had undue influence over what would ordinarily be independent investigations. He cited conversations the President had with leaders of Turkey and China, further demonstrating that there was concern about the president abusing the power of his office for personal political reasons. Again, it proves 
that everybody was in the loop and we should want to subpoena and review those emails involving the State Department and others. Thank you, Mrs. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from South Dakota. I sent a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Moran, Danes, Ernst, Scott of Florida, and Crapo. Thank you. Senator Thune and the other senators ask the counsel for the president. On March 6, 2019, Speaker Nancy Pelosi said, quote, impeachment is so divisive to the country that unless there's something so compelling and overwhelming and bipartisan, I don't think we should go down that path because it divides the country, end quote. Alexander Hamilton also warned in Federalist 65 against the, quote, persecution of an intemperate or designing majority in the House of Representatives with respect to impeachment. In evaluating the case against the President, should the Senate take into account the partisan nature of the impeachment proceedings in the House? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate. Absolutely you should take that into account. That's dispositive. That should end it. Based on the statements that we heard the last time from our friends on the Democratic side, that's a reason why you shouldn't have an impeachment. Speaker Pelosi was right when she said that. Unfortunately, she didn't follow her own advice. We've never been in a situation where we have the impeachment of a president in an election year with the goal of removing the president from the ballot. As I've said before, that is the most massive election interference we've ever witnessed. It's domestic election interference. It's political election, election interference, and it's wrong. They don't talk about the horrible consequences to our country of doing that, but they would be terrible. They would tear us apart for generations, and the American people wouldn't accept it. Let me address in that context the importance of the vote for their inquiry, which also had bipartisan opposition. Now they said, well, we were fine when, we, when Speaker Pelosi announced it. We didn't need a vote. The subpoenas were authorized. Then why did they have a vote? They had a vote because they understood they had a big problem that they needed to fix. But what's more important about the vote than the procedural issue? The important thing about the vote is that if you're going to start an impeachment investigation, particularly on, in an election year, there needs to be political accountability to the American people. You can't just go have a press conference. If you're going to say that the votes of the American people need to be disallowed, that all of the ballots need to be torn up, then at the very least, you need to be accountable to your home district for that decision. And now they are. And now they are. And if the American people decide, if they're allowed to vote, if the American people decide that they don't like what's happened here, that they don't like the constitutional violations that have happened, that they don't like the attack on a successful president for purely partisan political purposes, then they can do something about it, and they can throw them out. That's why a vote's important. But we should never even consider removing the name of a president from the ballot on a purely partisan basis in an election year. Important? I'll say it's important for that reason alone and for the interest of uniting our country, it must be rejected. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. Oh, Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk on behalf of Senator 
Duckworth, Senator Harris, and myself, for the House managers, and for the President's Council. Thank you. The question from Senator Reid and the other senators is for both parties, uh, beginning with the House managers. It has been reported that President Trump does not pay Rudy Giuliani, his personal attorney, for his services. Can you explain who has paid for Rudy Giuliani's legal fees, international travel, and other expenses in his capacity as President Trump's attorney and representative? The short answer to the question is, I don't know who's paying Rudy Giuliani's fees. Uh, and if he is not being paid by the president to conduct this domestic political errand for which he has devoted so much time, if other clients are paying and subsidizing uh, his work in that respect, it raises profound questions, uh, questions that we can't answer at this point. But there are some answers that we do know. As he has acknowledged, He's not there doing foreign policy. So when counsel for the president says, this is a policy dispute, you can't impeach a president over policy, what Rudy Giuliani was engaged in by his own admission has nothing to do with policy. It has nothing to do with policy. And let me mention one other thing about this scheme that Giuliani was orchestrating and the consequence of the argument that they would make that its quid pro quos are just fine. Let's say Rudy Giuliani does another errand for the president, this time an errand in China. And he says to the Chinese, we will give you a favorable deal with respect to Chinese farmers as opposed to American farmers. We will betray the American farmer in the trade deal, but here's what we want. The quid pro quo is we want you to do an investigation of the Bidens. You know the one, the one the president's been calling for. They would say that's okay. They would say that's a quid pro quo to help his reelection. He can betray the American farmer. That's okay. That's their argument. Where does that argument lead us? That's exactly the kind of domestic, corrupt political errand that Rudy Giuliani was doing gratis, without payment, at least not payment apparently from the president. So who's paying the freight for it? Well, I don't know who's directly paying the freight for it, but I can tell you the whole country is paying the freight for it. Because there are leaders around the world who are watching this and they're saying the American presidency is open for business. This president wants our help and if we help him, he will be grateful. He will be grateful. Is that the kind of message we want to send to the rest of the world? That's the result of normalizing lawlessness of the kind that Rudy Giuliani was engaged in. Oh, Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, your time has expired. Council? Came out of the manager's mouth. Open for business. I'll tell you who was open for business. You don't know who was open for business? When the Vice President of the United States, who was charged by the then President of the United States with developing policies to avoid and assist in removing corruption from Ukraine, and his son was on the board of a company that was under investigation for Ukraine, and you're com concerned about what Rudy Giuliani, the president's lawyer, was doing when he was over trying to determine what was going on in Ukraine? And by the way, it's a little bit interesting to me, and my colleague, the Deputy White House Counsel, referred to this. It's a little bit ironic to me that you're going to be questioning conversations with foreign governments about investigations with, when three of you, three members of the Senate, Senator Menendez, Senator Leahy, and Senator Durbin, sent a letter that read something quickly like this. These were, they wrote the letter to the Prosecutor General of Ukraine. They said they're ag advocates, 
talking about the congressman, they're strong advocates for robust and close, close relationship with Ukraine, and we believe that our cooperation should extend to such legal matters, regardless of politics, and their concern was ongoing investigations and whether the Mueller team was getting appropriate, appropriate responses from Ukraine regarding investigations of what? The President of the United States. And you're asking about whether foreign investigations are appropriate? I think it answers itself. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Oklahoma. Mr. Chief Justice, I sent a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senator Ernst and Senator Crapo. Thank you. The question from Senator Langford and the other senators is for the counsel for the president. House managers have described any delay in military aid and State Department funds to Ukraine in 2019 as a cause to believe there was a secret scheme or quid pro quo by the president. In 2019, 86 percent of the DOD funds were obligated to Ukraine in September, but in 2018, 67 percent of the funds were obligated in September, and in 2017, 73 percent of the funds were obligated in September. In the State Department, the funds were obligated September 30 in 2019, but they were obligated September 28 in 2018. Each year, the vast majority of the funds were obligated in the final month or days of the fiscal year. Was there, <coughs> excuse me, was there a national security risk to Ukraine or the United States from the funds going out at the end of September in the two previous years? Did it weaken our relationship with Ukraine because the vast majority of our aid was released in September each of the last three years? Mr. Chief Justice, uh, Senators, thank you for that question. And the short, straightforward answer is there was no jeopardy to the national security interest of the United States from the timing of the release of this money. As the question indicated, uh, the vast bulk of funds in each of the prior two fiscal years were also obligated in September. Uh, so the fact that the, the funds were released here on September 11th and obligated by the end of the fiscal year was consistent with the timing in past years. There was, and it is also the case that at the end of every fiscal year there is some funding uh, for, in this Ukrainian military assistance that doesn't actually make it out the door, that isn't obligated by the end of the fiscal year. We've heard the House managers point to the fact that Congress had to put something in the continuing resolution, a special provision, to get $35 million of the aid extended so it could be used in the next fiscal year. My understanding is that every fiscal year there's some amount of money. It's not always that, that same amount, but there's some amount of money that that has to be done for every year because it doesn't get out the door by the end of the year. Now, it's not just from the raw data that we can see that the funds went out roughly the same timing towards the end of the year, that therefore it doesn't suggest any great risk to Ukraine or risk to the national security of the United States. We know that from testimony as well. Ambassador Volker testified that the brief pause on the aid was not significant. And Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs David Hale explained that this is future assistance. And I mentioned this the other day. It's not like this money is being uh, spent month by month to supply current needs in the Ukraine. It's five-year money. Once, once it is obligated, it can go to U.S. firms who are providing material to the Ukrainians, and it doesn't get spent down finally and material shipped to Ukraine for a long time. So a delay of 48 or 55 days, depending on how you count it, and the money being released before the end of the fiscal year ends up having no real effect. It's not current money that's supplying immediate needs 
despite what we've heard about the, the idea that on the front lines in the Donbass, Ukrainian soldiers are being put at risk. That's just not accurate. And we know that also from uh, Ola Sevchuk, the Ukrainian Deputy Minister of Defense, who gave an interview to the New York Times and explained that the hold came and went so quickly that he didn't even notice any change. And remember, the Ukrainians didn't even know. President Zelensky and his advisors, Yermak and others, have made it abundantly clear. There was another interview just the other day with um, Daniluk, who I might get his title wrong. I think he was the foreign minister at the time. But um, there was an interview just the other day that was published. And he explained again that they didn't know the aid had been held up until the political article on August 28th. And then he said there was a panic in Kiev because they were just trying to figure out what to do. Well, within two weeks, it had been released. And so we've also heard the idea that, well, it was just the fact of the delay that gave the Russians a signal and it gave the Ukrainians a signal. And that was what the damage to national security was. But the whole point is the leaders of the government in Ukraine didn't know. It wasn't made public. So they weren't being given a signal by that, and the Russians weren't being given a signal by that. So that theory for damage to the national security also doesn't work. There was a pause temporarily so that there could be some assessment to address concerns the president had raised. The money was released by the end of the fiscal year. There was no damage to the national security, either in terms of materiel not being available to the Ukrainians or in terms of any signal sent to any foreign power. The money got out the door roughly the same time as in prior years, a little bit more left over at the end that had to be fixed, but there's some left over at the end every year that has to be fixed with a rider on the next appropriations bill or continuing resolution. So no damage whatsoever to the national security of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Senator from Hawaii. Aloha. I send a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. The question from Senator Hirono for the House managers reads as follows. In contrast to arguments by the President's counsel, Acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney stated that President Trump held up aid to Ukraine to get his politically motivated investigations. He claimed, quote, we do that all the time with foreign policy, end quote, end quote, get over it, end quote. What was different about President Trump's withholding of aid to Ukraine from prior aid freezes? Are you aware of any other presidents who have withheld foreign aid as a bribe to extract personal benefits? Thank you, Senator. I'll, I'll respond to the question, but uh, let me begin with something in the category of you can't make this stuff up. Today, while we've been debating whether a president can be impeached for uh, essentially bogus claims of privilege for attempting to use the courts to cover up misconduct, the Justice Department, in resisting House subpoenas, is in court today and was asked, well, if the Congress can't come to the court to enforce its subpoenas, because as we know, they're in here arguing Congress must go to court to enforce its subpoenas, but they're in the court saying, Congress, thou shalt not do that. So the judge says, if the Congress can't enforce its subpoenas in court, then 
What remedy is there? And the Justice Department lawyer's response is impeachment. Impeachment. <laughs> you can't make this up. I mean, what, what more evidence do we need of the bad faith of this effort to cover up? I said the other day they're in this court making this argument. They're down the street making the other argument. I didn't think they'd make it on the same day. But that's exactly what's going on. Now, in response to the question about how does this A different, this hole different from other holds, it's certainly appropriate to ask that question. The laws Congress passed authorizing this appropriation did not allow for the hold by this president. And as the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, found it violated the law to hold the aid the way it did. Once the Department of Defense, in consultation with the Department of State, certified that Ukraine had met the anti-corruption benchmarks required under the law, there was nothing that would allow for a hold. The money had to flow. And that was intentional. Military assistance to Ukraine is critical to our national security. It is overwhelming bipartisan support. And recall that in the spring of 2019, the Defense Department certified Ukraine had met all of the anti-corruption benchmarks. The Department of State sent the Senate a letter saying that the benchmarks had been met. It issued a press release saying that the aid was moving forward. It began to spend the funds to help Ukraine. But then the President stepped in. Without legal authority, he secretly placed a hold on the aid. Now, the President's counsel in their presentation gives specific examples of past holds as if we cannot distinguish one for a corrupt reason and one that is for a policy reason. In many of their examples, the law explicitly provided the executive branch the authority to pause, reevaluate, or cancel foreign aid programs as the situation in a recipient country evolved. For example, with regard to foreign assistance to El Salvador, Honduras, or Guatemala, the law explicitly allows the Secretary of State to, quote, suspend in whole or in part that assistance if at any time the Secretary deems that, quote, sufficient progress has not been made by a central government on a host of priorities from respecting human rights to upholding the law. Those are the priorities that you, the Senate, agreed to. And the President was required to implement them. Similarly, aid to Afghanistan is subject to periodic reevaluations by law, and the law explicitly directs the Secretary of State should, quote, suspend assistance for the government of Afghanistan should it be assessed that the Afghan government is, quote, failing to make measurable progress in meeting certain anti-corruption, human rights, and counterterrorism benchmarks. The overthrow of the democratically elected government in Egypt, we've had that brought up as another example. Members of this body, including Senators McCain, Leahy, and Graham, pressed the Obama administration to suspend military aid. It wasn't hidden from the Senate. It was urged on the administration by the Senate. Senators pressed for that aid to be withheld because the law was clear in instances of a military coup, aid must be suspended. Senators McCain and Graham wrote a op-ed in the Washington Post, not all coups are created equal, but a coup is still a coup. Morsi, that's the deposed leader of Egypt, quote, was elected by a majority of voters, and U.S. law requires the suspension of foreign assistance. I could go on and on with examples. No one has suggested you can't condition aid. But I would hope that we would all agree that you can't condition aid for a corrupt purpose, to try to get a foreign power to cheat in your election. Now, counsel says that if you decide the prosecution has proved that he engaged in this corrupt scheme, if you decide as impartial jurors that the Constitution requires his removal from office, that the public will not accept your judgment. I have more confidence Thank in the Thank you, Mr. People. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Arkansas. I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senator Cotton, Ernst, Young, Hawley, Risch, Fisher, and Hoven. Thank you.
Senator Bozeman and the other senators pose a question to both sides. In the House manager's opening statement, they argue that it is necessary to pursue impeachment because, quote, the president's misconduct cannot, cannot be decided at the ballot box, for we cannot be assured that the vote will be fairly won, end quote. How would acquitting the president prevent voters from making an informed decision in the 2020 presidential election? President's counsel goes first. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate. That's exactly who should decide who should be president, the voters. All power comes from the people in this country. That's why you're here. That's why people are elected in the House. And that's why the president is elected. It's exactly who should decide the question, particularly in a case like this, where it's purely partisan. Here's the other thing when we're talking about impeachment as a political weapon. They didn't tell you what they told the court over the holidays when they were waiting to deliver the impeachment articles. They went and told the court they're actually still impeaching over there in the House. Did you know that? They're actually still impeaching. They're coming here and they're telling you, please do the work that we didn't do, where we had two days in the House Judiciary Committee. We had the rush delivery for Christmas, and then we waited and waited and waited. But now we want you to call witnesses that we never called, that we didn't subpoena. They want to turn you into an investigative body. In the meantime, they're saying, by the way, we're still doing it over there. We're still impeaching. And they want to slow down now. They don't want to speed up. They want to slow it down and take up the election year and continue this political charade. It's also wrong. It's also wrong. Let's leave it to the people of the United States. Let's trust them. They're asking you not to trust them. Maybe they don't trust them. Maybe they won't like the result. We should trust them. That's who should decide who the president of this country should be. It'll be a few months from now. And they should decide. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Chief Justice, uh, Senator, I appreciate the question. President Trump must be removed from office because of his ongoing abuse of power, threatens the integrity of the next election. As we saw from the video montage, the president has made no bones about the fact that he is willing to seek foreign intervention to help him cheat in the next election. Now, counsel for the president says the next election is the remedy. It's not the remedy when the president is trying to seek to cheat in that very election. This is why the founders did not put a requirement that a president can only be impeached in their first term. Indeed, at that time, of course, there weren't term limits on the presidency. If it were the intent of the framers to say that a president can't be impeached in an election year, they would have said so. Now, they didn't for a reason, because they were concerned about a president who might try to cheat in that very election. Now, counsel, as I, I was getting to a moment ago, made the argument, if you make the decision as impartial jurors that the president has violated the Constitution, he has abused his power, he should be convicted or moved from office that the country will not accept it. I have more confidence in the American people than that. But I will assure you of this. If you make the decision that a fair trial can be conducted without hearing from witnesses, the American people will not accept that judgment. Because the American people understand what goes into a fair trial. And they understand that a fair trial requires both sides to the, have the opportunity to present their case. We would like to present our case. We'd like to call our witnesses. We'd like to rely on more than our argumentation. There are a few things about this trial that Americans agree on, but one thing they are squarely in agreement on. Well, two. They believe a trial should have witness testimony, and they want to hear from John Bolton. That is the overwhelming consensus of the American people, and it's consistent with common sense. Let's give the country a trial they can be proud of. Let's show that at least the process worked and that we followed the founders' intent that a trial have witnesses. 
I don't think anyone can quarrel with the fact when you look at the history of this body and every Thank you, Mr. Manager. impeachment. Mr. Chief Justice. Oh, the Senator from Virginia. I send a question to the desk for the House Managers. Thank you. Question from Senator Kane to the House Managers. If the Senate acquits the President on Article 2 after he violated both the Impoundment Control Act and the Whistleblower Act to hide the Ukraine scheme from Congress, what is to stop President Trump from complete refusal to cooperate with Congress on any matter? In short, the consequence is there is no constraint on this president or any other. This gets to a point you've heard uh, counsel for the president repeat over and over. Can you be impeached for asserting privileges? And I would add, no matter how bogus or in bad faith those assertions may be. No matter whether they are in court today arguing the opposite of what they are arguing before you today. And the answer is yes, the president can be impeached for using the assertion of baseless claims to cover up his misconduct. The House did not impeach the president over a single assertion of privilege. We impeached him for a far more fundamental reason, because he issued an order categorically directing the executive branch to defy every single part of every single subpoena served by the House. A president who issues orders like this is a president who can place himself above the law and a system of checks and balances. He can do whatever he wants and get away for, with it by using his powers to orchestrate a massive cover-up. The president's lawyers haven't disputed that point. They can't. It's obvious that a president that ignores and can ignore all oversight is a threat to the American people. Instead, they've argued assertion of a grab bag of legal privileges warranting this categorical defiance. These arguments are unprecedented and wrong. The first thing to note is the President's arguments conveniently ignore the October 8th letter sent at the President's behest declaring that the President will not, quote, participate, unquote, in the impeachment investigation. I won't participate. This blanket defiance preceded all of the other letters and creative OLC opinions the President relied upon. It made clear that the rationale for blanket defiance was the President's belief that he can declare his own innocence and make it illegitimate to investigate him. This was not about privileges or legal arguments. Those came later as his lawyers rushed to justify that Congress has no power whatsoever to enforce subpoenas against anyone. Let's be clear. They may claim that their October 8 letter where they said they will not participate was somehow an offer to accommodate. But what the real condition was, was that the House simply drop the impeachment investigation or place the President in charge of its direction. That wasn't a real offer. That was a poison pill. Now what about the remaining arguments? The first point is that none of them justify his order to defy all the subpoenas. He never asserted executive privilege over any documents. And his remaining arguments that absolute immunity or agency counsel not being allowed to attend depositions have nothing to do with documents. Nothing. So none of his legal arguments even applies to his direction that every single office and agency defy every single subpoena for documents. And what about the total obstruction on the witnesses? Here, too, he never invoked executive privilege. Absolute immunity obviously couldn't apply to many of the lower level officials we subpoenaed. The only remaining legal ground for defiance was the argument it's unconstitutional for Congress to prevent agency counsel from going to depositions. The fallback of fallback of fallbacks, except this rule was originally passed by a Republican Congress and has been used repeatedly by both Republican and Democratic-led majorities and committees. It can't possibly justify obstruction of witness subpoenas. It's nothing more than a phony cover 
for an obstruction that President Trump decided upon at the outset. His arguments are thus incorrect on their own terms and fail to explain this categorical order. One final irony, even before the argument in court today, at a recent oral argument in the DC circuit, they made the same claim they made today. Let's pull up slide 66, 56. In litigation again to enforce subpoenas, the judge said they can make it a grounds for impeachment for obstruction of Congress. And the president's own lawyers said impeachment is certainly one of the tools that Congress has. We agree. It is one of the tools that you have for when a president would use a categorical obstruction of investigation in his own wrongdoing, it is a tool that should be applied here. There cannot be a better case for impeachment on obstructing a co-equal branch of Congress than the one before you where the obstruction is so complete and so categorical. Thank you, Mr. Manager. The Senator from Florida. I sent a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senator Braun and to the President's Council. Thank you. Question from Senator Scott's and Scott and Braun for counsel for the president. If Speaker Pelosi, Chairman Schiff, Chairman Nadler, and House Democrats were so confident in the gravity of the president's conduct and the overwhelming evidence of an impeachable offense that prompted the inquiry, why were the House Republicans denied the procedural accommodations and substantive rights afforded to the minority party in the Clinton impeachment? Additionally, why were the President's counsel and agency attorneys denied access to cross-examine witnesses during committee testimony and present the testimony of witnesses in defense of the issues under review? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate. I don't know why they would do that. I don't know. They violated every past precedent. They violated all forms of due process. Now they say that's a process argument, and it is, but it's more than that. It's more than that. If you feel confident in your facts, then why do you design a process that completely shuts out the president? Why do you cook up the facts in a basement skiff instead of in the light of day? Why do you do that? Why don't you allow the minority to call witnesses as they've had, to do, have had the right to do in all past impeachments? And then they come here and say, by the way, we were fully in charge, so completely in charge that we locked out the President's counsel, denied all rights, denied the minority any witnesses at all. But when we come here, they, don't, they still don't get witnesses. They want you not only to do their job, but to make the same mistake the same violation of due process that they did. They said, well, let's just pick the witnesses that we want. The other ones are irrelevant, not relevant. I've, in listening to Mr. Schiff over the, these months, I've come to a determination about what he means by irrelevant. He means bad for them, okay? He means witnesses that the president wants to call. So I don't know why they did that. I'll say something else, I'll say something else. I have respect for you and I have respect for the House. And when I first got this job, I went, one of the first things I did is I went to visit Mr. Schiff, Chairman Schiff, I went to visit Chairman Nadler, I went to visit Chairman Cummings at that time, and I said, we're here to work with you, to cooperate where we can, but in the institutional interest, obviously, we'll participate in oversight, but if we have constitutional points to make, we'll make them and we'll make them directly. And the administration has uh, participated in oversight. Many, many witnesses have testified in oversight hearings. 
large number of documents have been produced in oversight hearings. And in fact, in the letter that I sent on October 8th, I made the same offer. I said, look, this is not really a valid impeachment proceeding for all of the reasons that we've stated. But if the committees wish to return to the regular order of oversight requests, we stand ready to engage in that process. But that never happened. So I respect Congress. The administration respects Congress. But we respect the Constitution. We respect the Constitution, too. And we have an obligation to the executive branch and to the future presidency, future presidents to vindicate the Constitution and vindicate those rights. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Oregon. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk uh, for floor, uh, the House floor managers. Thank you. The question from Senator Wyden for the House managers. The Intelligence Committee is community is prohibited from requesting that a foreign entity target an American citizen when the intelligence community is itself prohibited from doing so. In 2017, Director Mike Pompeo's confirmation hearing to be the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, he testified that, quote, it is not lawful to outsource that which we cannot do, end quote. So when President Trump asked a foreign country to investigate an American when the U.S. government had not established a legal predicate to do so, how is that not an abuse of power? It is absolutely an abuse of power. Uh, and what's more, if you believe that a president can essentially engage in any corrupt activity as long as he believes that it will assist his reelection campaign and that campaign is in the public interest, then what's to stop a president from tasking his intelligence agencies to do political investigations? What's to stop him from tasking the Justice Department if he can come up with some credible or incredible claim that his opponent deserves to be investigated? Their argument would lead you to the conclusion that he has every right to do that, to use the intelligence agencies or the Justice Department to investigate a rival. And when they become a rival, it's even more justified. But you're absolutely right. If Secretary Pompeo is correct and you can't use your own intelligence agencies, you sure shouldn't be able to use the Russian ones or the Ukrainian ones. And here, you know, we have the president on that phone call pushing out this Russian propaganda, this Russian intelligence service propaganda, CrowdStrike, the server, as if there was just one server and it was whisked away to Ukraine. The Ukrainians hacked the server, not the Russians. A made-for-you-in-the-Kremlin conspiracy theory that undermines our own intelligence agencies but suits the political interests of the president and his... Legal agent Rudy Giuliani is out there peddling this fiction. The president himself is out there promoting this fiction, standing side by side with Vladimir Putin. But you're absolutely right. It would be a monumental abuse of power, and it is a monumental abuse of power. And if you don't think abuse of power is impeachable, well, don't take my word for it. Don't take earlier Dershowitz, Professor Dershowitz's word for it, or Jonathan Turley's word for it. Let's look to our Attorney General. This is what he said. The frame, under the framers' plan, the determination whether the president is making decisions based on improper motives, something that Professor Dershowitz says we're not allowed to consider, based on improper motives, or whether he is faithfully discharging his responsibilities, is left to the people through the election process and the Congress through the impeachment process. The fact that the president, that president is answerable for any abuses of discretion and is ultimately subject to the judgment of Congress through the impeachment process means that the president is not the judge in his own cause. Their own attorney general doesn't agree with their theory of the case. 
But again, we don't have to rely on Bill Barr's opinion or Alan Dershowitz's opinion or my opinion or the consensus of constitutional scholars everywhere. We can rely on our common sense because the conclusion that a president can abuse his power by corruptly entering into a quid pro quo to get a foreign intelligence service or a foreign government, a foreign leader to do their political dirty work and help them cheat in the election, our common sense tells us that cannot be compatible with the office of the presidency. And if we say it is, if we say it's beyond the reach of the impeachment power, or we engage in this sophistry and we say, because you put it under the rubric of abuse of power, even though that was the framers' core offense, and you didn't put it under some other rubric, well, we won't even consider it. If we're going to engage in that kind of legal sophistry, it leaves the country completely unprotected from a president who would abuse his power in this way. That cannot be what the framers had in mind. The Constitution is not a suicide pact. It does not require us to surrender our common sense. Our common sense, as well as our morality, tells us what the president did was wrong. When a president sacrifices the national security interests of the country, it's not only wrong, but it's dangerous. When a president says, as we saw just a moment again, over and over again, he will continue to do it if left into office, it is dangerous. The framers provided a remedy, and we urge you to use it. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Indiana. I ask to send a question to the desk on my behalf and uh, Senator Barrasso for the President's counsel. Thank you. Thank you. The question from Senator Braun and Barrasso for counsel for the president. The House managers have said the country must be saved from this president, and he does not have the best interests of the American people and their families in mind. Do you wish to respond to that claim? Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, while the House managers are coming before you in accusing the President of doing things, in their words, solely for personal and political gain, and claiming that he is not doing things in the best interest of the American people, the American people are telling you just the opposite. The President's approval rating, while we are sitting here in the middle of these impeachment proceedings, have hit an all-time high. A recent poll shows that the American people are the happiest they've been with the direction of the country in 15 years. Whether it's the economy, security, military preparedness, safer streets or safer neighborhoods, they are all way up. We, the American people, are happier. And yet, the House managers tell you that the President needs to be removed because he's an immediate threat to our country. Listen to the words that they just said. We, we the American people, cannot decide who should be our president because as they tell us, and these are their words, quote, we cannot be assured that the vote will be fairly won. Do you really, really believe that? Do you really think so little of the American people? We don't. We trust the American people to decide who should be our president. Candidly, it's crazy to think otherwise. So what's really going on? What's really going on is that he's a threat to them, and he's an immediate legitimate threat to them, and he's an immediate legitimate threat to their candidates because the election is only eight months away. Let's talk about some of the things the President has done. We've replaced NAFTA with the historic MCA. We've killed the terrorists al-Baghdadi and Soleimani. We secured $738 billion to rebuild the military. 
There are more than 7 million jobs created since the election. Illegal border crossings are down 78 percent since May, and 100, 100 miles of the wall have been built. The unemployment rate is the lowest in 50 years. More Americans, nearly 160 million, are employ, employed than ever before. The African American unemployment, the Hispanic American unemployment, the Asian American unemployment has the lowest rate ever recorded. Women's unemployment recently hit the lowest rate in more than 65 years. Every U.S. metropolitan area saw per capita growth in 2018. Real wages have gone up by 8% for the low-income workers. Real median household income is now the highest level ever recorded. 40 million fewer people live in households receiving government assistance. We signed the biggest package of tax cuts and reforms in history. Since then, over $1 trillion has poured back into the U.S. 650,000 single mothers have been lifted out of poverty. We secured the largest ever increase for child care funding, helping more than 800,000 low-income families access high-quality high quality affordable care. We passed, as Manager Jeffries will recall, bipartisan criminal justice reform. Prescription drugs have been seen the lowest price decrease, the largest price decrease in over half a century. Drug overdose deaths fell nationwide in 2018 for the first time in nearly 30 years. A Gallup poll from just three days ago says that President Trump's upbeat view of the nation's economy, military strength, economic opportunity, and overall quality of life will likely resonate with Americans when he delivers the State of the Union address to Congress next week. If all that is solely, solely in their words, for his personal and political gain, and not in the best interest of the, Amer of the American people, then I say, God bless him, keep doing it. Keep doing it, keep doing it. Maybe if the House managers stop opposing him and harassing him and harassing everyone associated with him with the constant letters and the constant investigations, maybe we can even get more done. Let's try something different now. Join us, join us, one nation, one nation, one people. Enough is enough. Stop all of this. Thank you. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Colorado. Thank you. I send a question to the desk for myself and Senator Schatz and Senator Menendez. Thank you. The question from Senators Bennett, Menendez, and Schatz is to the House managers. If the Senate accepts the President's blanket assertion of privilege in the House impeachment inquiry, what are the consequences to the American people? How will the Senate ensure that the current President or a future President will remain transparent and accountable? How will this affect the separation of powers? And in this context, could you address the President's counsel's claim that the President's advisors are entitled to the same protections as a whistleblower? Senate. Privileges are limited. We have voted to impeach the President for, among other things, Article 2 of the impeachment is total defiance of House subpoenas. And the President announced it in advance, I will defy all the subpoenas. What does this mean? It means there is no information to Congress. It means a claim of monarchical dictatorial power. If Congress has no information, it cannot act. If the President can defy, now, he can dispute certain specific uh, uh, claims. You can claim privilege, et cetera but to defy categorically all subpoenas, to announce in advance you're going to do that, and to do it is to say that Congress has no power at all, only the executive has power. That's why Article 2 is impeaching him for abuse of Congress. That's why, for much lesser degree of offense, Richard Nixon was, was impeached for 
abuse of Congress for the same uh, um, defiance of any attempt to, uh, by the Congress to investigate. But this is, and what are the consequences? The consequences, if this is to be, um, um, if he's to get away with it, is that any subpoena you vote in the future, any information you want in the future from any future president may be denied you with no excuses, announce in advance, I'll defy all the subpoenas. It eviscerates Congress and establishes the department, the executive department as a total dictatorship. That's the consequences. Now I want to also talk about, and the motives, the motives are clearly dictatorial. But I want to also take a point, since I have the floor, to answer a question, to comment on a question that Senator Collins and Senator Murkowski asked yesterday. And they asked about the question of mixed motives. What if, how do you define, how do you deal with a, with, with a, with a deed, with a president who may have a corrupt motive and a fine motive? And how do you deal with it? And Professor Dershowitz said, well, you have to look at the, uh, you have to mix, you have to weigh the balances. Nonsense. Nonsense. We never, in American law, look at decent motives if you can prove a corrupt motive. If I am offered a bribe, and I accept the bribe for corrupt motive, I will not be heard in defense to say, oh, I would have voted for the bill anyway. It was a good bill. You don't inquire into other motives. Maybe you had good motives. But once the corrupt motive and the corrupt act was established, there is no comparison. All of this is just nonsense to point away from the fact that the president has been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, and the defenders don't even bother really to defend. They just come out with distractions. He's been proven beyond a reasonable to have abused his power by violating the law to withhold military aid from a foreign country, to extort that country into helping his reelection campaign by slandering his opponent. Corrupt? No question. Violation of the law? No question. Factually? No question. They don't even make a real attempt to, to deny it. Everything is a distraction. And the one chief distraction is once you prove a corrupt act, that's it. You never measure uh, the degree of maybe had decent motives, too. So Professor Dershowitz, in talking about that, in talking about uh, the absolute power of the presidency, was just uh, absent from American law or any kind of Western law. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Georgia. I send a question to the desk for the President's counsel on behalf of myself, Senator Ernst and Senator Brasso. Thank you. Question from Senator Perdue, Ernst, and Barrasso uh, for counsel for the president is as follows. Please summarize the House of Representatives three-stage investigation and how the president was denied due process in each stage. Combined with Manager Schiff's repeated leaks during the House's investigation, do these due process violations make this impeachment the fruit of the poisonous tree? Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for that question. And the, the short answer, as I think I've indicated a couple of the times that I've been up here, is yes, this entire proceeding here is now the fruit of the poisonous tree. It is the fruit of a proceeding that was fatally deficient in due process from the start to the beginning. And as a result of that, it produced a record that is totally unreliable can't be relied on here for any conclusion other than acquitting the president. And let me detail the three phases. First, the first error was that the House began the proceeding in a totally unconstitutional, unlawful, and illegitimate manner. It started an impeachment inquiry 
without any vote of the House to authorize that inquiry. And I, I want to spend a second on this because the House managers have spent a lot of time today trying to go back and argue about w why their proceeding was all right. But they're, they're not actually engaging the real issues. In order for the House to exercise the power of impeachment, there has to be a delegation of that authority to a committee. That's just a fundamental principle that the Constitution gives power to the House itself, not to individual members of the House, not to the Speaker. Just as here in the Senate, you wouldn't think that the majority leader could say, if an impeachment arrived, the majority leader could say, guess what, we're not going to do a trial with the whole Senate. I, the majority leader, am going to just decide that I'm going to have one committee hear the evidence, provide a summary, and then you all can vote. The majority leader doesn't have the authority on his own to do that. The Speaker doesn't have the authority in the House to give the power of impeachment to any committee to start pursuing an inquiry. And this is the key. There is no rule giving any committee in the House the authority to use the power of impeachment. Rule 10 speaks of legislative authority, not the power of impeachment. And all the subpoenas that were issued came with letters saying on them, pursuant to the House's impeachment inquiry, they purported to be using a power that hadn't actually been delegated to the committee. That's the first flaw. Illegitimate, unlawful proceeding from the start. Then there are the due process flaws. Three stages of hearings. One, secret hearings in the basement bunker. Presidents locked out. No opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, to see the evidence, to present evidence. And then they go from that to the public hearings, which really just a public show trial, because the president is still cut out, totally unprecedented in any presidential impeachment, that there would be that second phase of public hearings where the president is still cut out, can't present evidence. The minority members don't have equal subpoena authority. The third phase in front of the House Judiciary Committee, they purport to have offered rights, but I've explained that. It was illusory, because they had already decided before the president was, even was supposed to respond with what rights he would like to exercise, the speaker had announced the result. There were going to be articles of impeachment. The Judiciary Committee had decided they weren't going to hear from any fact witnesses. They had no plans for hearings. It was all a foregone conclusion because they had to get it done by Christmas. And the third error, the Chairman Schiff was in charge of all the fact finding. And he had an interest, because of the interactions of his office with the whistleblower that we still don't know about, to shut down questioning about the motive, the bias, the, the reasons that the whistleblower, how this all came about. All three of those errors infected this process from the very beginning. They resulted in a one-sided, slanted fact-finding that was rushed by a person controlling the fact-finding who had a motive to limit what facts would be allowed to get into the proceedings. And it produced a record that cannot possibly be relied on here. We've said many times, the Supreme Court has made clear that cross-examination is the greatest legal engine ever invented for the discovery of truth, and they didn't permit the president the opportunity to cross-examine anyone. And that's an indication that the goal was not a search for the truth. It was a partisan charade intended to justify a preordained result and to get it done by Christmas. And it's not a record that can be relied on here. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Illinois. I send a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. The question from Senator Duckworth for the House managers. If the hold on aid to Ukraine was meant to be kept secret until the President could gather internal U.S. government information on Ukraine corruption and European cost sharing, then is there any documentary evidence of this? For example, is there any evidence that the President was briefed on those issues by the NSC, DOD, or State Department during the period of the hold in the summer of 2019? or any evidence that he requested specific information on anti-corruption reform measures in Ukraine. 
prior to releasing the aid on September 11, 2019, did the President order any changes to administration policy to address corruption in Ukraine or burden sharing with our European allies? Chief Justice, uh, thank you, uh, Senator, for that question. Let's just take a, a moment and um, address what the process should have looked like. Uh, because you know, as we've already established and as President's Council has conceded and we've conceded is this does happen. Right? There is a legitimate policy process for review and for determination on hold because there is indeed legitimate policy reasons to hold aid. Uh, and we've never said that corruption is not one of those, or burden sharing wouldn't be one of those. What we're saying is, is there's no evidence that in what we are talking about today that the president was concerned or engaged that process. So what would normally happen is Congress would come together, as we did. We passed appropriations bills, and we made a determination that funding was appropriate for the aid which 87 members of the Senate did uh, this past year. The President would then rely on the advice of government experts from the National Security Council, the Department of Defense, the State Department, and the Office of Management and Budget regarding that aid. That's the, the, the interagency process that we've talked so much about, the interagency process that we went through earlier last year and at the conclusion of that interagency process, it was determined that it had met all of the conditions for the aid, and all the agencies determined that it should go forward. The president would then seek permission from Congress that he intended to, uh, would normally, if there was a reason, the president would go back and seek permission from Congress to hold the aid. So let me repeat that. If there were a reason to hold it, the president and President Trump has done this in the past under legitimate processes, as has President Obama and prior presidents, would go back to Congress under pre-described uh, processes and make sure that they're not violating the Empowerment Control Act and seek permission to hold it. That did not happen. Congress would then weigh in on the request by either approving or denying the president's request. And then unless Congress specifically approves the president's request, the aid must be made available. Of course, none of that happened. In this instance, a hold was put in place. We don't know exactly when because the president and his agencies have prevented us and his counsel have prevented us from getting that information, but a hold was put in place. No reason was given. And in fact, the only one within the United States government who apparently knows why that hold was put into place is president's counsel, who tried to tell us last night why he thinks the hold was put into place, but nobody else knows. So yes, the answer is, if there was a legitimate policy process put in place, there will be a lot of information about burden sharing, about corruption, about any of the other concerns to which we have no evidence. And if burden sharing, to the last point of the question, was a concern, then the person who should have been asked to discuss those concerns with the EU and our European partners would have been Ambassador Sondland, because he is the United States ambassador to the European Union. And not once did President Trump go to Ambassador Sondland and say, discuss these issues with the EU and the Europeans, saying they need to provide more money. Not once did that happen. And it didn't happen because it wasn't the real concern. All the evidence shows the President withheld taxpayer money, foreign aid to our partner at war to coerce them to start a political investigation to benefit his 2020 election campaign. That is what the evidence shows, and that's why we are still here. And there is one person that can provide additional information on that, and that is Ambassador Bolton. And yes, it is still a good time to subpoena Ambassador Bolton. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Maine. I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Crapo, Brunt, Blunt, and Rubio. Thank you.
The question from Senator Collins and the other senators for both parties, are there legitimate circumstances under which a president could request a foreign country to investigate a U.S. citizen, including a political rival who is not under investigation by the U.S. government? If so, what are they and how do they apply to the present case? The House goes first. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, Senator, it would be hard for me to contemplate circumstances where that would be appropriate. Where it would be appropriate for the President of the United States to seek a political investigation of an opponent. One of the, I think, most important post-Watergate reforms was to divorce decisions about specific cases, specific prosecutions, from the White House to the Justice Department to build a wall. One of the many norms that has broken down under this presidency is that wall has been obliterated, where the president has affirmatively and aggressively sought to investigate his rivals. I cannot conceive of circumstances where that is appropriate. Um, it may be appropriate for the Justice Department, acting independently and in good faith, to initiate investigation. There's a process for doing that. We heard testimony about that. You can make requests under the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, the MLAT process, when a foreign country has evidence involving a criminal case involving a U.S. person. There is a legitimate way to, to do that. That didn't happen here. In fact, when Bill Barr's name was first revealed when that transcript was brought to light, the Justice Department immediately said, we have nothing to do with this. We have nothing to do with this. Um, here, this particular domestic political errand was being done by the President's personal lawyer. Um, I wanted to follow up also, while I can, Senator, on my colleagues' comments in terms of mixed motives. If you conclude the President acted with mixed motives, some of them corrupt and forbidden, some of them legitimate, you should vote to convict. That principle is deeply rooted in our legal tradition. It is commonplace in civil and criminal law going back centuries. For example, in describing the standard for corrupt motive of, for obstruction, the Seventh Circuit rejected any requirement that a defendant's only or even main purpose was to obstruct the due administration of justice. Instead, the court explained, a defendant is guilty if his motives included any corrupt, forbidden goals. That case, the United States v. Cueto, which I cited earlier, is not only relevant here, but that case was argued by Professor Dershowitz, and he lost. He made the argument he's made and the President's lawyers have made today. They lost that case, and for a good reason. It's contrary to the history of our legal traditions. If someone, uh, and this is the, the founders were concerned, for example, that a president might be charged with bribing members of the Electoral College. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for that question. Um, I'd like to start by pointing out that the question sort of assumes that there is a request for an investigation in a foreign country of a United States person. I'd just like to bring it back, though, here to the transcript of the July 25th call, where President Trump didn't ask President Zelensky specifically for an investigation or an investigation into Vice President Biden or his son Hunter. I mean, there's a lot of loose talk in sort of shorthand reference to it that way. But what he refers to is the incident in which the prosecutor was fired. And the first thing that he says in that whole exchange is talking about the prosecutor being fired. And it's, he says it sounds horrible to him. And the situation with Burisma. And so, and all that the, that the president says is, so if you can look into it, it sounds horrible. It sounds like a bad situation. That's not calling for an investigation necessarily into Vice President Biden or his son, but the situation in which the prosecutor had been fired, which affected anti-corruption efforts in the Ukraine. And President Zelensky responded by saying, the issue of the investigation of the case is actually the issue of making sure to restore the honesty. So we will take care of that. And he's explaining that he understands that it's an issue that has to do with was an investigation there, over there, that their prosecutor was handling 
derailed in a way that affected their anti-corruption efforts, and it's something worth looking into. It's the president making clear that we're not saying that's off limits. It sounds bad to the U.S. as well. But let me get more specifically to the question, is there any situation where it might be legitimate to ask for an investigation overseas? Yes, if there was a conduct by a U.S. person overseas that potentially violated uh, the law of that country, but didn't violate the law of this country, but there was a national interest in having some information about that and understanding what went on, then it would be perfectly legitimate to suggest this is something worth looking into. We have an interest in knowing about this, even if it's not something that would mean a criminal investigation here in the United States. And so that could arise in various circumstances where a person had done something overseas, but there was a national interest in understanding what they had done. Thank you. The Democratic leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I send the question to the desk for the President's counsel and the House managers. Thank you. The Democratic leader's question is this. Yesterday, I asked the President's counsel about the President's claim of absolute immunity. Specifically, I asked the President's lawyers to name a single document or witness that the President turned over to the House impeachment inquiry in response to their request or subpoena. Mr. Philbin spoke for five minutes and talked about the various types of immunities and privileges the President could invoke but did not answer my question. So I ask once again, can you name a single witness or document that the President turned over to the House impeachment inquiry? It is directed to both parties, and the President's counsel goes first. Mr. Chief Justice, Minority Leader Schumer, Thank you for that question. I apologize if I was not direct in getting to the nub of the question yesterday. Um, I was intending to explain the, the rationales that the administration had provided for its actions and to explain, contrary to the question, that it was not simply absolute defiance and not simply a blanket assertion that we won't do anything. That's the way the House managers have tried to characterize it. But so let me be clear. There were document subpoenas issued prior to uh, the adoption of House Resolution 660. The President explained, the administration explained in various letters all of those were invalid and there were no documents produced in response. There were no documents produced in response because all of those subpoenas were invalid. There was no attempt to reissue those subpoenas or to retroactively attempt to authorize them. There were then um, subpoenas for witnesses who were senior advisors to the President. The President advised the, the committees that had issued those that those senior advisors had absolute immunity and they were not produced for testimony. Those three senior advisors were not produced. There were then witness, uh, subpoenas for witnesses to others who the House managers, the House Democrats insisted they would be required to testify without the benefit of agency counsel. And I've explained that principle. The Office of Legal Counsel advised that those um, subpoenas attempting to require executive branch officials to testify without the benefit of agency counsel were unconstitutional, and so those witnesses were not produced. Still, there were 17 witnesses who testified, not including the 18th witness, the ICIG, whose testimony is still secret. So there was quite a bit of testimony, and there have been um, subsequently some documents relevant to this produced under FOIA. And I just want to raise that because it makes clear that if you follow the law, and you follow the rules and you make a document request that's valid, documents get produced. If you don't follow the law, the administration resisted. That's why the documents weren't produced, because the subpoenas were invalid, and we made that very clear. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Not a single document was turned over, not a single witness was produced, and the witnesses that did come came in defiance of the orders of the President. Now, counsel has obviously made all these claims that we think are completely spurious, 
But what they don't answer is, what was the motivation to fight all the subpoenas? They argue this interpretation which the courts have rejected, that have looked at it, that somehow these subpoenas were invalid. But why didn't they produce the documents? Why did they insist on this now discredited by the court's legal theory? Because they were covering up the president's misconduct. Um, now, I want to return briefly uh, uh, to finish uh, the comments I was making earlier about the senator's question earlier on mixed motives. There's a good reason why mixed motives are no defense. Otherwise, officials who committed misconduct could always claim that even if they did it, that even if it was corrupt, they must be acquitted because they were able to invent some phony motivation and insist it played some minor role in their scheme. Imagine how that principle would apply to a president charged with bribing members of the Electoral College. Multiple framers cited this specific threat while discussing impeachment at the Constitutional Convention. Could a president defend himself on the ground that he was motivated in part by a noble desire to reward members of the Electoral College for their public service? Could he defend it on the ground that even as he handed over the bribes, he wasn't just acting corruptly, but he was also seeking to advance the public interest by keeping himself in power? According to the president's lawyers, yes, he could. Indeed, for all the reasons we provided, there's no doubt that the president's quid pro quo is solicitation of foreign interference and his use of official acts to compel that interference were a fundamentally corrupt scheme, by which I mean the motive and intent was to benefit himself, to obtain personal political gain while ignoring and injuring core national interests in our democracy and our security. We have de demonstrated, we believe, that the scheme was entirely corrupt. But if you have any question about that, ask John Bolton. If there's any question about whether the motive was mixed or not mixed, ask John Bolton. Uh, he has relevant testimony. You can ask also Mick Mulvaney. You can subpoena the documents and answer the earlier questions. What the documents say about when the president withheld the aid, whether there was any interagency discussion of reforms in the RADA, I mean, the President's counsel literally made the argument that the circumstance that changed was a change in the RADA. There is no evidence to support that idea. Time has expired. The Majority Leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, <clears throat> I ask that we stand in recess until 4. Without objection, so ordered. And with that, we are in a 22 minute break until the top of the hour, four o'clock Eastern time. We want to use that opportunity to hear from you. If you had the chance to ask a question to either the House managers or to the president's defense lawyers, what question would that be and why? Our phone lines are open at 202-748-8920 for those of you in the Eastern or Central time zones and 202-748-8921 if you're in the Mountain of Pacific time zones. You can also text us, by the way, at 202-748-8903. Live view of the U.S. Capitol on this Thursday afternoon. We're going to be monitoring the senators as they depart uh, the Senate chamber. Many may be heading back to their offices or uh, stay in the Capitol. There's a location in the basement of the Capitol where the Senate subway uh, drops the senators off from the Hart, Russell, and Dirksen Senate office buildings. And so we'll keep an eye on that. If any of the senators come to the microphone, we will carry it live. Do want to share with you uh, this one tweet from uh, uh, one moment that took place. Senator Rand Paul sending a question to the desk during the impeachment trial. The Chief Justice John Roberts, the presiding officer, declining to read the question as submitted. That was a moment that certainly got a lot of attention, and uh, we'll share that with you in just a moment. But um, Senator Mark Warner, Democrat of Virginia, appears to be coming to the microphone, so we'll monitor that if he comes over to talk. He's shaking his head to the reporters. Uh, again, that's from the Senate subway. Uh, let's go to Matthew, who's joining us from Somerville. Oh, here we go to the uh, microphone, and Senator Braun of Indiana. I guess we'll start with who we have. So um, I think uh, now that we're into the, uh, you know, the beginning of the end on the questions, my observation would be that we're uh, not gleaning a lot of new information. 
I personally think almost every senator on each side has probably already come to a conclusion. Uh, of course, the question has been about the new information out there. In my own mind, I think that uh, if you think you need more after all this, uh, it's hard to understand, but I respect uh, the people that do need it. It gets more and more intertwined with, with that additional information. Does that mean it would really uh, change your decision on the main event, which is the vote that we'll all have to make to uh, acquit or convict? Well, it does seem after listening to all of this, and now we're at a point where we've had about 120 questions, each for the, about five minutes of answers, that uh, to me, the House has failed to make the case for impeachment for the two specific articles of impeachment. So the question that now we're all being asked is, is this the end of the process after 17 witnesses and thousands of pages of documents and basically a three-year ongoing process? Or is that just the beginning of a whole new drawn-out process with uh, lots of witnesses, time being spent so we can't get to the work of the American people? And this at the same time when voters are going to the polls starting uh, with the caucuses in Iowa on Monday in an election year. The thing that's so interesting to me about the House manager's case is just during the last two weeks of the trial, 30 times they said the evidence is overwhelming, 33 times they said they have made the case. They shouldn't need any more. If that's the case that they brought to us, I think it's time to vote. I'm ready to vote and I'm ready to vote now. So in the Clinton trial, after there were witnesses there obviously, but after that was over, there was closing arguments, there were several days of deliberations, there were speeches behind closed doors. If you guys defeat the call for witnesses, do you think you should then vote right away, or would there be something more like the Clinton precedent where there's more deliberative time before you decide what your final verdict would be? Yeah, my understanding is essentially the closing arguments are going to be two hours for each side tomorrow afternoon, probably starting at 1 o'clock. So when we're finished with that, then the vote would occur on the issue of witnesses. Uh, and if we are able to say, no, we want to go right now to final judgment, that we would move to that uh, in that direction and stay here until that work is decided and completed Friday evening. So do you think that'll be the case, that your colleagues will be ready to move to that right away if you didn't the, the witness vote? Th that's where all the momentum is right now. Thank you. What do you uh, oh. Which Republican oh. senators are not ready so when it comes to the senators, that uh, I think we all know there are a few on each side. I think it's uh, maybe unfair to focus on which Republicans. I think there are two or three on the other side as well. So we all know that there are a few having trouble making up their mind. I'm not going to say who they are. You probably have your own best guess. I think it's very few on each side. I think most people, after all of this, like John said, have got as much information as they need. And do we want to bust into the next election cycle when you enter into a process that has no uh, clear way that it would end. I think that's a disservice to the American public. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, we're that much closer to getting an acquittal for the president, which is the, um, which is the outcome that uh, is certainly uh, certainly warranted. I would just want to step back as, as I'm hopeful this is going to end tomorrow night. Um, step back and just say on if you go back to September 24th when the Speaker of the House announced that they were going to start this impeachment investigation, uh, the conventional wisdom was that there would be Republicans who would be voting for the articles of impeachment as they left the House. She would have never predicted, none of you would have predicted, that every single Republican in the House would vote against the articles. You'd have one Democrat vote with us, another Democrat vote with us on one of the articles, a third Democrat vote present, and a fourth Democrat vote with us, and then switch parties. And I think the real question is tomorrow, how many Democrats are going to vote to acquit the president and do what happened in the House? Um, that, to me, shows you how strong the president's case is, how good the arguments have been made by the, uh, by the White House counsel. And um, Mark and I, and I think a whole bunch of other Americans, are hopeful that this is all over tomorrow night and we get an acquittal for the president. We'll take some questions. What if it's not over with an acquittal? The chairmanship, Speaker Pelosi haven't ruled out the possibility that they would try to subpoena some of the folks who haven't testified to come back to the House and talk, like John Bolton. I mean, what would your reaction be if 
this continues to be an ongoing rollout of additional evidence Here, after I, the fact. I fully expect that. I mean, we, I mean, that's just par for the course for these guys. I mean, it started, what, on February of last year when Michael Cohen came. Their first announced witness, their first big announced witness for this Congress was Michael Cohen, a guy who came in front of our committee and lied seven times under oath. Um, that was their, then it was the emoluments issue, then it was the White House security clearance issue, and on and on it goes. They're never going to stop attacking this president, so I fully expect that. But the American people understand that it is ridiculous, and they see through it. Was it appropriate for Justice Roberts to block the Rand Paul question naming the alleged whistleblower? I think every single senator should be able to ask the questions that they want to ask in the form and format that they want to ask it. Um, so I, I think the senator's question should be, uh, should be asked. I think the Chief Justice has done a good job running the overall proceedings, but every senator, I believe, deserves the right to ask the question in, in, the, uh, in the form that they've posed it and presented it. I think every senator should be able to ask the question in the in the form and format that they've presented it to uh, to the to the presiding officer, um, and then I, I think that just should be how it's done. Remember, when this all started, the guy who's talked more on the Senate floor than anyone else, Mr. Schiff, remember what he told us: "We look forward to hearing from the whistleblower." Boy, that's changed. That has certainly changed. So. Um, uh, I think, like I said, Senator uh, Senator Paul should should have been able to have his question uh, posed to the House managers and to the. Uh, I think it was probably directed to the House managers. Are you are you optimistic that it's going to be over tomorrow? Are you confident it's going to be October tomorrow? I'm optimistic. Yes, very very much so. I think Mark is as well. Yeah, I think right now, I think uh, most of our senators obviously are taking uh, very copious notes as they're listening to uh, the back and forth uh, on the questions. I think we're at up to what 135 140 questions at this point uh, it starts to get redundant uh, each day uh, now is, is starting to go back into things that we've already heard that have already been asked and answered uh, but I think for most Americans they want us to move on to something else that actually matters to them and uh, and, and I think it's important for our country that we do that uh, we've got the start it's critical that it stops now. We've got the start of of the 2020 election process starting in Iowa in just a couple of days. So to end this now, uh, in anticipation of voters already engaging on who they want to be uh, their next president in 2020, I think is uh, a, a critical deadline that should be honored and should be respected. If a Republican senator votes to hear from witnesses, like if Susan Collins does, is that a vote against the president? You know, I, I, listen, uh, Senator Collins is, is a very serious and thoughtful senator, and she represents a state that's very different than my state. Uh, that being said, uh, wanting to get additional information is not voting against the president. Uh, if she voted to uh, uh, not to acquit the president, I would see it in, in, that, uh, uh, in that light. Although, uh, I, you know, I must confess that uh, part of uh, this decision-making process is, is how much longer are you going to let Adam Schiff and their team continue to take the country through this process? You know, I thought it would stop with Mueller, you know, but it didn't stop with Mueller. I thought it would stop with Crossfire Hurricane, but it didn't stop with Crossfire Hurricane. I thought it would stop when they started talking about the Trump Hotel and the fact that uh, the president should uh, divest of the Trump Hotel. But the other day, even on that issue, we heard my Democrat colleagues say that, no, he shouldn't divest of it. He should give it back without any compensation. I mean, it, you know, the arguments continue to get more ridiculous each and every day. And uh, I don't think, I, I agree with uh, Congressman Jordan, I don't think that we'll see the end of this. It will be one uh, issue after another until uh, they realize that it's not connecting with the American voter across the country. Congressman, so uh, the president that Democrats are saying would be set if the president is acquitted so let's say hypothetically, Republicans take the House in 2020 or 2024 with the Democratic president in office, and the Democratic president just refuses to 
comply with any congressional subpoenas from, from your committees. So we had that I mean, how, how do you have any moral Well, we've already had that. Well, well, we've already had that. There is a process that... Uh, well, sure, there was no blanket refusal from the Obama administration. Well, you, you've, uh, sir, you must not have been here during Fast and Furious. Uh, with all due respect, I was, you weren't, That's and I can. Pro refusal uh, to all subpoenas, though. Well, is it? I, I can tell you the judiciary is there to be the arbiter between uh, conflicts between the two branches. That's what we're seeing. But we had one branch, in this case Congress, decide that they were not going to go and allow that arbiter to actually uh, meet out and and. Uh, uh, have a decision, so and so as as as, a, as, we, as let me finish the question, forward. sir. Let me finish the question. Uh, and so as we look at at this particular issue, uh, I've I've been one of the few members of Congress who have signed on bipartisan letters under both administrations to make sure they comply. I will continue to do that, but we have a process, and that process is slow and laborious, and what we had was a rush to get this impeachment on the resume of President Donald J. Trump for political purposes. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Two of the president's loyal defenders uh, speaking to reporters, and before that, two senators, John Barrasso and uh, Rick Braun of, uh, Senator Braun of uh, Indiana. We want to get your calls, your reaction in the remaining 10 to 15 minutes during this Senate break. Share with you one of the tweets from Senator Rand Paul because it's one of the storylines that's been getting a lot of attention as he named the whistleblower in a question to uh, the uh, impeachment managers and to the president's lawyers. He wrote, my question is not about a whistleblower as I have no independent information on his identity. My question is about the actions of known Obama partisans within the NSC and the House staff and how they are reported to have conspired before impeachment proceedings had even begun. Of course, the other issue is impeach, uh, is the issue of witnesses. And before the uh, Q&A session started today in the U.S. Senate, Senator Chuck Schumer speaking to reporters on Capitol Hill. Here's what he said on that front. Look, we've always said this is an uphill fight. The pressure that Trump, who's a vindictive, nasty president, and McConnell placed on them is large, but we're still hopeful. Truth prevails. We, our caucus is so strong and so united because, frankly, we believe we have truth and right on our side. And to boot, after four weeks of talking about this, the American people are strongly on our side. The overwhelming majority, 75 percent, including a major significant majority of Republicans, are for witnesses and documents. And you know, it's rare in a public poll that you get Republican rank and file disagreeing with President Trump. But in this case, they do. So we're continuing to make the argument and make the fight. And um, we think that truth can prevail and we can get the four votes. That from the Senate Democratic leader before the proceeding began at 1 o'clock Eastern time. They are in a break that will last until about 4 o'clock, give or take a couple of minutes. And then the proceedings will continue uh, into uh, potentially the early evening hours. So far, according to our producer, Craig Kaplan, 120 questions between yesterday and today. Matthew is joining us from Somerville, Massachusetts. If you had the chance to ask a question, Matthew, what would it be? Hi, I just, I want to know why... Like, they're not pushing the fact more that, like, it doesn't matter what Biden was doing in Ukraine, if they were doing anything at all. Trump can't just send his goons over to Ukraine and have them investigate. Like, we have a system set in place that the Department of Justice can go and investigate. We have people in the government that can go investigate this legally. Like, how is that not raising questions that, He's sending his goons like Giuliani and these mm -hmm. Ukrainian people to go investigate. Like, that's not their job. That's the job of we have a system set up to investigate these things. And for Republicans to just turn a blind eye to that and say, oh, that's OK, you can do that. I mean, that's ridiculous. Like, Thanks for the call. That... Let's go on to Tyler in Portland, Oregon. Same question to you. If you had the chance to ask a question, Tyler, what would it be? Hello. 
The question that I would want both sides to answer would be, should governors and senators and congressional reps use President Trump as a role model and begin to put financial holds on state and federal budgets until the DOJ or state AG launch investigations into their political enemies? Is this the model that the country is supposed to be operating on at every level? Would be my question. Our next caller from Georgia, David. Good afternoon to you. Yes, sir. How are you? And I appreciate y'all letting me come on your uh, certainly uh, a thing here. So, David, uh, what question would you ask the impeachment managers or the president's defense lawyers? I'd ask them, how come we keeping up with this crap? The American people have heard this. Uh, the House members, the House members didn't do their job. And a lot of people don't know what the Constitution and the Bill of Rights say. It's not the Senate's place to call witnesses. I think we've got enough witnesses, and we've heard enough. The country's heard enough of this bull crap for three and a half years of the Democrats. The Democrats are the demon party. And uh, the issue is I want to ask uh, why Adam Schiff, uh, they're trying to prolong this, asking for more witnesses. We don't need no more witnesses. We need to quit the president and throw this crap out the door. I'm a Vietnam veteran Marine. And the issue is we don't need to be in a, a European nation and with troops or anything. We need to pull our troops out and put them around the American border. Then we wouldn't be fussing over money to a foreign country. Thanks for the call. You looked earlier, uh, saw Jim Jordan, Republican of Ohio, one of the president's staunchest defenders, along with Mark Meadows, who spoke to reporters. And this is an area just outside the Senate chamber as uh, those senators uh, are buttonholed for a question or two by the assembled press. We have limited access, but we also are able to hear from uh, the principals as they come down to the microphone in the basement of the Capitol. Paul is joining us in Rockville, Maryland. Good afternoon. What question would you ask the lawyers? Hi. Well, I'd actually ask Trump's, lawyer, Trump's lawyers uh, what they have to say about Hunter Biden and the debunked conspiracy that he is uh, have has had like sketchy relations with Charisma when in, when uh, uh, what's his name uh, Slochevsky was not even being investigated by Victor Shokin, the prosecutor. Thank you for the call. This is from Sarah Ferris, who covers Capitol Hill for Politico, on a tweet saying, a chorus of woe and hey was audible on the Democratic side, seeming to take issue with Attorney Jay Sekulow's tone and personal tax on three senators. But Chief Justice Roberts appeared to ignore it rather than call out Sekulow as he did with Nadler earlier this week. Since it's a story that's getting a lot of attention, especially on social media, again, this is the moment in which the Chief Justice of the United States was handed a question by Senator Rand Paul. This is what it looked like on the Senate floor. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from Kentucky. I have a question to present to the desk for the House Manager Schiff and for the President's Counsel. The presiding officer declines to read the question as submitted. That from the Chief Justice of the United States and a couple of headlines related to that, including the Hill.com, is John Roberts refusing to read the question from Rand Paul on the whistleblower. In the Daily News, Rand Paul names the alleged Ukraine whistleblower after the Chief Justice refuses to read his question in the impeachment trial. Let's go back to your phone calls. Len in Bullhead City, Arizona. Good afternoon. Yeah, how are you today? I've uh, been watching this thing for the last couple of weeks, and actually since uh, 2016, we have nothing but impeachment for the last three and a half years. And uh, I just hope to get it over with, and we're all going to reelect them again. Thank you. As we said, 120 questions uh, by the senators in written form. 
Those questions then read by the Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, they're taking a short mid-afternoon break. We'll come back and we'll get more information in terms of what the rest of the afternoon and into the early evening hours will look like. The Senate then scheduled to be back in session tomorrow with a number of votes, including whether to have witnesses. This, though, is the final day of the Q&A sessions divided between the Democrats and Republicans, eight hours for each side. Uh, senators coming back in, including the Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, Paul in Boise, Idaho. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I do find it interesting um, that both sides are specifically saying, you know, we're we're after the truth. And, you know, Leader Pelosi and Leader Schumer are quick to say, you know, you'll 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 get the truth and it'll set you free. Um, that's contingent upon those who stay in the truth. If you continue in the truth then the truth will set you free. If I was to ask a senator a question in regarding um, testimony from Biden or anyone who wants to call through Biden, mm -hmm. I would ask, if you're going to question Senator Biden, does the, bl does the blackberries, the encrypted blackberries that they use for their communications during Obama's tenure, is that permissible to be held in court? Thank you. Now, we'll, go, we'll go to David in Marlboro, New Jersey. If you could ask a question, David, what would it be? Thank you for, my, uh, thank you for the call. Sure. My question is, the articles of impeachment claim that President Trump abused his power as president by asking a foreign country to investigate his political rival. How is that different from President Obama's FBI hiring a foreign intelligence agent Thank you, David. Let's listen to uh, Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio. Prosecution. Uh, that's the House leaders. You have the defense, the president's lawyers. Then you have witnesses and testimony. Uh, and you have evidence. And it's a sham trial without it. And when I see what clearly McConnell, I mean, you know, Trump doesn't want, doesn't want witnesses, even though he said this is all hearsay and witnesses were actually in the room. That's kind of the whole point. But Trump doesn't want witnesses. Uh, McConnell's a lapdog for Trump, clearly, and we need four Republican senators to grow a backbone and to say, yes, we need witnesses. It's a, it's a sham trial if they rush this through. I mean, you've seen how they've done it. They've turned off some cameras in the Senate chamber from normal business. They've restricted you all to certain places, and when they never do that before, because you can roam freely and talk to any of us anytime, pretty much, those of us that are always willing to talk to the press like I am. Um, and try. And McConnell wants to get this through as quickly with as little attention as possible. And the, the country, clearly, I mean, 75% of the country thinks they, they, this isn't a real trial unless there are witnesses. And this so undermines the confidence of people in this system. For the next six months, for the next five years, people are going to think this trial wasn't a legitimate trial and that the president probably, in fact, was guilty. So Senator Brown just said that um, it was uh, Ill basically illegitimate to begin with because of the way it started in the House. What is your reaction to that? No, I mean I don't see I don't see any evidence that it was illegitimate. They went through hearings. They asked repeatedly for the president to to produce witnesses. I mean, the, 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 clearly, the, the country overwhelmingly understands that the president of the United States solicited a bribe from a foreign leader. He asked a foreign leader. Uh, for help for himself and offered something, a policy of our government to ask for, him, for help for himself. That clearly is an abuse of power. Uh, we, know, we know that the House needed to act. If the House, I mean, think about this. If, if we do nothing, if we find him not guilty, the president's going to do more of it. He's already, he already tried to, he got help in the 16 election. The Mueller report showed that. He encouraged it in 16. He's encouraged it more now. He will encourage it even more if he gets off with no Republican having the backbone to say to him, no. I mean, the, the, the problem fundamentally with my colleagues is, is they are scared of this president. Senator Sherrod Brown now back live to the Senate chamber in the afternoon Q&A session live on C-SPAN 2. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Idaho. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Risch, Graham, Ernst, Fisher, Cruz, and Purdue. Thank you.
The question from Senator Crapo and the other senators for counsel for the president. How many witnesses have been presented to the Senate at this point in this trial? How many pages of documentary evidence have been put in the record before the Senate in this trial? And how many other clips and transcripts of evidence have been presented to the Senate in this trial? Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for that question. <clears throat> And I think it is important to recognize that because the House managers keep talking about the need for witnesses, you can't have a trial without witnesses. You've seen a lot of witnesses. There were 17 witnesses who were deposed uh, and testified in public, uh, 12 in public, 17 who were in closed hearings below. So far, you have seen in these presentations 192 video clips from 13 different witnesses. So testimony was shown here to you, just as you would in a trial in an ordinary court sometimes play the video of a deposition instead of having the witness take the stand. You've seen video clips from 13 different witnesses. The House managers have dramatically wheeled into the Senate a record, I think it was reported as being 29,000 pages. I, our, I think the more official number is 28,578 pages. So you've got over 28,000 pages of documents submitted into the record provisionally in evidence in this trial, subject later to potential objections for hearsay and other evidentiary objections. Um, you've also heard here uh, the arguments that have been presented, along with the presentation of both the documentary and testimonial evidence by video clip and by slides that were put up. You've heard argument for up to 24 hours from each side. We didn't take all of our time, but the House managers argued for over 21 hours, putting on with their video clips and their excerpts from documents in the record, their case. So at this point, there has been a lot put on here in terms of a trial. You've seen the witnesses in the clips, all of the most relevant parts. You've seen the documents put up in excerpts on the screens. And as a result of this, the House managers have consistently said over and over again, before they came here, they said they had an overwhelming case. It was already buttoned down. They didn't need anything else. They said when they got here that it was proven. Every single allegation, every line in each article of impeachment, they said, proven, proven, proven. We don't think that that's true, but that's their words. That's what they're telling you, that they've had sufficient evidence to make their case. They said um, proven, sufficient, uncontested, and overwhelming at least 68 times in the proceedings on the floor here. Manager Nadler told us just today that it, they think they've not only proved it beyond a reasonable doubt, but beyond any doubt because of the evidence that they've already put on in front of you. We don't think that's true. We think we've demonstrated it's not. But the point is that the, the House managers have already put on a substantial amount of testimony from witnesses through their clips of prior deposition or hearing testimony. They've already presented to you a large portion of the most relevant documents from those 28,000. You've heard from the witnesses. You've seen where their testimony conflicts. You can see which is the better, more persuasive version of, of the facts. You've been able to see what it is that they have in the record that they say was overwhelming, already ready to go to trial. And this, this proceeding, therefore, has already had a lot of the earmarks of a trial. So don't be, don't be taken in by the idea that we can't have a trial here, you can't have a valid proceeding unless they bring someone in here to testify live. Because it wouldn't be just one person. If we start to go down that route, it's not presenting the case that was prepared in the hearings below. It's opening up discovery for an entirely new case. And there'd have to be depositions and witnesses on both sides. And there's no need to do that if they really believe what they're telling you, that it's already overwhelming. It's already proven. 
There's no need to go on to anything else when you've already seen so much, and the House managers had their case, chance to prepare their case. And again, I would also just make the point to bear in mind, what is the precedent set? What would the precedent be set if this chamber has to become the investigatory body for impeachments that were not prepared properly in the House? Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from Arizona. I submit a question to the desk for the President's counsel on behalf of myself, Senators Manchin, Senators Murkowski, and Senator Collins. Thank you. Question from Senator Sinema and the other senators for counsel, counsel for the President. The Logan Act prohibits any U.S. citizen without the authority of the United States from communicating with any foreign government with the intent to influence that government's conduct in relation to any controversy with the United States. Will the President assure the American public that private citizens will not be directed to conduct American foreign policy or national security policy un unless they have been specifically and formally designated by the President and the State Department to do so. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for the question. Um, let me preface it, let me answer in several parts. The first is, I just want to make clear that there was no conduct of foreign policy being carried on here by a private person. Uh, the testimony was clear from Ambassador Volcker, and I, I assume that the reference would be to Mr. Giuliani, the pre President's private counsel. Uh, Ambassador Volcker was clear that um, he understood Mr. Giuliani just to be a source of information for the President and someone who knew about Ukraine and someone who spoke to the President. And in fact, it was um, the testimony that it was the Ukrainians, Andrei Yermak, who asked to be connected to Mr. Giuliani simply because he was someone who could provide information to the President. Um, and Ambassador Volker testified that it was not his understanding, he did not believe that uh, Mr. Giuliani was carrying out sort of policy directives of the president, but rather indicating his views of what he thought would be something useful for the Ukrainians to convince the president of their anti-corruption uh, bona fides. So just wanted to make that point. It is, of course, the president's policy is always to abide by the law, by the laws. Um, I, I am, I'm not in a position to make pledges for the president here, but the president's policy is always to abide by the laws and would continue uh, to do so. I think it is worth pointing out that many presidents, starting with um, President Washington, have relied on uh, persons who are their trusted confidants, uh, but who are not actually employees of the government to assist in the conduct of foreign diplomacy. Um, President Washington relied on Governor Morris um, to uh, carry messages in certain circumstances, I believe, to the French. Uh, FDR had his confidant who he relied on in certain circumstances to be a go-between with foreign powers. And there are a list of others. Um, they were mentioned in some of the testimony during the House proceedings. So I, I don't think that there is anything, again, as I said, it was not here, but there would not be anything improper for a president in some circumstances to rely on a personal confidant to be able to convey messages or receive messages back and forth from a foreign government that would relate to uh, the president's conduct of foreign affairs. That's not prohibited, but within his authority under the Constitution, under Article II. Thank you. 
Thank you, Council. Senator from Illinois. Sorry. Your Honor. Oh. Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, on behalf of myself and Senator, Senator Ernst, I send a question to the desk for Mr. Nadler and Mr. Philbin. The question from Senator Kennedy and Senator Ernst uh, for both parties, the House managers will be first. If a president asks for an investigation of possible corruption by a political rival under circumstances that objectively are in the national interest, should the president be impeached if a majority of the House believes the president did it for the wrong reason? The President, of course, is entitled to conduct our foreign policy, is entitled to look into corruption in the United States or elsewhere, is entitled to use the Department of State or any other department for that purpose. He is not entitled to target an American citizen specifically, nor did he do so innocently here. It was only after Mr. Biden became an announced candidate for President that he suddenly decided Ukraine ought to look into the Bidens. And he made it very clear that was, he made it very clear that he wasn't interested in an investigation. He was interested in an announcement of an investigation just so the Bidens could be smeared. So it's probably never uh, suitable for a president to order an investigation of an American citizen. If he thinks there's general corruption, and there's an investigation ongoing. The Justice Department can certainly ask a foreign government for assistance in that investigation. But that wasn't done here. The President specifically targeted an individual with an obvious political motive. And I would simply say that that is so clear that uh, there's no question that it was a political motive against specific individuals. There are about 1.8 million companies in Ukraine. The estimates were that half of them were corrupt. The president chose one, the one with Mr. Biden. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for, thank you for the question. I, I, I think the short answer is no, the president should not be impeached. And I think the, the focus of the question is getting at to a situation of mixed motives, which has come up a couple times here. If the president is chief law enforcement officer, head of the executive branch, um, is in a situation where there is a legitimate investigation to be pursued, and he indicates that it should be pursued, is it possible that he should be impeached for that if there's some dispute about his motives where there is a legitimate basis for that conduct? And the answer is no. And the House managers themselves and the way they frame their case have recognized this. In the House Judiciary Committee report, they repeatedly say that the standard they're going to have to meet, they're going to have to show that these are sham investigations. These are baseless investigations that they're alleging that the President wanted to initiate. And that they had no legitimate, there was not any legitimate basis for pursuing the investigation. I'm pretty sure that's page five of the House Judiciary Committee report. And they, they use that standard, and they've talked about there not being a scintilla of evidence about anything that anyone could reasonably want to ask about related to the Bidens and Burisma, because they know that they can't get into a mixed motive scenario. Because if you have a legitimate basis for asking a question about something, if there is a legitimate national interest there, it's totally unacceptable to start getting into the field of saying, well, we're going to impeach the president and remove him from office 
by putting him on the psychiatrist's couch and trying to get inside his head to find out, was it 48% this motive and 52 the other, or did he have some other rationale? No, if it's a legitimate inquiry in the national interest, that's the end of it. And you can't be saying that we're going to impeach the president, remove him from office, decapitate the executive branch of the government, disrupt the functioning of the government of the country in an election year by trying to parse out subjective motives and which percentage of the motive was this good motive or some other motive, something like that. If it's a legitimate inquiry in the national interest, if the, that it, possibility is there, if the national interest is there, that's the end of it. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Uh, I haven't specified this before, but I think it would be best if senators directed their questions to one of the parties or both and leave it up to them to uh, figure out who they want to go up to bat uh, rather than particular uh, councils. The senator from Illinois. The question from Senator Durbin to the House managers. Would you please respond to the answer that was given by President Council's to President's Council to Senator Sinema's question? Uh, Senator, uh, Chief Justice, um, in answer to that question, we heard a rather breathtaking admission by the President's lawyer. Uh, and it was said in an un understated way, and so you might have missed it. But what the President's counsel said was that no foreign policy was being conducted by a private party here. That is, Rudy Giuliani was not conducting U.S. foreign policy. Rudy Giuliani was not conducting policy. That is a remarkable admission because to the degree that they have attempted to suggest or claim or um, insinuate that this is a policy difference, that a concern over burden sharing or something corruption was a policy issue. They have now acknowledged that the person in charge of this was not conducting policy. That is a startling admission. So the investigations that Giuliani was charged with trying to get Ukraine to announce into Joe Biden into this Russian propaganda theory they have just admitted were not part of policy. They were not policy conducted by Mr. Giuliani. So what were they? They were, in the words of Dr. Hill, a domestic political errand not to be confused with policy. They have just undermined their entire argument, even as to mixed motives, because the man in charge of it was undergoing this Domestic era. Now, you heard a suggestion there. He was only doing this, Giuliani was only doing this because he was being asked by Andre Yermak. That is laughable. Giuliani tried to get the meeting with Zelensky, remember? And he couldn't get in the door, and then he announced that there are enemies around President Zelensky. And then they go into that phone call on July 25th, and Ukrainians try to persuade the president, you don't have enemies in Ukraine, we're only friends. And what's the president's response? I want you to talk to Rudy. That's not policy being conducted there. That's a personal political errand. They just undermined their entire argument. Now, the president's counsel also essentially argues in terms of witnesses, if their case is as strong as Mr. Schiff and Mr. Nadler and others say, then why do they need witnesses? Uh, you know, you can imagine the scene in any courtroom in America where before the trial begins, Defense counsel for the defendant stands up and says, Your Honor, if the prosecution case is so strong, let them prove it without witnesses. That's essentially what's being argued here. Well, I will make an offer to opposing counsel who have said that this will stretch on indefinitely if you decide to have a single witness. Let's cabin the depositions to one week. In the Clinton trial, there was one week of depositions. And you know what the Senate did during that week? They did the business of the Senate. The Senate went back to its ordinary legislative business. 
while the depositions were being conducted. You want the Clinton model? Let's use the Clinton model. Let's take a week. Let's take a week to have a fair trial. You can continue your business. We can get the business of the country done. Is that too much to ask in the name of fairness? That we follow the Clinton model? That we take one week? I mean, are we really driven by the timing of the State of the Union? Should that be our guiding principle? Can't we take one week to hear from these witnesses? I think we can. I think we should. I think we must. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Alaska. Mr. Chief Justice, I send to the desk a question submitted on behalf of myself and Senator Schatz directed to both the White House counsel and the House managers. Thank you. The question from Senators Murkowski and Schatz directed to both parties. Would you agree that almost any action a president takes, or indeed any action the vast majority of politicians take, is to one degree or another inherently political? Where is the line between permissible political actions and impeachable political actions? This council will go first. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for that question, and I think that hits, the question really hits the nail on the head. As I mentioned the other day, in a representative democracy, elected officials almost always have at least one eye looking on to the next election and how their actions, their policy decisions, their actions in office will be received by the electorate. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. It's part of the way representative democracy works. So having part of your motives being looking towards the next election, looking towards how that will affect electoral chances, that's part of the nature of elected office. And to start getting into motives about um, will this affect my prospects in the next election and calling that corrupt, and if you've got that as part of your motive, looking into whether you were doing something for electoral advantage and saying, that's going to be a corrupt motive, we'll say that you can be charged for wrongdoing with that or impeached, is very dangerous because there's almost no way to get inside someone's head and parcel out which percentage was one motive, which percentage was another motive. If you start down that path, it's totally amorphous. And this is part of the, the point that Professor Dershowitz was making and that we've made here a couple of times. This idea of impeaching a president on a theory of abuse of power that depends entirely on analyzing subjective motive. Because that's what the House managers have suggested, that we're assuming there is an act on its face that is legitimate, that is within the president's authority. It's not on its face in any way unlawful or unconstitutional, but solely based on motive, we're going to impeach him. And by saying that, well, if it was really directed at the next election, that's the corrupt motive. That's a very dangerous path because there is always some eye to the next election. And it ends up becoming a standard so malleable that it really is a substitute for a policy difference. If we don't like your policy, we attribute you bad motive. And that's actually something that Justice Iredell warned about in the North Carolina ratifying convention. That if you base something just on motive because of what he called malignity of party, the other party will always attribute bad motives. Thank you. Uh, I think the answer is yes, that public officials are inherently political animals. And I don't mean that in a derogatory term. They run for office, they hold office, they conduct acts as political figures. But if we look at what Hamilton had to say about the core of offenses that warrant the impeachment power, he talked about the crimes being political in character 
and the remedies being political in character, because we're not talking about imprisonment here. We're not talking about taking away someone's liberty. So we're talking about a political punishment for a political crime. Now, what's a political crime? Yes, everyone in office has a political motivation. But certainly that doesn't mean that we can't draw a line between corrupt activity that is undertaken, yes, for a political reason, and non-corrupt activity. Indeed, we have to draw that line. Uh, let, let's, sh let's show what uh, Professor Dershowitz had to say about where we should draw the line. And if a president does something which he believes will help him get elected in the public interest, that cannot be the kind of quid pro quo that results in impeachment. The fact that he's announced his candidacy is a very good reason for upping the interest in his son. If he wasn't running for president, he's a has-been. He's the former vice president of the United States. Okay, big deal. But if he's running for president, that's an enormous big deal. So it is certainly true that when public officials take actions, they may have in mind when they make a policy judgment, what's the impact on my political career going to be, or what's the impact going to be on my reelection prospects? But that's a very different question than whether they can engage in a corrupt act to help their election, in this case, to get foreign help to cheat in an election. I think we can distinguish between the fact that political actors have political interests with what the president's defense would argue, and that is if he believes it's in his reelection interest, then no quid pro quo is too corrupt. If we go down that road, there is no limit to what this or any other president can do. Uh, there is no limit to what foreign powers will feel they can offer a corrupt president to help their reelection if that is the precedent we intend to establish. You count. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manager. Senator from New Jersey. Thank you. Question for the House managers from Senator Menendez. The President was seeking investigations from a foreign power based partly on what Fiona Hill called, quote, a fictional narrative perpetrated and propagated by the Russian security services, end quote. The U.S. intelligence community has warned that the Russian government is already preparing to attack our election in 2020, and the President has said publicly he would welcome foreign interference in our elections. Why should Americans be concerned about foreign interference, and why does it matter that the President continues to solicit foreign interference in our elections? Mr. Chief Justice, uh, Senator, thank you for the question. Let's outline the facts that we do know about today. None of the 17 witnesses who testified as part of the House's impeachment inquiry were aware of any factual basis to support the allegations that it was Ukraine and not Russia that interfered in the 2016 election. FBI Director Christopher Wray, who was nominated by President Trump and confirmed by this body, stated as recently as this past December that we have no reason to believe that Ukraine interfered in the 2016 U.S. election. He stated, quote, we have no information that indicates that Ukraine interfered with the 2016 presidential election. President Trump's own Homeland Security Advisor, Tom Bossert, said about this allegation, quote, it's not only a conspiracy theory, it is completely debunked, end quote. He added, quote, let me re just repeat here again, it has no validity, end quote. And of course, Ms. Hill, as the question indicated, said, the fic said, quote, fictional narrative that is being perpetrated and propagated by the Russian security services themselves. 
The U.S. intelligence community has unanimously determined that there's no validity to this, our own intelligence and law enforcement. Special Counsel Mueller found that Russia's interference was, quote, sweeping and systematic. But don't take our own law enforcement and intelligence community's word for it. Let's hear what Vladimir Putin himself said recently about this. In November of 2019, Mr. Putin was overheard saying, quote, thank God no one is accusing us of, of interfering in the U.S. elections anymore. Now they're accusing Ukraine, end quote. And let me end with that one. Because that one demonstrates to me why this matters. That one demonstrates to me why anyone in the United States should matter. Vladimir Putin could care less about delivering health care for the people of Russia, for building infrastructure in Russia. Vladimir Putin, as many people in this chamber know well, because I've worked with some of you on this, wakes up every morning and goes to bed every night trying to figure out how to destroy American democracy. And he has organized the infrastructure of his government around that effort. This is a battle over resolve. It's the battle over the hearts and minds of our people. It's the battle over information and disinformation. And if the message from the very top of our government, from the very top of our leaders, if uh, the message from, from some folks over the last couple of weeks is that facts don't matter, that our law enforcement doesn't matter, that our intelligence community's unanimous consensus doesn't matter, that is dangerous. That is what Vladimir Putin and Russia are looking for. And that makes us less safe. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Senator Chief from Wisconsin. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Hawley, Cruz, Kramer, Braun, Purdue, Barrasso, Rubio, Risch, Sullivan, Ernst, Scott of Florida, Danes, and Fisher for, the House, for both the House managers with response from the Council of the President. Thank you. The question from Senator Johnson and the other senators for both parties. Recent reporting described two NSC staff holdovers from the Obama administration attending an all-hands meeting of NSC staff held about two weeks into the Trump administration and talking loudly enough to be overheard saying we need to do everything we can to take out the president. On July 26, 2019, the House Intelligence Committee hired one of those individuals, Sean Misko. The report further describes relationships between Misko, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, and an individual alleged as the whistleblower. Why did your committee hire Sean Misko the day after the phone call between President Trump and Zelensky, and what role has he played throughout your committee's investigation? The House will begin. First of all, there have been a lot of attacks uh, on my staff. And as I said when this issue came up earlier, uh, I'm appalled at some of the smearing of the professional people that work for the Intelligence Committee. Uh, now this question refers to allegations in a newspaper article which are circulating smears on my staff and asked me to respond to those smears. And I will not dignify those smears on my staff by giving them any credence whatsoever, uh, nor will I share any information that I believe could or could not lead to the identification of the whistleblower. Um, I want to be very clear about something. Members of this body used to care about the protection of whistleblower identities. They didn't used to gratuitously attack members 
of committee staff. But now they do. Now they do. Now they'll take an unsubstantiated repress article and use it to smear my staff. I think that's disgraceful. I think it's disgraceful. You know, whistleblowers are a unique um, and vital resource for the intelligence community. And why? Because unlike other whistleblowers who can go public with their information, whistleblowers in the intelligence community cannot because it deals with classified information. They must come to a committee. They must talk to the staff of that committee or to the inspector general. That is what they're supposed to do. Our system relies upon it. And when you jeopardize a whistleblower by trying to out them this way, then you are threatening not just this whistleblower, but the entire system. Now, the president would like that nothing better than that. And I'm sure the president is applauding this question because he wants his pound of flesh. And he wants to punish anyone that, that has the courage to stand up to him. Well, I can't tell you who the whistleblower is because I don't know, but I can tell you who the whistleblower should be. It should be every one of us. Every one of us should be willing to blow the whistle on presidential misconduct. If it weren't for this whistleblower, we wouldn't know about this conduct, misconduct. And that might be just as well for this president, but it would not be good for this country. And I worry that future people that see wrongdoing are going to watch how this person has been treated, the threats against this person's life, and they're going to say, why stick my neck out? Is my name going to be dragged through the mud? Will people join our staff if they know that their names are going to be dragged through the mud? Thank you, Mr. Manager. Senate. There's two responses that I'd, I'd like to get to. One, with regard to the issue of witnesses, in this case, the whistleblower. Mr. Schiff put the whistleblower issue front and center with his own words during the course of their investigation. He talked about the whistleblower testifying. Retribution is what is prohibited under the statute against a whistleblower. That's what, what sort of whistleblower statute protects, that there's no retribution. In other words, they're not going to be fired for blowing the whistle. But this idea that there's complete anonymity, and I'm not saying that we should disclose the individual's name, and you have you handled that in executive session or any way you'd want, but we can't just say it's not a relevant inquiry to know who on the staff that conducted the primary investigation here was in communication with that whistleblower, especially after Mr. Schiff denied that his, he or his staff initially had even had any conversations with the whistleblower. It goes back to the whole witness issue, and I, I want to go to that for just a 30 seconds here. It seems to me that the discussion for witnesses, I heard what Mr. Schiff said about the 30 uh, we'll do depositions in a week. Uh, Democratic leader said I could have any witnesses I want yesterday. I've got it in the transcript. And you couldn't get all the witnesses you'd want in a week. You couldn't get the discovery done in a week. But if, in fact, if, in fact, they believe that they've presented this overwhelming case that they have, all the, they talk about subterfuge and smoke screens. The smoke screen here is that they used 13 of their 17 witnesses to try to prove their case, and we were able to use those very witnesses to undercut that case. So I think we just have to keep that in perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. Oh, the senator from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I send a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. Question from the House for the House managers from Senator Murray. If there are no consequences to openly defying a valid congressional subpoena, how will Congress be able to perform its constitutional oversight responsibility to make sure any administration is following the law and acting in the best interests of American families?
Well, they could have very serious, devastating, dire consequences. If the Senate ignores President Trump's ongoing obstruction of Congress, it would lead to the end of congressional oversight as we know it today. President Trump's attorneys argue that our congressional subpoenas are constitutionally invalid until a court determines otherwise. Their argument is false, and it is an attack on congressional oversight powers. A vote against Article II is a vote to condone President Trump's corrupted view of America's constitutional balance. Voting against Article II will grant President Trump and every other president from now until forever the power to simply ignore all congressional subpoenas unless and until we seek to a court to enforce it. Under President Trump's view, even if all of you senators were to vote to favor to issue a subpoena for documents or witnesses, the administration could still ignore that until a cruel court ruled on it. I think Mr. Schiff addressed some of that earlier in another question. They could take us, you could go to court to enforce it, then it would get appealed, then go back to court. We could go on and on because, quite frankly, that's what their position is. So again, as, as Mr. Schiff said earlier, imagine yourselves having jurisdiction over an item that you care deeply about, and you needed information. You heard of some wrongdoing. You heard there was a whistleblower complaint on something, and you decided that you wanted to do a hearing. It's very possible that the president would just flatly refuse your subpoena, because if we ignore Article II, that would be the president to ignore all subpoenas. But we need you to issue a subpoena for, for us today, not only to get Mr. Bolton here, but Mr. Duffy, Mr. McBaney, and everyone else with relevant evidence on this case. Now, when the administration exerts executive privilege, there might be some privilege, one that is available to them on any of these documents. But those have to be asserted with every document it, as, as we send a subpoena. So don't buy the White House argument that our subpoenas are invalid because we don't have any authority to issue them. We know we do. You know we do. So let's make sure that this body will, will make sure that no future president will just simply defy, disrespect, and ignore subpoenas, because someday you may be in our shoes wanting to get information, wanting to get to the bottom line to ensure that no president is above the law. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Alaska. Mr. Chief Justice, I sent a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senators Risch, Blunt, Kennedy, and Johnson for the President's Council. Thank you. The question for Senator Sullivan and the other senators for counsel for the President. Given that the Senate is now considering the very evidentiary record assembled and voted on by the House, which Chairman Nadler has repeatedly claimed constitutes overwhelming evidence for impeachment, how can the Senate be accused of engaging in what Mr. Nadler described as a cover-up if the Senate makes its decision based on the exact same evidentiary record the House did? Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for that question, and uh, I think that's exactly right. I think it's rather preposterous to suggest that the, this Senate would be uh, engaging in a cover-up to rely on the same record that the House managers have said is overwhelming. They've said it dozens of times. They've said that 
in their view, they've had enough evidence presented already to establish their case beyond any doubt, not just beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's totally incoherent to claim at the same time that it would be improper for the Senate to rely on that record. Your judgment may be and should be, we submit, different from the House manager's assessment of that evidence because it hasn't established their case at all. But if they're willing to tell you that it's complete and it has everything they need, has everything they need to establish everything they want, I think you should be able to take them at their word that that's all that's there. And the switch now to say, well, no, we need more, we need more witnesses, I think just demonstrates that they haven't proved their case. They don't have the evidence to make their case. Um, and as I went through a minute ago, you know, they have already presented a record with over 28,000 pages of documents that's here. They've already presented video clips of 13 witnesses. You've heard all of the key evidence that they gathered. It was their process. They were the ones that said what the process was going to be, how it had to be run, who ought to testify, and when to close it, when to decide they had enough. And you've heard all of the key highlights from that. And that is sufficient for this body to make a decision. If in the time I have remaining, I just want to turn to one point in response to something that was said a couple of minutes ago. And we keep hearing repeatedly today the refrain of uh, the idea that President Trump was somehow trying to peddle Vladimir Putin's conspiracy theory that it was Ukraine and not Russia that interfered in the 2016 election. And the House Democrats try to present this binary view of the world, that only one country and one country alone could have done something to interfere in the election, and it was Russia. And if you mention any other country doing something related to election interference, you're just a pawn of Vladimir Putin trying to peddle his conspiracy theories. That is obviously not true. More than one country and foreign nationals from more than one country could be doing different things for different reasons in different ways to try to interfere in the election. And that's exactly what President Trump was interested in. In the telephone call, the July 25th transcript, he mentions CrowdStrike, he mentions the server, but he talks about, he says, there are a lot of things that went on, the whole situation. I think you're surrounding yourself with some of the same people. So he's talking about much more than just the DNC server. And he closes it again saying, uh, he refers to Robert Mueller's testimony. And he says, they say a lot of it started in Ukraine. There's just a lot of stuff going on. Twice in that exchange, he says, there's a, a lot of stuff, the whole situation. And what is that referring to? Surrounding yourself with the same people, President Zelensky refers immediately to changing out the ambassador. Because the previous ambassador, who had been there under Poroshenko, had written an op-ed criticizing President Trump during the election. We also know that there was a Politico article in January of 2017 cataloging multiple Ukrainian officials who did things either to criticize President Trump or to assist a DNC operative, Alexandra Chalupa, in gathering information against the Trump campaign. And they said there was no evidence in the record. No one said that there was anything done by Ukraine. That's not true. One of their star witnesses, Fiona Hill, specifically testified in her public hearing because she said she went back and checked because she hadn't remembered the political article. And then she said that she acknowledged that some Ukrainian officials, quote, bet on Hillary Clinton winning the election, end quote. And so it was quite evident, in her words, that they were trying to favor the Clinton campaign, including by trying to collect information on people working in the Trump campaign. That was Fiona Hill. She acknowledged that Ukrainian officials were doing that. So this idea that it's a binary world, it's either Russia or Ukraine. If you mention Ukraine, you're just doing Vladimir Putin's bidding, is totally false. And you shouldn't be fooled by that. The Ukrainians various Ukrainians were doing things to interfere in the election campaign, and that's what President Trump was referring to. Thank you, Counsel. Senator from Vermont. Mr. Chief Justice, I would uh, ask to send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senator Blumenthal for the House managers. 
Thank you, Senator. The question for the Senator, uh, for the House managers from Senator Leahy and Senator Blumenthal. The President's counsel claimed, quote, if a president does something which he believes will help him get elected in the public interest, that, can, that cannot be the kind of quid pro quo that results in impeachment, end quote. He added a hypothetical, quote, I think I'm the greatest president there ever was, and if I'm not elected, the national interest will suffer greatly. That cannot be an impeachable offense, end quote. Under this view, there is no remedy to prevent a president from conditioning foreign security assistance in violation of the Impoundment Control Act on the recipient's willingness to do the president a political favor. If the Senate fails to reject this theory, what would stop a president from withholding disaster aid funding from a U.S. city until that mayor endorses him? What would stop a president from withholding nearly any part of the $4.7 trillion annual federal budget subject to his personal political benefit. Mr. Chief Justice, distinguished members of the Senate, I thank uh, the senators for that very important question. Certainly, uh, what we have alleged in this case is that the president solicited a personal political benefit in exchange for an official act, solicited dirt on a political opponent in exchange for the release of $391 million in military aid, solicited dirt in exchange for a White House meeting. And if this Senate were to say that's acceptable, then precisely as was outlined in that question could take place all across America in the context of the next election and any election. Grants allocated to cities or towns or municipalities across the country. But the president could say, you're not going to get that money, Mr. Mayor, Mrs. County Executive, Mrs. Town Supervisor, unless you endorse me for re-election. The President could say that to any governor of our 50 states. That's unacceptable. That cannot be allowed to happen in our democratic republic. Now, by my count, as of this afternoon, the framers of the Constitution and the founders of our great republic had been quoted either directly or mentioned by name 123 times. Alexander Hamilton, 48 times. James Madison, 35 times. George Washington, 24 times. John Adams, eight times. Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin pulling up the rear, four times. Seems to me that Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson need a little bit more love. And so let me try to do my part. Thomas Jefferson once observed that tyranny is defined as that which is legal for the government, but illegal for the citizenry. Legal for the government, but illegal for the citizenry. That's what we confront right now. President Trump corruptly abused his power he targeted an American citizen, pressured a foreign government to try to cheat in the upcoming election. And the President's counsel would have you believe that is okay because he's the President of the United States. But our fellow citizens cannot cheat the Workers' Compensation Board by claiming a fake injury and escape accountability. Our fellow citizens cannot cheat the stock market by engaging in insider trading and then escape accountability. 
Our fellow citizens cannot cheat the college admissions process in order to get their child into an elite university and then escape accountability. Why should the President of the United States be allowed to cheat in the upcoming election and escape accountability? Tyranny is defined as that which is legal for the government and illegal for the citizenry. President's counsel has suggested that President Trump can do anything, anything that he wants, and escape accountability. President Trump can solicit foreign interference in the upcoming election and escape accountability. He can cheat and escape accountability. He can engage in a cover-up and escape accountability. He can corruptly abuse his power, escape accountability, elevate his personal political interests, subordinate America's national security interests, and escape accountability. That's the Fifth Avenue standard of presidential accountability. I can do anything I want. I can shoot someone on Fifth Avenue, and it doesn't matter. No, lawlessness matters. Abuse of power matters. Corruption matters. The Constitution matters. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Justice. The Senator from Louisiana. I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senator Risch, to both the House Manager and the White House Counsel. And although I cannot pick, ideally it would be Manager Lofgren. Question from Senators Cassidy and Risch for both parties is as follows. In the Clinton proceedings, we saw a video of Manager Lofgren saying, quote, this is unfair to the American people. By these actions, you would undo the free election that expressed the will of the American people in 1996. In so doing, you will damage the faith the American people have in this institution and in the American democracy. You will set the dangerous precedent that the certainty of presidential terms, which has so benefited our wonderful America, will be replaced by the partisan use of impeachment. Future presidents will face election, then litigation, then impeachment. The power of the president will dim diminish in the face of the Congress a phenomenon much feared by the Founding Fathers." End quote. What is different now if the response is that the country cannot risk the President interfering in the next election? Isn't impeachment the ultimate interference? How does this not cheat those who did and or would vote for President Trump from their participation in the democratic process? I ask Manager Lofgren to address this question directly and to not avoid, as Manager Jeffers did, with a related question last night. President's counsel answers first. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate. Well, as I've said before, I, I agree 100 percent with Manager Lofgren's comments from the past, and I think they should guide the Senate. Uh, there's really no better way to say it. What they're doing here, they keep falsely accusing the President of wanting to cheat when they're coming here and telling you, take him off the ballot in a political impeachment. Talk about cheating. You don't even want to face him. And let me say one more thing while I'm up here. I listened to Manager Schiff come up here and say he won't even dignify a legitimate question with, about his staff with a response because he won't stand here and listen to people on his staff be besmirched. Who will join his staff? Since the beginning of this Congress, 
Manager Schiff, the other House managers, and others in the House have falsely accused the President, and they've come here and done it, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, the Chief of Staff, lawyers on my staff, false accusations, calumny after calumny in dulcet tones. And that is wrong. And when you turn that around and say he will not respond to a legitimate question that I asked, it's a legitimate question. Who communicated with the whistleblower? Why were you demanding something that you already knew about? I asked him in my, another part of my October 8th letter that doesn't get a lot of attention from Mr. Schiff. I said, you have the full ability to release these documents on your own. No response. So I think, I think you deserve an answer to that question. And I think it's time in this country that we start, start or that we stop assuming that everybody has horrible motives in the puritanical rage of just everybody's doing something wrong except for you. You cannot be questioned. That's part of the problem here. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. You know, I um, was a member of the House Judiciary Committee during the Clinton impeachment. And I was a member of the staff of a member of the Judiciary Committee during the Nixon impeachment. And during the Clinton impeachment, I found myself comparing what we were doing in Clinton to what we were doing or had done with Nixon. And here's what I saw and I still see today. A special prosecutor started with Whitewater, spent several years until they found DNA on a blue dress. And they had a lie. The president lied about a sexual affair under oath, and that was wrong, and it was a crime, but it was not a misuse of presidential power. Any husband caught would have lied about it. It was wrong, but it was not a misuse of presidential power. And so throughout the Clinton matters. I kept raising the issue that it was a misuse, and it turned out to be a partisan misuse, of impeachment to equate a lie about a sexual affair to a high crime and misdemeanor. As Mr. Markey said, they rubbed out the word high and made it any crime and misdemeanor. That was what was wrong in the Clinton impeachment. Compared to the Nixon impeachment, where Richard Nixon engaged in a broad scope upending the constitutional order, corrupting the government for his own personal benefit in the election. I would add, unfortunately, and I never thought I would be in a third impeachment, unfortunately, that is what we see in this case with President Trump. Ms. Manager. The Senator from West Virginia. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senator Gillibrand and Senator Schatz, to the President's Council and the House uh, managers. Thank you. Question from Senators Manchin, Gillibrand, and Schatz uh, for both parties. Have you ever been involved in any trial, civil, criminal, or other, in which you were unable to call witnesses or submit relevant evidence? Uh, I believe the House is first. The House is first.
Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and thank you uh, to the Senator for the question. I want us to imagine for just a moment if someone broke into your house, stole your property, police caught them, they returned the property. Now, the fact that they returned the property changes nothing. They would still be held accountable. But imagine if they had the power to obstruct every witness, prevent witnesses from appearing. Imagine if they had the power to destroy or obstruct any evidence in the case against them from being presented to the court. I've had the opportunity to appear uh, in a lot of hearings and be a part of building a lot of cases. And we all know, I know everybody here knows that witness testimony and evidence or documentation in a case is everything. It is the life and breath of any case. It is the prosecutor's dream or the police officers or detectives dream to have information and evidence. It, it, it truly baffles me, really, uh, as a 27-year law enforcement officer that we would not accept or welcome or be delighted about the opportunity to hear from direct witnesses, people who have first-hand knowledge. We know that the president cannot be charged with a crime. We know that the Department of Justice has already ruled on that. But the remedy for that is impeachment. That is the tool that, as we know, has solely been given, that power solely to the House of Representatives, solely tried before, before the Senate. So to answer your question, it is extremely, well, let me say it this way, only in a case where there are no available witnesses or no available evidence have I ever seen that occur. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Manager. Counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate. I would respond to that question in this way, and thank you for the question. The House managers controlled the process in the House. I think we can all agree to that. They were in charge, and they ran it. And they chose not to allow the President's counsel to have any witnesses, and they chose not to call the witnesses that they're now asking you to call, demanding you to call, accusing you of cover-up if you don't call. I've never been in any proceeding, trial or otherwise, where you show up on the first day and the judge says, let's go, and you say, well, I'm not ready yet. Let's stop everything. Let's take a bunch of depositions. Well, did you subpoena the witnesses you're now seeking? Well, some, but not others. Well, when you did subpoena them, did you try to enforce that subpoena in court? No. Uh, the other witnesses that you did subpoena, did they go to court? Yes. What did you do? I withdrew the subpoena and mooted out the case. And now I want them. I want them. Otherwise, you're doing the cover-up. Let me make another point, because they keep making this point. What will we do? The President's not producing documents. I'd like to refresh your recollection about the Mueller investigation. Okay? The Mueller investigation had 2,800 subpoenas, 500 search warrants, 500 witnesses, the President's counsel, the Chief of Staff, many, many others from the administration testified. Documents, voluminous documents were produced. And what happened? Bob Mueller came back with a conclusion. He announced it. There was no collusion. What did the House do? They didn't like it. Didn't like the outcome. So what did they do? They wanted a do-over. They wanted to do it all again themselves, despite the $34 million or more that were spent. So I don't think anybody really believes that the Trump administration hasn't fully cooperated with investigations. The problem is, when they don't like the outcome, they just keep investigating. They keep wasting the public's money, because they don't really care about truth. They care about a political outcome. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. The senator from Utah. I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Hawley, Ernst, and Braun. Thank you.
The question for counsel for the president from Senator Lee and the other senators. Under the standard embraced by the House managers, would President Obama have been subject to impeachment charges based on his handling of the Benghazi attack, the Bergdahl swap, or DACA? Would President Bush have been subject to impeachment charges based on his handling of NSA surveillance, detention of combatants, or use of waterboarding? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate. Under the standard, which is no standard, that they bring their impeachment to the Senate, any president would be subject to impeachment for anything. Presidents would be subject to impeachment for exercising longstanding constitutional rights, even when the House didn't, chose not to enforce their subpoenas. Under their vague theory of abuse of power, I guess any president as, as Professor Dershowitz, he had a long list of presidents who might have been subject to impeachment. So I'm not going to go through this particular incidents because I don't want to besmirch past presidents. I don't think the standard that they announce is helpful. I think it's very dangerous. I mean, you might want to get a lock on that door because they're going to be back a lot if that's the standard. Okay? And the truth of the matter is, is you don't have to look at anything they're talking about witnesses. You don't have to look at anything except the articles of impeachment. I try to seek areas of agreement. I think we all agree that they don't allege a crime. That's why they spend all their time saying you don't need one. I remember one of the clips I showed where, they, where, where someone was saying with a lot of passion, they're trying to cross out high crime and make it any crime. Now they're trying to cross out crime, any crime. No crime is necessary. Okay? That's not what impeachment is about. This is dangerous, and it's more dangerous because it's in an election year. So yes, under the standardless, imp standardless impeachment, any president could be impeached for anything, and that's wrong. And they should be held, by the way, they should be held to their articles of impeachment. A lot of what they're trying to sell here, their own House colleagues weren't buying. They didn't make it into the articles of impeachment. Read the articles of impeachment. They don't allege a crime. They don't allege a violation of law. You don't need anything else except their articles of impeachment, your Constitution, and your common sense. And you can end this. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The senator from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senator Cortez Masto, and Senator Rosen. Question for the House managers from Senators Stabenow, Cortez Masto, and Rosen to both, both parties. In June 2019, Ellen Weintraub, then chair of the Federal Election Commission, wrote in a statement that, quote, it is illegal for any person to solicit, accept, or receive anything of value from a foreign national in connection with the U.S. election. This is not a novel concept. Electoral intervention from foreign governments has been considered unacceptable since the beginnings of our nation." End quote. In a 2007 advisory opinion, the FEC found that campaign contributions from foreign nationals are prohibited in federal elections, even if, quote, the value of these materials may be nominal or difficult to ascertain, end quote. How valuable would a public announcement of an investigation into the Bidens be for President Trump's re-election campaign? We begin with the White House counsel. Mr. Chief Justice and Senators, thank you for the question. Um, 
the idea that these investigations were a thing of value is something that was specifically examined by the Department of Justice. As I explained the other day, the Inspector General for the Intelligence Community wrote a cover letter on the whistleblower complaint, which he had actually exaggerated in the complaint, the idea that there was a demand for some assistance uh, with the President's reelection campaign. That was forwarded to the Department of Justice. They examined it and they announced back in September that there was no election law violation because they did not qualify as a thing of value. Um, and I think that that issue has been thoroughly examined by the Department of Justice here. And I, I just want to clarify one thing. The other day there was, um, yesterday there was a question about information coming from overseas. And I was asked a question uh, about that. And I, I want to be very precise that I understood a question to be about, was there a violation of a campaign finance law? Would there be one if someone simply got information from overseas? And the answer is no, as a matter of law. And think about this. If pure information, if information that came to someone in a campaign could be called a thing of value, if it comes from overseas, a thing of value is a prohibited campaign contribution. It's not allowed. If it comes from within the country, it has to be reported. So that would mean that any time a campaign got information from within the country about an opponent or about something else that maybe would be useful in the campaign, they'd have to report the receipt of information as a thing of value under the campaign finance laws. That's not how the laws work. And there would be tremendous First Amendment implications if someone attempted to enforce the laws that way. So that's simply the point that I wanted to make. If your information that is credible information is not something that is prohibited from being received under the campaign finance laws. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, yes, Mr. Manager. How valuable would it be for the president to get Ukraine to announce these investigations? And the answer is immensely valuable. Uh, and if it wasn't going to be immensely valuable, why would the president go to such lengths to make it happen? Why would he be willing to violate the law, the Empowerment Control Act? Why would he be willing to ignore the advice of all of his national security professionals? Why would he be willing to withhold hundreds of millions of dollars from an ally at war if he didn't think it was going to really benefit his campaign? You have only to look at the president's actions to determine just how valuable he believed it would be to him. Now, how would he make use of this? Well, if we look in the past, we get a perfect illustration of how Donald Trump would have made use of this political help from Ukraine. Let's look at 2016, when the Russians hacked the DCCC and the DNC, and they started dripping out these documents through WikiLeaks and other Russian platforms. What did the president do? Did he make use of it? Did he condemn it? Oh, he made beautiful use of it. Over 100 times in the last three months of the campaign, the president brought up time after time after time, rally after rally after rally, the Clinton Russian stolen documents. Now, we've had a debate since then. What was the impact of the Russian interference in 2016? In an election that close, was it decisive? No one will ever know. Was it valuable? You only have to look at Donald Trump's actions to know just how valuable he thought it was. He thought it was immensely valuable. And you can darn well expect that if he'd gotten his help from Ukraine, he'd be out there every day talking about how Ukraine was investigating Joe Biden. And Ukraine is conducting an investigation into Joe Biden. It would be proof of his argument against his feared opponent. You're darn right it would be valuable. What's more, it's illegal. And do we have to go through all the turmoil of the Russian interference for have, to have the president do it all over again? One of the things that I found so significant, it was the day after Bob Mueller reached his conclusion that this president was back on the phone asking yet another country to help cheat in another election. You're darn right that would have been valuable. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from South Carolina. I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senators Cruz and Cornyn, for both parties. 
Thank you. The question from Senators Graham, Cornyn, and Cruz is for both parties. When DOJ Inspector General Horowitz testified before the Judiciary Committee, he said their DOJ had a, quote, low threshold, end quote, to investigate the Trump campaign. At the hearing, Senator Feinstein said, quote, your report concluded that the FBI had an adequate predicate reason to open the investigation on the Trump campaign ties to Russia. Could you define the predicate? Horowitz replied, quote, yeah, so the predicate here was the information that the FBI got at the end of July from the friendly foreign government, end quote. Why is the legal standard for investigating Trump so much lower than the standard for investigating Biden? And why was it okay to get the information from a, quote, friendly foreign government, end quote. Uh, the House managers are first. The Inspector General's report found that the investigation was properly predicated. Uh, that was the bottom line conclusion that this was not a politically motivated uh, investigation. The Inspector General also found, though, there were serious flaws with the FISA court process. Uh, there were serious flaws in how the FISA applications were written, in the information that was used, and prescribed a whole series of remedies. Uh, which the FBI director has now said should be implemented. But they found it was properly predicated. They found they did not have to ignore the evidence that had come to their attention that the campaign for the president was having illicit contacts, potentially, that it may be colluding or conspiring with a foreign power. Indeed, it would have been derelict for them to ignore it. But the argument, the implicit argument here is because there were problems, albeit serious problems, in the FISA court application involving a single person that somehow we should ignore the president's conduct here. That somehow that justifies the president's embrace of the Russian propaganda. That somehow that justifies the president's distrust of the entire intelligence community. That somehow that justifies his ignoring what his own director of the FBI said, which his lawyers ignore today which is there is no evidence that Ukraine interfered in the 2016 election. Because of a single FISA application against a single person and the flaws in it, you should ignore the evidence of the president's wrongdoing. Turn away from that. Let's not look at whether the president conditioned military aid and a White House meeting on help with an investigation. Let's look at flaws in how the FBI conducted a FISA application. The one does not follow from the other. Uh, the reality is that what you must judge here is, did the president commit the conduct he is charged with? Did the president withhold military aid and a coveted meeting to secure foreign interference in the election? And if he did, as we believe we have shown, does that warrant his removal from office? That is the issue before you, whether the FBI made one mistake or five mistakes with the FISA application. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, let me an actually answer the question. The Inspector General said, in a response actually from Senator Graham, when James Comey said he was vindicated by the Inspector General's report, the Inspector General said, no one who touched this was vindicated. With regard to the FISA, you, you, you make so light, Manager Schiff, of what the FBI did. It wasn't a FISA warrant. There was an order unsealed just days ago saying that the process was so tainted 
by the Federal Bureau of Investigation so tainted that not only was the NSD misled, but so was the FISA court. You, you, for those that don't know that are watching, the FISA court, you can't blame the court on this, by the way. You have to blame the Federal Bureau of Investigation for allowing this to happen. That is the court that issues warrants on people that are alleged to be spies. There's no lawyers in those proceedings. There is no cross-examination. The court itself in its order said, we rely on the good faith of the officers presenting the affidavits. Are there two standards for investigations? That is an understatement. But to belittle what took place in the FISA proceedings, frankly, Manager Schiff, you know better than that. Thank you, Counsel. Senator from Illinois. Thank you. The question from Senator Durbin is to both parties. Emails between DOD and OMB officials reveal that by August 12, the Pentagon could no longer guarantee that all of the $250 million in DOD aid to Ukraine could be spent before it expired. Deputy Secretary of Defense Norquist drafted a letter that stated that the Pentagon had, quote, repeatedly advised OMB officials that pauses beyond August 19 jeopardize the department's ability to obligate USAI, USAI funding prudently and fully, end quote. Why did the president persist in withholding the funds when DOD officials were sounding the alarm that the hold would violate the law and shortchange our ally of needed military aid? It is the uh, turn of the White House counsel to go first. Mr. Chief Justice, and Senator, thank you for that question. I, I think the thing to understand is there were a series of communications um, reflected, I believe, in the, the letter that OMB has uh, sent to the GAO and in um, some of the, the testimony uh, in the proceeding below that um, the Office of Management and Budget was encouraging DOD to take what steps it could to get everything lined up, have everything ready to obligate the funds so everything would be able to move quickly when the pause was lifted. DOD, as the email you've mentioned suggests, was saying, we're, we're running out of time, we're running out of time, we're going to have difficulty doing it. But the fact was that the deadline for obligating the funds was not going to be till the end of the fiscal year. And as it turned out, as I explained earlier in response to Senator Lankford's question, uh, the funds were released on September 11th, and the vast majority of them were obligated by the end of the fiscal year. So that the procedures that had been used to try to get everything pre-planned were mostly successful. Yes, there was some funds, I believe it was $35 million, that did not get out the door by the end of the fiscal year, slightly more than in past years, but every year, in fiscal year 2017, fiscal year 2018, there were funds in the security assistance program that didn't make it out the door by the end of the year. And in each of those years, there was also the little fix in either the next appropriations bill or the CR to allow those funds to carry over. So. The planning had been to try to ensure that when the decision was made to release the funds, it would be done by the end of the fiscal year. Not quite all of it got out the door, that's true, but there is always some that doesn't get out the door by the end of the fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, members of the Senate, thank you for that question. You know, as we um, go further and further down this rabbit hole, I think we need to make it very clear that, you know, of the 17 witnesses that the House interviewed, nobody had an explanation. Uh, and yet, uh, again, like last night, Mr. Philbin seems to know more than anybody else 
in the government, more than anyone in the Department of Defense, more than anybody in the Department of State, more than anybody in the OMB who had come forward with information about how exactly this happened. Uh, but again, here are the facts. OMB interviewed about an interagency process that they supposedly said was going on long after the interagency process had already ended. In fact, as OMB was doing those footnotes that we talked about last week, those footnotes that had been, never been done before, that Mr. Sandy said he had never seen in his 12 years plus of time working this process, as that was going on, DOD was asking the question about why we are doing this. They had no idea. And then when the, the release was finally getting ready to be uh, finally lifted, the hold rather, OMB emailed, uh, OMB emailed DOD saying, listen, as we've been saying all along under the Empowerment and Control Act, there are no problems here, and if there is a problem, it's your fault. To which... DOD replied back, as you may recall, you've got to be kidding me. I'm speechless. Because they did not know. Nobody had told them anything. None of the other 17 witnesses knew about it. So I do want to address before I finish one other point, this idea that there, uh, the delay didn't matter. Listen, it doesn't matter if it was a four-day delay, a 40-day delay, or a 400-day delay. Every delay in combat matters. Every delay in combat matters. And I will say, they talked about delays in the past. Well, in past years, there was about 3 to 6 percent of the funds unobligated because of unforeseen and legitimate reasons following the policy process. In 2019, 14 percent of the funds went unobligated for foreseeable and unavoidable reasons because the president could have held them. And to this day, Thanks, 16 manager, million your is Your time unspent. has expired. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Wyoming. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Risch, Young, Fisher, Blunt, and Capito. Thank you. Question from Senator Barrasso and the other senators is for the counsel to the president. Is it within a U.S. president's authority to personally address the issue of corruption with a head of a foreign government when he believes the established U.S. process has been unsuccessful in the past? Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for that question. Um, the short answer is yes. The President is, under Article II, uh, vested with the entirety of the executive power. Uh, and it has been made clear since the founding, since the, the early part of the 1800s in decisions by the Supreme Court that the President is the sole organ of the nation in foreign affairs. He is vested with the authority to speak on behalf of the nation, as the Supreme Court has described it. He is to be uh, the sole voice of the nation in foreign affairs. And that is why that authority was assigned in the Constitution to the executive. Alexander Hamilton has explained in the Federalist Papers that the executive is characterized by unity and dispatch, the ability to have one view to act quickly and also the ability to maintain secrecy. And therefore, it is the executive that is uniquely uh, suited and that uniquely has the ability to carry out the responsibilities of engaging with foreign nations and carrying out diplomacy. So when the president believes that there is an issue of interest to the United States, including corruption in another country, and there hasn't been the sort of progress that he would want to see in dealing with that issue in the foreign country, Perhaps interactions with prior administrations, prior officials of prior administrations that don't look great from an anti-corruption perspective. It is entirely within the president's prerogative and within his province to raise those issues with a foreign leader. 
to point out where he believes that there needs to be something done in the interest of the United States, that if there is an issue related to corruption or whether it's something else, an issue related to economic matters, trade matters, uh, antitrust matters, cross-border um, trade, those are all things that the president can raise with a foreign leader. Corruption is not taken off the table, and it's also not taken off the table if it's an issue that happens to involve an official from a prior administration, whether that official is not or may have recently decided to run for another office. If it relates to the national interest of the United States, he has a legitimate reason for raising it, and it's within his authority as the chief executive. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from Massachusetts. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk. Thank you. Question from Senator Warren is for the House managers. At a time when large majorities of Americans have lost faith in government, does the fact that the Chief Justice is presiding over an impeachment trial in which Republican senators have thus far refused to allow witnesses or evidence contribute to the loss of legitimacy of the Chief Justice, the Supreme Court, and the Constitution? Senator, I would uh, not say that it contributes to uh, a loss of confidence in the Chief Justice. I think the Chief Justice has presided admirably. But I will say this. I was having a conversation the other day on the House floor with one of my colleagues, uh, Tom Malinowski from New Jersey, a, a brilliant colleague. And I was, I was hearkening back to what I thought was a key exchange during the course of this saga. This is when Ambassador Volker in September is talking with Andre Yermak. And Volker is making the case that the new president of Ukraine should not do a political investigation and prosecution of the former president of Ukraine, Poroshenko. And he's making the case that we often make when we travel around the country and meet with other parliamentarians about not engaging in political investigations. And when he makes that remark, Yermak throws it right back in his face and says, Oh, you mean like the investigation you want us to do of the Clintons and the Bidens? And I was lamenting this to my colleague. Um, what is our answer to that? What is the answer to that for, for, from a country that prides itself on adherence to the rule of law? How do we answer that? And his response, I thought, was very interesting. He said, this proceeding is our answer. This proceeding is our answer. Yes, we are a more than fallible democracy, and we don't always live up to our ideals. But when we have a president who demonstrates corruption of his office, who sacrifices the national interest for his personal interest, unlike other countries, there's a remedy. And so yes, we don't always live up to our ideals, but this trial is part of our constitutional heritage, that we were given a power to impeach the president. I don't think a trial without witnesses reflects adversely on the Chief Justice. I do think it reflects adversely on us. I think it diminishes the power of this example to the rest of the world. If we cannot have a fair trial in the face of this kind of presidential misconduct. This is the remedy. This is the remedy for presidential abuse. But it does not reflect well on any of us if we are afraid of what the evidence holds. If this will be the first trial in America where the defendant says at the beginning of the trial, if the prosecution case is so good, why don't they prove it without any witnesses? That's not a model we can hold up with pride to the rest of the world. And yes, Senator, I think that will feed cynicism about this institution, that we may disagree on the president's conduct or not, but we can't even get a fair trial. 
We can't even get a fair shake for the American people. We can't, oh my God, we can't hear what John Bolton has to say. God forbid we should hear what a relevant witness has to say. Hear no evil. That cannot reflect well on any of us. It's certainly no cause for celebration or vindication or anything like it. Now, my colleague says that I'm a Puritan who speaks in dulcet tones. I think that's the nicest thing he's ever said about me. I wouldn't describe myself as a Puritan, but yes, I do believe in right and wrong. And I think right matters. I think a fair trial matters. And I think that the country deserves a fair trial. And yes, Senator, if they don't get that fair trial, it will just further a cynicism that is corrosive to this institution and to our democracy. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Chief Justice. Senator from Alabama. I send a question to the desk. Thank you. The question from Senator Shelby is for the counsel for the president. Though not charged in the articles of impeachment, House managers and others have stated the president's actions constituted criminal bribery. Can this claim be reconciled with the Supreme Court's unanimous decision in McDonald versus United States? Mr. Chief Justice, Senator, thank you for that question. And I think the, the answer is no, it can't be reconciled with the McDonald case. Um, and let me make a couple of points in my answer. The first is, of course, because there is no bribery or extortion charged in the articles of impeachment, uh, the managers can't rely on that now to try to establish their case. I pointed out yesterday, I believe, that that is a, a due process violation of the most fundamental sort, to have a charging document and then and leave out certain charges in the charging document, then come to trial and say, well, it's not in the indictment, it's not in the charge, but actually what we've shown you is he did something else wrong. It was this crime. As the House managers well know, that would result in an automatic mistrial in any actual trial in a court in this country. So that's the initial problem with trying to go there on bribery or something else. Then, as the Senator's question raises, the McDonald case made clear that simply arranging a meeting for someone, simply setting up a meeting with other government officials, couldn't be treated as the thing of value in an exchange under the bribery statute. And it pointed out particularly in terms of government officials who all the time are asked by their constituents to introduce them to someone else in the government, to arrange a meeting, that that is not an official act. It's not an official policy decision, an action that is determining some government policy. It's simply allowing someone to have a meeting to then talk about something. If that's the nature of the meeting, that can't be the thing of value that is being exchanged and can't support a charge of bribery. So, they can't raise it because it's not in the Articles of Impeachment. If they had wanted to charge that, they had to charge it in the Articles of Impeachment. They can't come here now and try to try a different case from the one they framed in the charging document that they had complete control over drafting. Even if they did, they can't make out the claim with respect to this, the, the White House meeting because the McDonald case prohibits that. I'd like to make one other point because the House managers today have brought up a lot. There have been a lot of questions again and again about the subpoena power and were their subpoenas actually valid and how it's going to destroy oversight if the president's arguments are accepted. I just want to point something out. The subpoenas that were issued purported to have been issued not under oversight authority, but pursuant to, every letter that came out said, pursuant to the House's impeachment inquiry. They purported to be exercising the authority of impeachment. And that makes a difference because one of the House managers mentioned this. Legislative oversight, the authority to inquire into information for legislative purposes, has to actually relate to something that legislation could be passed on. There are certain constraints on what information could be sought. 
slightly different if you're going under the impeachment power because then you can investigate into specific past facts more readily because that's relevant to an impeachment inquiry that might not be for legislative purposes. They purported to be using the impeachment authority. They didn't have that authorization because the speaker's press conference did not validly give them that authorization. We pointed out that the subpoenas were invalid. They did nothing to try to cure that deficiency. They didn't reissue the subpoenas. They didn't have the vote and reissue them or anything. And to say now that all of oversight will be destroyed forever if you accept the president's arguments is totally false. It's totally misleading because they weren't purporting to do just regular oversight. And as we've pointed out several times, the October 8th letter that the White House counsel sent to Chairman Schiff and others said specifically, if you want to return to regular oversight, we're happy to do that. As we have in the past, subject to constitutional constraints, we'll participate in the accommodations process. And it was the House Democrats that didn't want to take that route. So they insist on using the impeachment authority we pointed out that they didn't have it, and they didn't seek to cure that problem. So accepting the president's position here has nothing to do with destroying oversight by Congress for all time and all circumstances. It has to do with the mistake that they made in trying to assert a particular authority that they didn't have in this case. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. The senator from Virginia. Mr. Chief, Chief Justice, on behalf of myself, Senator Bennett, Senator Blumenthal, and Senator Heinrich, I have a question to send to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. The question from Senator Warner and the other senators is for the House managers. Our intelligence community and law enforcement leadership unanimously concluded Russia interfered in the 2016 election and that Russia continues those efforts toward the 2020 election. The Mueller report and the Senate Intelligence Committee reached the same conclusion. Yesterday, the President's counsel said that foreign election interference could be legal if it's related to credible information. Does this mean it is proper for the President to accept or encourage Russia, China, or other foreign countries to produce damaging intelligence or information targeting his domestic political opponents as long as he deems it to be from credible information. For the House managers. Senators of Justice, that is the natural conclusion of what the president's lawyers are arguing. Essentially that if the president believes that it would serve his reelection interest to seek the help of a foreign intelligence service to provide dirt on his opponent or in other ways assist his campaign, as long as he thinks his winning is in the national interest, then that's okay. It's not only no, okay, but no restraint can be placed upon it. Uh, even if he were to go so far as to proclaim a quid pro quo, hey, Russia, you've got among the best intelligence services on the planet. If you will engage those intelligence services on my behalf, I will refuse to enforce sanctions on you over your invasion of Ukraine. That may injure the security of our country, but look, I think my reelection is more important. That's where this bastardization of the Constitution leads us. The idea that no abuse of power is within the reach of the Congress. Now, I want to take this opportunity to respond to a couple other quick points, if I can. First, counsel neglects the fact that when we issued those subpoenas, we stated in the letters accompanying their issuance that they were being issued um, consistent with both the impeachment inquiry and our oversight authority. They neglected to tell you the latter part, that we explicitly made reference to our oversight capacity as legislators. And finally, on the issue of bribery. In the Nixon impeachment, there was an umbrella article of impeachment that listed a series 
of specific acts. Some of those acts involve criminal activity and some involve just unethical activity. If you accept counsel's argument, you would have said that the articles passed out of the House Judiciary Committee in Nixon were likewise infirm because if they were gonna charge the president with engaging in a criminal act, they needed to make a separate article of it. And otherwise, how dare they would be a violation of due process to be thrown out of any court, prosecutorial misconduct, and the like. Okay, that's, that's nonsense. On the one hand, they wanna argue there's no conduct here that's even akin to a crime. When under McDonald, in fact, this would constitute bribery, withholding a White House meeting, withholding the provision of hundreds of millions of dollars in aid under the precedent of McDonald, that would be bribery. But there's no doubt it's akin to bribery. But they say, unless you charge that, unless in the Nixon case, they had 15 articles on each particular act, criminal and non-criminal, that you could not make out a viable charge. That's never been a constitutional principle just as they would have had the House organize its impeachment investigation along the terms they dictate, they now want to dictate how we can charge an offense. At the end of the day, the task is determine whether the conduct that's charged has been committed and whether that abuse of power rises to the level warranting impeachment. But this technical legal argument that no, you have to charge it as we would like you to charge it, that you can't make reference to the fact that yes, these acts also constitute bribery, that that's somehow offensive to legal or constitutional principles. It's not. Yes, we could have charged bribery, we could have had two separate counts. That is not a constitutional requirement. And had we done that, as I said last night, they would have attacked that saying you're taking one offense and making it into two. That does not detract from the fact that the president's conduct violated our bribery laws, particularly as they were understood by the framers, not as they were understood 200 years later. They violated what the framers understood from British common law to constitute extortion. They violated the modern day Empowerment Control Act. They violated the Whistleblower Protection Act. They violated multiple laws, but that's not even necessary. What is necessary is that they abuse their power. And counsel says, well, claims are made of abuse of power all the time. Yes, that's true in political rhetoric. But these circumstances warranted impeachment. The president was, impeached, was not impeached over climate change or any of the other innumerable examples they gave of people rhetorically saying the president is abusing his office. That's not what brought us here. What brought us here was the president decided that he could withhold military aid to an ally at war to get help in his re-election. Thank you, Mr. Manager. The Senator from Oklahoma. Question for the President's counsel, and I'm being joined by Senators Rounds and Young. Thank you. Question from Senator Inhofe, joined by Senators Rounds and Young for counsel to the President. Even if additional witnesses are called, do you ever envision the House managers agreeing there has been a fair Senate trial if it ends in the President's acquittal? Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, the answer is no. Now, they will not agree that it's fair because what will happen is if there's a discussion of witnesses and if we go to witnesses, Mr. Schumer's laid out the four he wants. Now he tells me I can have anybody, we can have anybody we want. But the reality is that also includes documents. And that includes other witnesses that it may lead to. So at some point you'll say, because this cannot go on forever and we will be at the election, this, this body will say, this has to come to an end. And they will say, aha, it's been brought to an end as we were about to get the key evidence. But what is so interesting here is they had 17 witnesses that they had. 
When the hearing took place before the Judiciary Committee, if I'm not mistaken, Manager Nadler, you had four witnesses, I think, at one point, when you had the law professors. And there was three law professors from the Democratic side, and there was one from the Republican side. So if we're going to take that same four-to-one analysis, for every one of their witnesses, we should get four. But there was a question earlier asked about the fruit of the poisonous tree. The taint of the poison does not age well. The longer it goes does not make that poison go away. It gets deeper and deeper into the soil. And here the soil we're talking about is a trial that would be not only ongoing, but they put up 17 witnesses. You heard them. They're acting like there's been no witnesses presented here. They presented testimony, 17. They may not have liked that we were able to respond to those 17 by playing those witnesses' words. By the way, those witnesses, the testimony of those witnesses were never done with the cross-examination by the counsels for the president. So does this end? Will it ever be enough? No, it will only be enough if they got a conviction. Because that's what it's about. Because let's forget, not forget for a moment, this has been going on in one stage or another for three and a half, three years now. My concern is there's not a, where's the end point in that? So their end point is, well, just give us John Bolton, and then, you know, you don't get anybody, and, or you, you get, or then, you know, you get one and we get one, and then that one may lead to somebody else. It's not the way it works. So they've said overwhelming, proved, 63 times. 63 times. And as we're three hours away from answering the end of the question section, we're about to go into the, I mean, it sounds like we've been arguing about witnesses for the last couple of hours, but that starts tomorrow. But do I think that there will be, is it our position that there will be a, a recognition that there's due process has been reached and we've reached the happy accord? No, I do not believe that. I also don't believe that what can be cured here. I don't think what they did can be cured here by anything you were to do as far as witnesses or anything else. That process was so tainted. Now, I thought Mr. Philbin did a very effective job of explaining painstakingly now, and multiple times I know, the issue of those subpoenas. And I thought the perfect analysis was when one of the managers said, well, when they people file Freedom of Information Act requests, they get answers. And Mr. Philbin said that's because they followed the law. They followed the rules. That is not what happened here. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from Delaware. Mr. Chief Justice, on behalf of our colleagues, Senators Booker, Cardin, Kane, Markey, Menendez, Merkley, Murphy, and Shaheen, I send a question to, uh, to the desk for our House managers. Thank you. Thank you. Question from Senator Carper and the other senators addressed to the House managers. The President's aides and defenders have claimed that it is normal or usual to use U.S. foreign assistance as the President did to achieve a desired outcome. How was the President's act in withholding U.S. security assistance to Ukraine different from how the U.S. uses foreign assistance to achieve foreign policy goals and national security objectives and how should we evaluate the defense argument that this is what is, quote, done all the time, end quote? Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for the question. So to understand the answer to this, you, you don't have to look inside the president's mind. You just have to look at recent history and then what was done last year. As I talked about earlier and even yesterday, other presidents have held holds an aid for legitimate reasons, even this president. We concede that, that there are 
a variety of legitimate policy reasons for holding aid, whether it be corruption or burden sharing. So even in the, president, uh, the president's other holds, like Afghanistan, because of concerns about terrorism, or Central America, because of immigration concerns. And even though some might disagree with that, that is a legitimate policy debate. The difference here is that every witness testified, these 17 witnesses that you hear about, testified that there was no reason provided for the implementation of this hold. Right, I talked about earlier how there is a process for doing this. Right? There is a, there is a well-prescribed process for allocating the funds, like we all did here in this chamber, and 87 of you agreed on. And then an interagency process to review it to make sure that it meets the standards and criteria outlined by this body, anti-corruption reforms. And that was done in this case. That interagency process was followed. That certification was made. The notification to Congress was conducted. The train had left the station just like the train had left the station in 2018, in 2017, in 2016. And every element of the agencies and the bureaucracy involved in that process in prior years had been engaged and had signed off. Except this year, or in 2019 rather, that all changed. A hold was implemented for no known reason. There was no notification given to Congress, which violated the Empowerment Control Act. DOD, Department of State, Secretary Esper, Secretary Pompeo, even Vice President Pence, and the entire National Security Council implored the president to release the aid because it not only had met all of the certifications, but it was in the U.S. national interest and consistent with U.S. policy. And yet, nobody knew why it happened. And to this day, the individual who could shed light on this, Mr. Bolton, is being prohibited from coming forward to explain why the president told him it happened. So yes, it is still a good time to subpoena Ambassador Bolton and get that information. Thank you, Mr. Manager. The Senator from North Carolina. Mr. Chief Justice, I have a uh, question for both sets of counsels, sponsored by myself, Senator Cruz, Senator Scott of South Carolina, Hawley, Sass, and Rubio. Thank you. Question from Senator Burr and the other senators is for both parties. Uh, the House will answer first. Hillary Clinton's campaign and the Democratic National Committee hired a retired foreign spy to work with Russian contacts to build a dossier of opposition research against her political opponent, Donald Trump. Under the House manager's standard, would the Steele dossier be considered as foreign interference in a U.S. election, a violation of the law, and or an impeachable offense. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief uh, Justice and distinguished senators. I thank you for the question. Uh, the analogy uh, is not applicable to the present situation because first, to the extent uh, that opposition research was obtained. It was opposition research that was purchased. But this speaks to the underlying issue of the avoidance of facts, the avoidance of the reality of what President Trump did in this particular circumstance. Now, I have tremendous respect for the President's counsel, but one of the arguments that we consistently hear on the floor of this Senate, this great institution, 
in America's democracy is conspiracy theory after conspiracy theory after conspiracy theory. We've heard about the deep state conspiracy theory. We've heard about the Adam Schiff is the root of all evil conspiracy theory. We've heard about the Burisma conspiracy theory. We've heard about the crowd strike conspiracy theory. We've heard about the whistleblower conspiracy theory. It's hard to keep count. This is the Senate. This is America's most exclusive political club. This is the world's greatest deliberative body. And all you offer us is conspiracy theories because you can't address the facts in this case that the president corruptly abused his power to target an American citizen for political and personal gain. He tried to cheat in the election by soliciting foreign interference. That is an impeachable offense. That is a crime against the Constitution. That is the reason that we are here. That is what is before this great body of distinguished senators. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, so I, I guess you could buy this is what it sounds like. You, you can buy a foreign interference. You could per if you purchase it, if you purchase their opposition research, I guess it's okay. So let me try to debunk the conspiracy, Manager Jeffries, and that is, it is not a conspiracy that Christopher Steele was engaged to obtain and prepare a dossier on the president, presidential candidate for the Republican Party, Donald Trump. It is not a conspiracy that Christopher Seale utilized his network of assets, including assets apparently in Russia, to draft the dossier. It is not a conspiracy that the dossier was shared with the Department of Justice through Bruce Orr, who was the number four ranking member of the Department of Justice at that time, because his wife, Nellie Orr, happened to be working for the organization Fusion GPS that was putting the dossier together. This is also not a conspiracy. It sounds like one, except it's real. And it's also not a conspiracy that that dossier, purchase dossier, was taken by the FBI, submitted to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to obtain a foreign intelligence surveillance order on an American citizen. It is also not a conspiracy that that court issued an order, two of them now, condemning the FBI's practice and acknowledging that many of those orders were not properly issued. None of that is a conspiracy theory. That's just the facts. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The senator from Wisconsin. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, I send a question to the desk for both President's Counsel and House Managers. Thank you. Question from Senator Baldwin is for both parties and counsel for the president will answer first. Can you assure us that the Jennifer Williams document submitted to the House was not classified secret for any reasons prohibited by Executive Order 13526, such as present preventing embarrassment to a person? If yes, please describe or identify the serious damage to national security that would be caused by declassifying this document pursuant to the same executive order. Mr. Chief Justice and uh, Senator, in response to your question, the Trump administration's policy is always to abide by the requirements for classification of material 
and the classification, my understanding is that that document is derivatively classified because it refers to another document, a transcript that was originally classified. I, I can't represent to you the specific reasons that the classification officer classified that document, but I can tell you that it was originally classified according to proper procedures. It is a properly classified document because that is the policy of the administration to follow the classification procedures. The, the um, memorandum that she submitted is derivatively classified because of that transcript. Now, that transcript relates to a conversation with a foreign head of state. Almost all conversations with foreign heads of state are classified. And they're classified because the confidentiality related to those uh, communications is important for ensuring that there can be candid conversations with foreign heads of state. The president took an extraordinary action in declassifying two of his conversations with foreign heads of state, unprecedented, because he carefully weighed the balance of what was at stake in this case and the need for transparency for the American public in those two conversations. But that was an exception to the usual rule that such conversations are properly classified. Thank you, counsel. I would uh, encourage you, if you haven't already had the opportunity, to read that document for yourself and ask you whether you think there's any legitimate basis to classify that supplemental testimony. Now, the Vice President has said that he had no knowledge of this scheme. He's denied any knowledge, involvement in any way, shape, or form. And we heard the testimony of Ambassador Sondland that Ambassador Sondland raised with the Vice President that the aid was being held up and was tied to these investigations. And the Vice President didn't say, what are you talking about? That could never be. The President would never allow such a thing. There was nothing but a silent nod of acknowledgement with what he was being told. But nonetheless, the, President, the Vice President says that he knew nothing. And the Vice President points to the open testimony of Jennifer Williams to support that contention. But the classified submission goes to that phone call between the Vice President and President Zelensky. You should read that and ask yourself whether that submission is being classified because it would either embarrass or undermine what the President and the Vice President are saying, or there's some legitimate reason. Now, the Vice President at one point said that he wanted to release the record of his call. He certainly talked all about this issue, as has the President. If it was so classified, then why are they all talking about it? But we are to be assured that this, no, this classification decision was made absolutely above board. I'm sure that John Bolton's manuscript will be treated with the same rigid, objective scrutiny. You read that. Don't take my word for it. You read that and you ask yourselves, is there anything that other than avoiding evidence that the administration doesn't want you to see, that the public shouldn't see Jennifer Williams' supplemental testimony. I don't think you can conclude that it is, except that it would be inconsistent with what you're being told and what the American people are being told. Well, they deserve the whole truth, and that's part of the truth. So let the public see it. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senator Daines, and Senator Cruz. Thank you. The question from Senators Alexander, Danes, and Cruz is for the House managers. Compare the bipartisanship in the Nixon, Clinton, and Trump impeachment proceedings. Specifically, how bipartisan was the vote in the House of Representatives to authorize and direct the House committees to begin 
formal impeachment inquiries for each of the three presidents. Mr. Chief Justice and Senators, in the um, Nixon impeachment, we look back and we think about the vote on the House Judiciary Committee that ended up uh, bipartisan, but it didn't start that way. The parties were as dug in uh, as parties are today. The Republicans and Democrats saw it differently. But as the evidence emerged, a bipartisan consensus emerged on the committee, and a number of Republicans, uh, Tom Railsback, who just passed away, Caldwell Butler, who loved Richard Nixon. He was a huge fan of Richard Nixon. But they couldn't turn away from the evidence that their president had committed abuse of power, cheat in the election, and that he, they had to vote to impeach him. When it came to the uh, Clinton uh, impeachment, that was, again, it started out along very partisan lines. And it ended along partisan lines. And I believe the reason why, as I said a short while earlier, was that we never had a high crime and misdemeanor. That was the problem. Uh, with Nixon, we had clear abuse of presidential authority to upend the constitutional scheme, to, to cheat in an election, and members of both parties voted to impeach. With Clinton, we had private misconduct. Yes, I think probably a crime, because he lied about that under oath, but it wasn't misuse of presidential authority. As I said, any husband caught in an affair could have lied about it, and it didn't involve the use of presidential authority. And so we never got beyond our partisan divisions on that. And many of us, and I will include myself, believe that it was being done for a partisan purpose because it didn't reach a high crime and misdemeanor. In the Trump case, and I'll say I've been disappointed because I serve with a number of Republicans in the House who I like, who I respect, who I work with on legislation, and I honestly believe that when this evidence came out, as with in the Nixon administration, we would have a coming together, but it didn't happen, much to my disappointment. I think you have a new opportunity here in the Senate. <clears throat> For one thing, uh, this is a smaller body. You are, as has been mentioned, the greatest deliberative body on the planet. You have an opportunity to do something that we didn't have the chance to do, which is to call firsthand witnesses and hear from them. We have missed some, a lot of things happened since the impeachment articles were adopted. One of them uh, was, were emails that had been released that we didn't know about. See, the, it's been said that by counsel that the, the Freedom of Information Act uh, information just shows if you follow the process, you get information. No, they had to sue. And they're still in a, in a lockdown fight over the Freedom of Information right, and the redactions that were not proper. So that's a big fight that's still going on, but we've got information. But most tellingly, Mr. Bolton has now stepped forward and said he wants, he's willing to testify. He's willing to come here and testify under oath. And I think we would all learn something. And as Mr. Schiff has mentioned, I think we can structure this in such a way that it will respect the Senate's need to do other business, um, which we also feel in the House. Let's get that done, and let's see if that kind of information can help the senators come together, as happened in the House Judiciary Committee so many years ago when we dealt with the serious problem 
of presidential misconduct, abuse of power to cheat an election when Richard Nixon shocked the nation and ultimately had to resign. Thank you, Ms. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Democratic leader is recognized. I send a, a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. The question from Senator Schumer for the House managers. Many of our colleagues are worried that if we were able to bring witnesses and documents in the trial, it would take too long. Mr. Schiff mentioned we could do depositions in one week. Please elaborate. What can you say that will reassure us that having witnesses and documents can be done in a short time, minimally impeding the business of the Senate? I thank the Senator for the question. Uh, first of all, with respect to the documents uh, that we subpoenaed and sought to get in the House, those documents have been collected. Um, so that work has been done. We've been informed, for example, the State Department documents have been collected. Those could readily be provided uh, to the Senate for its consideration. With respect to witnesses, if we agree to a one-week period to do depositions while you continue to conduct the business of the Senate, it doesn't mean that we would have unlimited witnesses during that week. We would, have to, we would have to decide on witnesses who are relevant and probative of the issues. Neither side would have an unlimited capacity to call endless witnesses. We would have a limited period of time, just as we had a limited period of time for our opening presentations and for this question and answer period. If there was any dispute over whether a witness is truly material and probative, that decision could be made by the Chief Justice uh, in very short order. If there was a dispute as to whether a passage in a document is covered by an applicable privilege, and if for the first time the White House should actually invoke a privilege, the Chief Justice could decide, is that properly laid, or is that merely an attempt to conceal crime or fraud? So this can be done very quickly. This can be done, I think, effectively. We have never sought to depose every witness uh, under the face of the sun. Uh, we have specified four in particular that we think are particularly appropriate and, and relevant here. But we should be able to reach an agreement on concluding that process within a week. Uh, so that's how we would contemplate it, that it being done. Uh, we make that proposal to uh, our opposing counsel. Uh, it would be respectful of your time. Uh, it would, uh, I think, be a reasonable accommodation. Um, my counsel says that the Constitution mandates a reasonable accommodation. Well, let's have a reasonable accommodation here. And a reasonable accommodation would be, we'll take one week, you'll continue with the business in the Senate, uh, we'll do the depositions, and then we'll come back and we'll present to you uh, what the witnesses had to say in those depositions. And that's how we contemplate the process would work. Thank you, Mr. Manager. The majority leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I'm about to send a question to the desk. But I'm going to suggest that following the response to my question and one more Democratic question, we take a 45-minute break for dinner. So I send a question to the desk. I'm sure there's no objection. The senator from the majority leader is for the counsel for the president. Would you please respond to the question on bipartisanship by Senator Alexander and any assertions the House managers made in response to any of the previous questions? Mr. Chief Justice, Majority Leader, thank you for that question. And in response to Senator Lamar's question about bipartisanship, I, I, Excuse me, I, I beg your pardon, Senator Alexander. Um, Senator Alexander, your question. Um, the, uh, in the Nixon case, the authorizing resolution, this is in the House to authorize the inquiry, was passed by a vote of 410 to 4. 410 voted in favor of the inquiry, only 4 voted against. 
232 Democrats, 177 Republicans, and one independent voted in favor. In the Clinton authorizing resolution, uh, this was House Resolution 581 to actually authorize just the beginning of the inquiry. It passed by a vote of 258 to 176. 31 Democrats joined 227 Republicans voting in favor of authorizing that inquiry. That was substantial bipartisan support to authorize the inquiry. In this case, House Resolution 660, which was passed on October 31st, had bipartisan opposition. The votes in favor of the resolution were 231 Democrats and one independent. The opposition was all Republicans, 194 plus two Democrats voting against. Um, in terms of other assertions that have been made, there are just a couple of points I wanted to touch on. There's been a lot said about um, the House managers have suggested that the counsel for the president have argued that the president could do anything he wants now to solicit any foreign interference in any election. If, if he thinks it will help him get elected, that's okay that that's the theory of the case. That is absolutely false. That is a gross distortion of what has been presented. And let me make a couple of points about that. There have been questions about the campaign finance laws. And one narrow point that we have made in response to specific questions about the campaign finance laws is simply that information, limited information, being presented to a party is not a, camp, a contribution, a thing of value under the campaign finance laws. And that, it's not just my conclusion, that's what the Mueller report said. When the Mueller report looked into this, it said, no judicial decision has treated the voluntary provision of uncompensated opposition research or similar information as a thing of value that could amount to a contribution under campaign finance law. That was volume one at page 187. So that's a limited point. The bigger point, the suggestion has been made because of Professor Dershowitz's comments that the theory that the President's counsel is advancing is the President can do anything he wants. If he thinks it will advance his um, reelection, any quid pro quo, anything he wants, anything goes. And that is not true. Professor Dershowitz today issued a, uh, a statement to show that that was an exaggeration of what he was saying. But let me make the even more narrow point. Aside from what Professor Dershowitz was saying the other night and explaining in abstract and hypothetical terms and academic terms, we have a specific case here. And the specific case here is the one that's been framed by the House managers. And the defects in that case and in their theory of the case are a theory of abuse of power that involves no allegation of a crime whatsoever, no allegation of a violation of established law. Instead, the theory that you can take action that on its face is objectively permissible under the powers of the president and determine that it's going to be treated as impeachable and impermissible solely on an inquiry into subjective motives. That's what the House Judiciary Committee report says. That is a theory that is infinitely malleable. It provides no standard, no real standard at all. And that was one core point that Professor Dershowitz was making that it is tantamount to impeachment for maladministration. And the other point I'll make is they set the standard for themselves with respect to um, investigations that they have to establish in order to establish their bad motive that there is not a scintilla of evidence, there is nothing that you can look at that would suggest any possible legitimate national interest in inquiring into 2016 election interference or the Biden-Burisma affair. They can't possibly meet that standard. It is overdetermined that there is, a national, there is a legitimate policy interest in at least raising a question about those things. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. Yeah, the senator from Delaware. On behalf of myself and Senator Klobuchar, I send a question to the desk addressed to the president's counsel and the house managers. Thank you. The House will go first in answering the question from Senator Coons and Klobuchar. Mr. Seculo said earlier that the President's counsel would expect to call their own witnesses in this trial if Mr. Bolton or others are called by the House managers. 
Can you tell the Senate if any of those witnesses would have firsthand knowledge of the charges against the President and his actions? Mr. Justice, Senator, there certainly are witnesses that the President could call with firsthand information. I don't know that they're the witnesses that they have described so far. Uh, their position is, apparently, if you are the chairman of a committee doing an investigation, that makes you a relevant witness. It doesn't, or you've all become witnesses in your own investigations. They want to call Joe Biden as a witness. Joe Biden can't tell us why military aid was withheld uh, from Ukraine while it was fighting a war. Joe Biden can't tell us why President Zelensky couldn't get in the door of the White House while the Russian foreign minister could. He's not in a position to answer those questions. He can't tell us whether this rises to an impeachable abuse of power, although he probably has opinions on the subject. But are there witnesses they could call? Absolutely. They have said, Mick Mulvaney issued a statement saying, the President never said what I said he had said earlier. Well, if that's the case, then why don't they call Mick Mulvaney? He should be on their witness list. If Secretary Pompeo um, has evidence that there was a policy basis to withhold the aid and it was discussed, well, then why don't they call him? That's a relevant fact witness. They don't want to allow the Chief Justice to decide issues of materiality because they know what they're trying to do involves witnesses that don't shed light on the charges against the President. They do satisfy the appetite of their client, but they don't have probative value to the issues here. So yes, there are witnesses. Now, the reason they're not on the President's witness list is because if they were truthful under oath, they would incriminate the President. Otherwise, they would be begging to have Mick Mulvaney come testify. Otherwise, they'd be begging to have the head of OMB, who helped administer the freeze on behalf of the president. Let's bring him in. He'll tell you it was completely innocent. It was all about burden sharing. So why don't they want the head of OMB in? Why don't they want their own people in? Because their own people will incriminate the president. But there's no shortage of relative, relevant, probative witnesses. They just don't want you to hear what they have to say. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Besides the fact that Mr. Schumer said, and it's on uh, page 675 of the transcript, that I can call, we could call any witnesses we want, Mr. Schiff just said we, we, we don't really get, we can call their witnesses. And that's what he said, you can call their witnesses, because under their theory, if we wanted to talk to the whistleblower, even in a secure setting, to find out if he, in fact, may have worked for the Vice President, or may have worked on Ukraine, or may have been in communication with the staff, that's irrelevant. We can't talk to Joe Biden or Hunter Biden because that's irrelevant, except the conversation that is the subject matter of this inquiry, the phone call transcript that you selectively utilize, has a reference to Hunter Biden. The conversation with Burisma, they raised it for about a half a day, saying there was nothing there. Well, let me find out through cross-examination. But I just think the irony of this before we go to dinner, that we could call anyone we want except the witnesses we want, but we can call their witnesses that they want. Remember we said the fruit of the poisonous tree? It's still the fruit of the poisonous tree. It doesn't get better with age, as I said. But this idea that this is going to be a fair process, call the witnesses they want. Don't call the witnesses you want because they're irrelevant. Maybe irrelevant to them. They are not irrelevant to the president. And they're not irrelevant to our case. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Counsel, uh, Mr. Majority Leader, I understand we have 45 minutes. Mr. Chief Justice, we do indeed. Thank you. Mm.
202 is the area code, 748-8920. If you live in the east and central time zones, 202-748-8921 for those of you out in the mountain and Pacific time zones. And if you have a reaction or a question that has not been asked yet, and you want to text it into us, 202-748-8903. During this dinner break, we will take your calls, your texts. We'll also wait for reaction from the uh, senators and the lawyers, which we've seen every night so far. So we'll cover all that in this 45 minutes to an hour. Jeff Bennett of NBC tweets out that John Barrasso has laid out the potential Friday schedule. 1 p.m., four hours of closing arguments, including debate on witnesses, vote on witnesses. If it fails, move to vote on the articles. Senators will stay until that work is decided and completed Friday night. So we don't know yet whether or not there'll be a session on Saturday, but if there is, we will be here. Stephen in Norwalk, Ohio, please go ahead. We might need to cut you off if a senator comes to the mic, but in the meantime, we wanna hear, what'd you learn today, Stephen? Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I really haven't learned a whole lot new than what has been repeated over and over again. Um, but I'd like to start off by saying that I'm a Trump supporter since 2015. So let's go back to 2015 when President Trump announced his candidacy. And uh, let's hold witnessed... off on 2015. Here's okay. Mike Braun of Indiana. Not much new to talk about. I do have some information on what happens tomorrow. We're down to two hours and 53 minutes left today. So if we end up in a tie vote, um, that could be overruled by the chair. Unlikely, we think that might happen. Um, so if it's a tie vote, the way the motion's constructed, uh, you would not move on with more witnesses. So I was a little uncertain about uh, how that would work, and I think that's the way it will work. There'll be up to four hours of debate on the motion tomorrow, two hours on each side should you choose to take it. But the I expect not to have a tie vote, by the way. I think it's going to either be 51 or 49. There won't be a tie, I think. Chief I'm Justice pushing. could, but, you know, you, your guess is as good it, as anyone. It it's uncharted allowed, territory. You're, you're acknowledging that it is permitted under the rules. My understanding, you'd want to verify that with a parliamentarian, but I think Tim is right. I think it'll be a moot point, but uh, that's, everybody's asking that. So, And there's really nothing new to talk about the content of what we've been doing in there. It's a lot of repetition. Are you going to consider that four hours of debate tomorrow the opportunity for closing arguments as well? On the I think it's on the motion. Just on yeah, the closing arguments, I understand, are being done now through the questions. So, and it's been done for a while Any in other, other ways. clarity on the question of whether there's going to be closed deliberations? Uh, and no discussion of that. So will those four hours be debate on witnesses or are they actually closing arguments? No, it'd be debate on whether we move to witnesses. Questions. So questions yeah. about that, so right. about, about the motion. Compromise proposal of one week where you guys can do the data. Anything else you want, normal business, and then you come back and maybe it's just a deposition, you can decide that. Now, I, I've said this all week and I'll just say it one more time. Well, actually, I'll say it as often as necessary. Uh, if Adam Schiff wants to hear from Mr. Bolton, I recommend that he does it in the house. I think he can have those dual planes at the same time, number one. Number two, I would say that Adam just comments about the witness he wants to hear about is that the witness has consistently lacked credibility. He said that as far back as 2005, and he says that he plays a little loose as it relates to military intelligence. So the, the one witness he wants to hear from, he has been critical of the man's credibility since as early as 2005. Senator, when do you foresee a vote to acquit? So, after the four hours of discussion, you would move to uh, the vote on the table, and then there are some other process votes that occur after that, uh, whether it's a tie vote or whether, you know, we don't need it. There's still some wrap-up procedure to it, and I'm not certain about how long that takes, but, you know, I think that could all be done tomorrow if it goes the way uh, we think it should. So. I don't know that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it won't be a lot of anything uh, because once that vote occurs, it's, uh, I think it will be a fairly quick process to uh, wrapping it up. And are you guys doing any guesstimates on how long the deliberations will take? Deliberations on? After the four hours? 
Yes. I would say that you should, uh, if you're sitting in the chamber, you're like, you're better off thinking about this as a votorama, meaning that it could go into two, three, four in the morning, uh, as opposed to thinking of it. Sorry, as opposed to thinking of it as simply two hours on each side. This literally, you could have as many votes yeah. as anyone could dream of. So there, there, frankly, Schumer, yeah. Schumer has the ability to extend this process beyond tomorrow night and into into the weekend. From my so, so Senator Scott, are you are you anticipating this voterometer to, to conclude with a final verdict vote, or is that going to be postponed to a, another day? I, I just if if, if uh, the history of the Senate tells me anything. The best time to get us to make a decision is around 3 to 5 a.m. So uh, if we're still here about 3 to 5 a.m., I think you could expect a, a final vote on what to do next. That would eliminate us being here on Saturday, but that does not mean we won't be here on Monday hearing from witnesses. I'm just suggesting that the best way to get a decision out of the I'll body say, is probably I'll, three I'll say this. One. If you had more guys like me and Tim in here rather than around 60 lawyers, we'd probably done, be done with the Q&A now. So a lot of it's got repetitive. By coming to the mics and talking to us about process, are you, and, and you said 51-49, you said 50-50 on witnesses. Are you suggesting that the leader has the votes to block witnesses? I am not suggesting. I, I'm no, suggesting that the, the leader's comments from the Wall Street Journal and other outlets suggest that doesn't have the votes to, to, to not have witnesses is still the case. I do think that the, that the case is being tried by every single question, and you can tell that both sides have been targeting at just a few senators, and, and uh, that will probably lead us into tomorrow's four-hour discussion. Yeah, unless it's a tie vote, it's clear what happens. If it's a tie vote, the way the motion is constructed, unless the Chief Justice would intercede, it ends up dying. So, so it's it, still an open question in your caucus that there might be four Republicans who would vote with Democrats? I would say it's not a closed question. Uh, yeah, what the it's not a closed question. Were you predicting the 49-51? I got here a bit late, and I thought that's what you were saying. Yeah, I was saying that I don't think it'll end in a tie. Okay. I do not believe. I don't oh, think one way that, or the other. Yeah, that, that puts a lot of pressure on the uh, chair and the Chief or Justice. So that's Senator, a, that's it's a it's questionable it's precedent, it's too. If the Chief Justice does break a tie vote, is that kind of an improper insertion of the court into a question that should be decided by the Senate, in your opinions? I don't think so. I mean, but I'm not expecting that to happen. So I'm suggesting that that will not happen. That's my assumption. But it's based on the instincts of just politicians and what typically occurs in the end is that you make a decision and you live You'd by be it. be inserting yourself in a political situation, and I think that uh, somehow that'll be avoided. Senator, okay. if there is a vote to call additional witnesses, do you think it'll be, as Congressman Meadows has said, a Pandora box of witnesses? <laughs> or do you expect some negotiation between Leader McConnell and Schumer? It requires too much speculation for, for at least me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree with that one, too. <laughs> See ya. Thank you, Jim. And back to your call, Stephen in Norwalk, Ohio. Go ahead and finish your thought. You said you were a Trump supporter since 2015. Go ahead and finish. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, I just wanted to say that um, back in 2015 when he announced, no one really took him serious as a candidate. So when he was elected, I feel like uh, everyone was just in such shock and they had a hard time accepting that he won. So then we had the three-year saga of the Russian collusion, and we heard nothing but Russia, and Donald Trump colluded with Russia. All right, so Stephen, where does that bring us to today? Well, today, I, I feel like um, this trial should not even be taking place. I mean, Pelosi herself stated that it's not wise to go down this road without bipartisan support and overwhelming and compelling evidence. All right, thank you, sir. Travis, Manhattan Beach, California. Go ahead, Travis. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, I must say this impeachment trial is definitely giving all of America a, a great lesson on the fallacies of logic. And, uh, I mean, they, the Democrats have just been guilty of every one. Uh, the and hang on just a second, a couple of House members. I'm going to answer a few questions, but I, th I want to just open by the, the last uh, few hours of Adam Schiff uh, has to be vintage Adam Schiff. I've never seen uh, so many uh, false statements, mischaracterizations made in such a short period of time. 
Uh, and when you when you look at at the overall evidence that uh, continues to come out each and every uh, hour, um, it's more and more clear that uh, without additional witnesses, that uh, most of my Democrat senator colleagues should vote for acquittal. Uh, the demand has become so deafening from Adam Schiff that he needs John Bolton to appear that it must be even Adam Schiff questioning whether he has a case that is certainly worthy of a guilty verdict. Uh, but we'll be glad to answer any questions. We don't have any real statements other than uh, just that small analysis. Any questions you have? Senator Meadows, uh, I'm sorry, Congressman Meadows, uh, Joe Manchin represents a state that voted for Donald Trump by 42 points. Uh, if you were to vote to convict the president, what do you think that means for his future in West Virginia? Uh, obviously, if you if you look at the states you represent, uh, it and this is a, a, a representative uh, uh, republic, uh, you know that that we have the privilege of calling home. Uh, it, it would be very difficult, I think, for him to vote for a, a guilty verdict and uh, and uh, be able to explain that to the overwhelming uh, supporters that the president. Uh, has in West Virginia. I, you know, the, the fact is, is, is that guilty verdict would be telling every one of those Trump voters in West Virginia that perhaps they made the wrong choice in 2016. Um, but that's something that Senator Manchin is going to have to calculate uh, on his own. And, and certainly, as as he's looked and evaluated it, he's a thoughtful senator and uh, and certainly one of the few that. I would view as a possibility of coming across for a bipartisan acquittal. So the president's team has argued that if witnesses were called, this could drag on for months. You've heard Schiff, Chairman Schiff say twice yeah. today, now he's proposing this limited a period, <laughs> yeah. a one-week period uh, for witness depositions, similar yeah. to the Clinton model, and he said. What's your reaction? Uh, unlike the Clinton model, you have very different calculations here. Of course, as our counsel has explained on the floor, you have lots of very serious and important questions about how far executive uh, privilege would go, to whom it would uh, apply, and to what extent. This would definitely be tied up in the courts. This this supposed schedule that Schiff has just proposed, this would be a week and it would all be wrapped up, is just silly. Everyone knows that's not true. The president has to exert and defend that privilege because it's important to the institutions here. We have separation of powers. All those questions come directly into play. There's no way this would be wrapped up anytime soon. It would drag on probably into the summer, uh, depending on how many witnesses were called. So the whole thing that he's proposing, he knows would not happen, and it's hard to listen to it with a straight face. Yeah, and I think, uh, Catherine, uh, enough is never enough for my de Democrat colleagues. You heard just a few minutes ago uh, that the declassification of two phone calls, I would say the unprecedented declassification of two phone calls between the President of the United States and, and President Zelensky is not enough. Now they want one more phone call declassified. It, it, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the request that continues to get made and never is satisfied. And so uh, we also know that just getting counsel and getting uh, uh, depositions here, this is not a weak process. And, and anyone who's intellectually honest will know that there's no way that this could ever be done in a week, but it doesn't matter. Uh, they had the burden of proof to prove that the president is guilty. Obviously, they have not made that case. And when we see uh, the, the evidence that's before the American people, uh, there's no doubt that um, the overwhelming majority of the Senate will uh, vote to acquit. Congressman, um, at the risk of giving you flashbacks to the 1990s, um, an attorney for E. Jean Carroll, the writer who has accused the president of uh, raping her many years ago, says that a dress that she preserved has DNA on it, um, and the, the, the attorney would like the president. To is that a serious it. question? It is I mean, it is well, it's a real court case, sir. It's, it's a real we'll we'll case. answer any other serious question. It's, it's a real court case, sir. And I'm just asking, should uh, should the president submit to a blood test as President Clinton did? In we'll we'll answer any other serious question from a serious journalist. Excuse me, sir. Personally, spoken with any of the Senate Democrats who are considering acquittal. I've seen them talk on the. Yeah, I don't know that it would be appropriate for, uh, uh, you know, for for us to 
be uh, discussing that with Democrats or Republicans, honestly. And so uh, they have the, the responsibility to do that. And I think it's appropriate that they have those internal debates themselves. Thank you, guys. Thanks. So when the Senate reconvenes, they have two hours and 53 minutes left in question time. But let's get back to Travis in Manhattan Beach, California. Thanks for holding on, Travis. You're on. What'd you learn today? What question would you like to have asked? Sure. Uh, just real quick, like I, like I was saying, um, you know, the Democrats have really given a great lesson on the fallacies of logic. They've, they've tried to appeal to people's emotions, their ignorance, ad hominem attacks, and, and straw man arguments. And just one quick example was when Hakeem Jeffries uh, was asked about uh, Hillary Clinton paying for the Steele dossier. And he basically said that that was not germane to what's going on here. Well, she set that precedent that it's okay to pay and solicit foreign intervention into our elections. And that's what this trial is supposedly about. So I just, I don't see how you can just discount that. That, that is ridiculous. Cindy is in Dayton, Ohio. Hi, Cindy. Hi, how are you? Have um, all your you questions for my phone call. Have all your um, questions been asked? 148 of them so far. Well, my my question is, how can the American voter believe that Maxine Waters or Mr. Um, Green, they've already said they're still going after him. After this is long over, they're going to be right back in there. Maxine Water is going to make sure that's why they're doing this, because they know their people want him out of there. And that's not what we're about. That's not what Americans are about. Who do they think they are that we don't have the, the brains to elect our president, that they're going to take away our right to vote for our president because they want him impeached because they don't like what he's done over three and a half years? I wish somebody could tell me what the poor man has really done so bad in the three years that he's been there, because all you can do is add up all the good things that he does. I have a thing on my on my Facebook tonight that a, a gentleman was in his crowd at one of his um, things for his people, and the guy didn't have any hands. His hands were gone, and President Trump took his hands and put them on the man's cheeks so that he could feel the human touch of the president because he was there to, to encourage him in one of his Trump rallies that he was having. All right, that's Cindy in Dayton. Up next is Casey in Fort Collins, Colorado. Go ahead, Casey. Hey, thank you very much for your, uh, uh, allowing me a few moments. Um, my simple question would be, and I'll paraphrase it or actually phrase it however you want me to word it, but if the Government Accountability Office or Go uh, Office of Accountability had already claimed his actions were illegal, wouldn't that be enough to start an investigation as to why all of this took place in the first place, why there was a hold, and being amongst the 75 or higher percentage that wants witnesses, I think it would be a fair trial to say, look, if there's relevant material uh, information that pertains to the case, I think it should be allowed. Well, Casey, what about the argument that, hey, the House had the chance to hear these witnesses? Well, the House was never given those chances because they were uh, bombarded with blockades from the uh, administration. So how can you gather evidence when you're being told, no, you have to go through these subpoena processes that they did not authorize? Uh, I mean, the whole process that I am seeing basically is an argument of apples and oranges at a vegetable market. That's Casey in Colorado. Linda's in Hanover, Pennsylvania. Linda, you're on C-SPAN 2. What's the question you'd like to see asked? Well, it's not really a question. Um, it's more of a 
plead for my fellow Americans to go to the polls in November and allow the Republicans to take over the House and maintain the Senate. Because until they do that, this is going to go on and on and on. It's never going to stop as long as President Trump is in office. And it's a shame because the Democrats are now wanting to take the right to vote out of the hands of the American people. It's just not right. And it's just one thing after another. And this um, this group that said that uh, um, President Trump uh, committed a crime when he withheld uh, aid, well, that's not true. I mean, it happened. Yes, they did say he committed a crime. But do you know how many times they said Obama committed a crime um, with this same group? So it's it's just a shame. It's never going to stop. And the Democrats are now attacking the American people because they don't think they're intelligent enough to vote. Jackie from Minnesota texts in, why didn't the House use the time after Christmas to get additional witnesses? I say no, they should have done their homework before coming to school. Speaker Pelosi addressed the trial in her press conference today. Here's a little bit of it. When this is over, do you think that President Trump will be chastened and understand that he's got a Congress watching him? Or will he be emboldened because the Senate will have acquitted him? Well, he will not be acquitted. You cannot be acquitted if you don't have a trial. And you don't have a trial if you don't have witnesses and documentation and, and that. I would hope that the, the senators, if it comes to a tie, or if there's a question of hearing testimony or doc receiving documents, would leave it up to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, Republican appointed uh, in a Republican majority court, I would think that they would have confidence in the Chief Justice of the United States. That's his, really his title. And that's interesting to me that they're afraid of breaking a tie with the uh, Chief Justice of the United States. Does the president know right from wrong? I don't think so. And Senator Tim Kaine, Democrat of Virginia, tweets out that if the Senate acquits the president on Article 2 after he violated both the Impoundment Control Act and the Whistleblower Act to hide the Ukraine scheme from Congress, what is to stop President Trump from complete refusal to cooperate with Congress on any matter? Next call is Maria out in Mancos, Colorado. Maria, please go ahead. Would, have you learned anything today? Oh, yeah. Well, I, 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 I've got too much to say about it, but I, my, I want to thank you for the time. I, um, and it's Marja from Mancos. Um, I, I wanted to say that um, the, uh, there's a lot of complaining going on about the repetition that is happening. And, you know, there's a lot of us that work two or three jobs a day, you know, and we don't, we don't have the luxury of being able to watch the live proceedings and to play catch up takes a lot of time. So I'm telling you, I am so, I feel so fortunate for this repetition that's going on because I mean, there's, there's a lot of us that work like this. And so to, to hear people say, Oh, they want to push this through and get done with this. Well, yeah, everybody wants to be, wants to see it over with, but we want to, we want to make sure that we're not pushing something, especially for a football game, but that we don't want to be pushing something when it's so, I mean, this is a trial. Our president is being eaten alive, and we need witnesses because we we really kind of have to make it be a real trial. And so what what the timing is? You know, take a break, go watch your football game, and come back and let's continue. I really. Christy, Atlantic Beach, Florida, you're on. Hi. Um... First, I want to say I think the president's lawyers are absolutely euthanizing the democratic sham of an impeachment. In what and, way, and Christy? Can you give an example? Because they keep going back to the same point. They keep using their own witnesses because the Democrats did not share all the testimony. They took bits and pieces of it, and they've taken their own witnesses and turned it right back on them. Not only that, um, Professor Dershowitz explained that at length, at length, the constitutional grounds for impeachment. 
But that's not why I call. Right. However, I am I'm questioning why the neither the uh, president's uh, attorneys have brought up the 1998 treaty with Ukraine to prosecute root out and prosecute corruption or crime per se signed by President Bill Clinton. Why hasn't that been brought into play? Because in essence, he is rooting out crime, corruption. Because if they did it before, they'll do it before. They, I mean, it's it's naive at at best and <laughs> stupid at worst to think just because President Zelensky was elected that he waved a magic wand and all the corruption in Ukraine went away. Christy, you've been that following this process pretty closely the last week. I've been following it for the last three years. And I've, I've followed every bit of the Democratic antics, you know, every every little thing, every little thing. Kevin, West Jordan, Utah, good evening to you. How are you doing? Thank you for the time. I have a quick couple of points to make. Um, I feel the House managers are not answering the questions that they're being asked. Uh, Representative Jeffries and specifically Representative Lundgren avoided the question about bipartisan vote for Nixon and Clinton. She cared to give her opinions rather than give the numbers that were asked of her. Uh, that was done by the president's counsel. Um, another point is the Democrats have had their chance. They had opportunity to call witnesses. They didn't follow procedure. And so the president's counsel is refusing to uh, acquiesce to them in the Senate portion of this. And uh, prevent the senators from having to do the Democrats, uh, d the, the Democratic side's job for them that they should have done, like was done in the Nixon trial and like was done in the Clinton trial. They went through the time to do the correct process, to get the witnesses called, to get the testimony, and they keep pounding that. They just keep pounding and pounding and pounding, not answering questions correctly, and name-calling. Schiff is just absolutely name-calling everyone. I think also, finally, to conclude, our processes need to be updated. We need clear and definitive processes for the House process and for the Senate process. It needs to be updated. The framers didn't intend for this to be uh, the same forever. And I think times have changed, and so uh, do, uh, does the need for the processes. So how would you change that process, Kevin? Well, that would need to be hearings that would need to be uh, processed uh, questions asked and answered debates uh, in both the Senate and the House to bring those into more current standards with the times. I mean, it, it, two, three, four hundred years later, we're still going to go back and, and we're going to operate by the same laws that were done two, three, four hundred years ago. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And what's happening here is the House managers didn't do their process correctly. And now the senators don't want to acquiesce and call any witnesses because of that. So it becomes simply a basic argument at this point. Your, uh, your uh, Senator Romney has been quite out front um, as uh, being somebody who is undecided on how he's going to vote. Well, and I have to be honest with you, I'm on the fence as well, but I do see the Democrats simply, or the House managers in this case, simply name-calling and just simply pounding witnesses and documents. All right, thank you, sir. Skip. Hardyville, South Carolina. Skip, 148 questions have been asked over the last two days of the House impeachment managers and the Trump defense team. Have you heard a question, A, that you liked, and B, do you have a question that hasn't been asked yet? Well, the only question I li I've liked so far is when they brought up the issue of foreign policy and who makes foreign policy. I would like to ask the, uh, the House managers the, the question, please bring to the dais the, the book, the Bible, whatever you want to call it, that, that has all of the written down foreign policies of the United States. You know what? There isn't one. It belongs to the president. If they don't like the foreign policy that the president decides to, uh, uh, to use, then you know what? They need to find a job. Get a real job. Get out of government. They don't belong there. Mo, St. Paul, Minnesota. Good evening, Mo. Good evening, sir. You're on the air. Um, I just would like to honestly know how come the trial went from being tried for a crime to what if we committed to crime and nothing should come of it. 
that's only my only question. Could you um, explain what you mean by that question? Well, it sounds like the senators and the House Republicans came to trial saying that the president did not make any wrongs. And so in the last 24 hours, since Alan Dershowitz made the saying, saying that even if he committed, it's still not a crime. It sounds like we're running with that talking point right now. And we're saying that even if the crime happened, it's still not a crime. Mo, have you been following this process pretty closely? I have been. What have you learned? I have learned exactly that we are saying that something did not happen. And now we say that even if it happened, nothing should come of it. And as of right now, what I'm honestly seeing is that we are literally fighting for the separation of powers, as in if this goes through as it is, then from here on forward, it sounds like any president should be able to invite any information that they would require of any other party. It could be private. Even. It could even be like a private company to inquire them information that would move their agenda forward. Mo, what do and, you do up in St. Paul? Huh? What do you do up in St. Paul? What do I do up in St. Paul? Work for public policy. And where are you from originally? St. Paul. Thank you, sir. Jeff is next, and Jeff is in Somerset, Kentucky. Hi, Jeff. Hi. I don't, don't really have a question except the House sped up the process for the impeachment, and then they wasted 33 days. You know, why didn't they use that 33 days to continue the process of getting more witnesses? I mean, 17 witnesses is... Sounds pretty good to me, but they had 33 more days they could have used to improve their case. And so I'm not really for extending this anymore because they had every opportunity to spend time to better their case. And, and to me, it really doesn't look like they have much of one. Well, the president in very shortly will be live on C-SPAN up in Des Moines. He's at a rally up there that begins at 715. So if you want to tune over there or you can stick with us, we're going to be listening to your reaction and then going back to the Senate as they conclude their last three hours or so of question time. Tracy is in San Diego and Tracy, you're on C-SPAN 2. What have you learned, Tracy, over the last week if you've been paying attention? Um, what I've learned is I've, what I learned is that as Americans, <laughs> something is happening that I think if we get outside of our bubbles, we could see uh, uh, what is really going on. And it's not about Democrat or Republican. It's about Americans. What do you think so far of the trial process? Um, it's different. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I don't know of one where you don't have, um, uh, witnesses in a trial, uh, not in investigations, but in a trial. Uh, so it's, it's different. All right, Tracy, thanks for calling in. Next up is Harry in Blackwood, New Jersey. Harry, what's a question you'd like to see asked? Well, uh, what I'd really like to see is, did anybody ask uh, Zelensky why he lied? Because from what I've been understanding, they don't believe Trump. They said that Trump did all this. Well, why don't they ask Zelensky? Why did he say everything was okay and there was no pressure? Why? Why did he lie? Because it seems like they're calling him a liar. That's what I'd like to find out. That's all. Jeannie from Indiana, text. I would like my Senators Braun and Young to ask if there was a national security issue that was so overwhelmingly important for the House to move quickly on the articles of impeachment 
Why were they held for so long before sending them over to the Senate? Up next is Paula out in Glendora, California. Good evening, Paula. Good evening. What's your comment or question? Um, what I'd like to stress is that I've been in the business world for quite some time, retired now, and I've always wanted a president that knew and was involved with business and not politics. And we have achieved that. There is so many, I find so many Americans in California that were staunch Democrats and have switched over to Trump. And Why do you think that done, is? Why do you think that is? Uh, because he's done so many good things, what he promised. And most of these politicians that they make all these promises to get into office, and then it's all political. They have to bow down to Pelosi or what the Democrats wish. And um, it, it, the American people are tired of it. They are done and so filled up that Californians can no longer support, unfortunately, the, the, the four families that rule California. Ron is in Oregon. Ron, what's the name of your town? The Dells. The Dells. Where is yes, that? Sir. Where is that located? It is in the beautiful Columbia Gorge on the border between Oregon and Washington. Thank you, sir. So what, what's the question you'd like to have heard asked so far? Well, I really don't have a question like to heard asked like it's been said over and over. It has gotten repetitive, which, again, like a previous caller said, I'm thankful for because I work for a living, and it's hard to keep up with. I really just had a comment about witnesses. Okay. And that's, you know, call, Bol call Bolton. I mean, I've heard Republicans scream and scream and scream about how they didn't have any witnesses who were in the room with the president. Well, now Bolton's raised his hand and said, hey, I was there. It seems like the perfect guy to call to me if I was – sitting on a jury in a criminal trial, I certainly want to hear from the guy who was in the room, regardless of at what point in the process it came. So I just think they should call Bolton, at least Bolton. Ron, in your limited viewing of this process, who do you think has been effective? Honestly, I think the House managers have done a great job of laying out their case on both articles of impeachment, the, both the obstruction and the uh, abuse of power. And I've honestly found uh, President's counsel's arguments really, really weak. Uh, especially when uh, Professor Dershowitz essentially said, as long as the president does something and it's in the interest of his own reelection, that that's somehow in the interest of the nation. And that means it's not an abuse of power. I'm sorry, I just don't understand the logic there. And I can't fathom how anyone could. Jordan Carney of The Hill Publication tweets out that Senator Thune, Republican, suggests instead of going into closed session, there's interest among senators to effectively go back into normal Senate business so senators could explain their votes and decisions on the floor. James in Webster, Texas. Hi, James. Hi. Thank you for having me. What have you learned over this last week? Well, that's a bit of a loaded question uh, to have to tell you in such a short time. Um, what I would like to do is answer your question, which was what kind of question would we like to uh, hear? And okay. something that I've been thinking over for a couple of days now is, you know, Trump's made it very clear he's not a fan of aid uh, to the foreign countries. And, you know, him uncovering corruption – it's just a coincidence, in a lot of our opinions, that it happens to be the Bidens. Trump could care less who it would have been. Uh, he would have uncovered it regardless. And just like they said last night, it doesn't matter if it would have been the first term or the second term. But coincidentally, again, since it's the first term, 
the Democrats are playing on the idea that it was for election meddling. So my, my question that I'd like to hear is <clears throat> when he refused the aid to Puerto Rico after the storm or hurricane, rather, due to the corruption, which no one believed in the media, made him out to be you know, racist, which was just further tarnishing his name. Um, now we're finding out there's warehouses full of supplies and things of that nature, only proving that he was right. But nobody accused him of election meddling in that case. Is it because there was no current politician attached to it? So I'd like to hear uh, if somebody could spin that a little better or bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it together better than what I'm doing. Bring a correlation to the two, saying it, it, it doesn't matter. He's uncovering corruption regardless of who you are. It's the Democrats that's just trying to play uh, on on their fact, or they would like it to be a fact again that he's election meddling when that's not the case. Alexander Marquardt with CNN tweets out that Jennifer Williams, Vice President Pence's Europe Russia advisor who testified in the Ukraine hearings, is leaving the Veep's office. A White House official tells her or tells him. She's leaving early. Her detail was supposed to end in two months. Jay, Studio City, California, good evening. Good evening. Thanks for having me. I just wanted to say that it feels like we as a country are standing on the precipice of a really historic moment where we're deciding as citizens whether or not our president is going to be accountable to his checks and balances of power or if he's not. We're standing on, uh, on something that is bigger than even this corruption uh, impeachment my big question is, if the Republicans are so interested in hearing from a whistleblower, the previous whistleblower, why aren't they so interested in hearing from Bolton, who's a current whistleblower? And I think uh, altogether, it's pretty clear that if the Republicans felt confident in the fact that they had a good case, they would have no problem bringing in witnesses who would exonerate the president. But clearly, they're terrified. It's evident to anybody who watches this that they are terrified to hear what the people who are sitting in the room with the president or thinking and seeing and feeling. And that's just, that's evident to me. Jay, have you spent a lot of time this week watching? Oh, way too much. <laughs> what kind of work do you do? Uh, I work in service. I work in uh, a customer service. And so you've had some free time to watch or do you watch on a tape delayed basis or? You guys do a great job of providing that to the, uh, to the nation. So I've been listening to it on the radio. Radio on NPR and on the on uh, on streaming on your YouTube channel has been wonderful, and I just implore and remind that you know all of our Americans to vote in November, because had we not voted and had the House not taken back or the Democrats not taken back the House, we would not have found out about any of the illegality that our administration has been partaking in. You'd be ignorant and you'd have no idea. So be thankful that you all vote, and let's do it again. Jay, can you discuss with your friends and colleagues politics out? in Studio City? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I have friends, you know, it's, it's here in Los Angeles, but I have friends who are Republicans, I have friends who are Democrats. We speak openly, but the fact of the matter is Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever you ascribe yourself to, we are on a historic precipice as a nation where we have to hold the president accountable. He is not above the law, and we have to stand up together as a democracy and say no more. Nima. Wharton, New Jersey. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Hi. Um, it's, it's not so much um, about questioning. Um, I do have a few points that I wanted to uh, address. Uh, one of the things is that point number one is that um, I don't think the Democrat ever liked President Trump because he's not one of the established uh, person from Washington, D.C., or, or any, any state to that matter. He's a uh, he's, uh, Freshman that has no um, much, not much of a uh, impl um, politics uh, background, but he's doing a great job. Um, I don't know if people, Democrat may not um, agree with this, but in terms of unemployment, um, tax cut, uh, uh, all of these things are positive thing is uh, happening right now, um, and that everybody sees that that impacted my own personal life. The other thing is that. <clears throat> As a president, or, or the head of the head of the country, or head of the household, have every right to make sure that your the aid that you are giving to somebody is utilized properly, and that that's his responsibility, that is his duty. So I don't think that because of um, he held the uh, aid for 
let's say over a month or let's say two months, I don't think anybody got killed because of that in, in Ukraine. Um, so I have been watching on and off. Um, I'm in the IT field. I do computer work, um, and I have a the chance to view on my phones and whatnot. I try to watch as much as possible. Um, so the the it is absolutely a shame that if you if we are going to disagree this in our country, what is the whole world think about us? Uh, we are the strongest nation in the world. Um, if we if we decided to bring the president down or any president down to that matter with this uh, with this um, issue uh, it's going to be it's going to set really bad precedents to to, uh, to to the other countries and, and any all right president Nima, let's leave it there and hear from Donna out in Round Rock Texas Donna 148 questions have been asked did you get uh, out of those 148 how many have you watched and and was your question asked Oh, yes, I have watched all of them for days now, and I've watched this process since its inception, and um, uh, I'll open my question to you and the public right now. In, as what I would consider myself to be an intelligent adult, why has the question of nepotism come up regarding the Bidens? I think that that is something that most people, most general people, just believe that this type of situation should never go on in any environment, uh, from any from the everyday worker to politicians. So, in answer to that, I have to say I've not heard that word come up ever uh, during any conversations. And then I just I won't take a whole lot of your time, and I do thank you for taking my call is that um, I felt that having watched this process from the get-go, that it's been very impartial and that I think that, um, you know, as professionals and as paid politicians, which my income and my husband, who who is a disabled vet, you know, he puts in money to the system every day because he works. I per currently am just a homemaker, but... Um, you know, I think that the two questions you need to be asked, you know, is is why does that not matter that they are consuming our tax dollars over this, where they have since 2016, you know, had the mission to impeach this president? Donna, have you always followed politics closely, or is this uh, impeachment process grabbed you a little more strongly? I have followed politics, um, and I have to be honest with you. I'm a firm Republican and have been that way since, you know, I was of legal age to vote. And this one just really, I think that, um, you know, has been unfair. And I think that there are rules and policies put in place you know, that are laws that the House did not, you know, live up to their obligations to. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Let's hear from Jim out in Milton, Washington. Jim, what have you learned so far? Why? Well, I, I think I've learned quite a bit. Um, and it, one of the things that's most striking to me is that the Democrats stay Democrats and the Republicans stay Republicans, and it makes no difference um, whether they're in the House or in the Senate. I did have a comment, and then I did have, also have a question. Yes, sir. My comment would be that in the beginning, <clears throat> when the whistleblower came forward to, I believe, Adam Schiff, the, the question was leveled. President Trump released the transcript of the call, which plainly states that he is looking for the Ukraine to look into corruption. He does mention uh, Vice President Biden in that Vice, Vice President Biden uh, stopped what he thought was a legit, legitimate investigation into corruption. OK, and since then, the Democrats have changed that to say 
President Trump is trying to investigate Biden as a political adversary. And so I, I think things are very wrong there. And my question would be this, the Democrats have already uh, impeached our president. They have held hearings, some fair, some not. And they've impeached him. They have evidence. They have presented 17 witnesses to the Senate. I think the senators should just sit down and vote on what they've been given. There is no need for more evidence. It's already been done. He's impeached. All right. That's Jim out in Milton, Washington. Appreciate your time this evening. Mitch McConnell walking back onto the Senate floor, which means that momentarily the Senate will be going back into session and finishing up the two hours and 53 minutes of question time that the senators have left to ask the impeachment managers and the Trump defense team. When that happens, we're going to go back directly. We don't control the cameras in the Senate or the audio, so it might be a little abrupt here. Goose, you're going to have to talk fast. Goose is in Yukon, Oklahoma. Hi, Goose. Hey, how are you doing? How are you? I'm doing great. Say, I want to give a shout out to our fellow American up in the state of Washington. I believe you said Milton. Uh, I'd like to concur exactly what he said. It's really odd to me as just a regular working guy, regular American, to see the whole left side just tumble and, and topple our president that left his own comfort zone to fight for every one of us Americans and for them to be beaten on him for three years and him still holding his head high, I think it's just absolutely absurd. And when he said he was going to drain the swamp, well, he's he's got the swamp right now looking at him. When Schiff gets back up. Goose, have you contacted your senators Lankford and Inhofe about this uh, process? You know it. You know it. Us Oklahomans, we don't sit back. Where'd you get the nickname Goose? It comes from uh, a long line of uh, military. Thank you, sir, for your time. Danny, Rochester, New York. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I'm from New York, so I'll make it quick. A couple of things. One thing APC pointed out about Trump being willing to listen to what's being said by a foreign person. What they cut off there is he also said, I have to know what they're saying in order to know whether to report it to the FBI. Secondly, when it comes to Biden, he is specifically talking about Burisma and the quid pro quo of getting the person fired. It had nothing to do with him being a political opponent. Because right now he isn't even a political opponent. He's just one of a possibility of political opponents. Lastly, Trump is the best. I've been watching him for years. I've been supporting him for years. And he's got my vote in 2020. From Rockland, Maine, I believe it's Shlomit. Texts in, could someone ask the president's counsel to define transcript? Because I'm pretty sure we still haven't seen that. Let's see if we can get Kathy in Kirtaline, Idaho in here. Kathy, go ahead. Right now, I am concerned about all the money they're wasting of our taxpayers' dollars. When having watched this through, I don't think the House of Representatives was fair or did their job. Thank you, ma'am. Manu Raju of CNN tweets out that key swing vote, Lamar Alexander, told me he's going to announce his decision on witnesses tonight, a decision that will make clear whether the Senate trial will come to a swift conclusion or if it will lead to a new phase over witnesses and documents. Lee, Dundalk, Maryland, you are on C-SPAN 2. Go ahead, Lee. Well, thank you for taking my call, sir. Um, from the beginning to now, only thing that Democrats have been wanting to do is to impeach our president, who has done so much for us. I've been watching this, if you will, for three years. I watched the whole um, trial when they had it in the um, House, and uh, it wasn't a fair 
it wasn't fair for Republicans whatsoever. So uh, I hope they make it fair here and hope all the Republicans stick together to let them know how strong our president is and how special he is for the United States. Steve in Pelham, Alabama asked the question, if the House can do an impart, uh, a partisan impeachment, why can't the Senate do a partisan acquittal? Cindy, Blanchard, Oklahoma, I'm gonna try to get you in as well. Cindy, go ahead. Hello, um, my question is, why don't the House um, managers answer the question specifically instead of going back and just reiterating the same thing that they were speaking um, in their opening arguments. It seems to me that the Republicans, the, um, the president's um, counsel is answering the questions that are put to them to the best of their ability, but the House managers continue to just say over and over their talking points that they had during the um, opening statements. And that was my question is, why won't they answer the questions directly? Cindy, on both sides of the uh, uh, issue, who do you think's been effective? Is there anybody that's um, really I, stood out for you? Well, what stood out to me is that the uh, White House counsel seems to answer the questions to the best of their ability, and it seems that the House managers just continue to, um, once again, put back out whatever they've already said in their opening statement. Has, They're not answering many of the questions directly. Has anything in the last three or four days changed your mind or you said, huh, that, that's a different way of looking at that issue? Uh, not really. I've watched it from the beginning and um, I've watched Schiff lie repeatedly. And so I'm really struggling to listen to him whenever he gets up to the microphone to speak. Thank you for your time this evening. Dale, out in Olympia, Washington. Go ahead, Dale. Yes, thanks for taking my call. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that the constitutional republic is based on justice. And every American citizen has the right to face their accuser. When I look at the whole process that has uh, unfolded, it's very obvious that the president of the United States hasn't had that opportunity. Um, he has not been able to face his accuser. There was poor due process in the, the entire House um, process. And as far as I'm concerned, they should be dead on their night in the Senate. Kathleen, Valdosta, Georgia. Kathleen, out of the 148 questions that have been asked over the last two days, have you heard one that resonated with you? I have one that I would actually like to ask of both sides to answer. And my question is this. If abuse of power, and Ed, Kathleen, if you can hang on, the Senate is back in session. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Iowa. I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senators McConnell, Hoven, and Wicker. Thank you. The question from Senator Grassley and the other senators is addressed to counsel for the president. During President Clinton's impeachment trial, he argued that, quote, no civil officer, no president, no judge, no cabinet member has ever been impeached by so narrow a margin and that the closeness and partisan division of the vote reflected the constitutionally dubious nature of the charges against him, end quote. President Trump has raised similar concerns during these proceedings and argues that the lack of bipartisan consensus highlights the partisan nature of the charges. Are the president's concerns well-founded? Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for that question. I think the concerns are very well-founded. I think that they are concerns that echo back to our founding when Alexander Hamilton warned in Federalist Number 65 precisely against partisan impeachments. A partisan impeachment is one of the greatest dangers that the framers saw in the impeachment power. And in Federalist Number 65, Hamilton specifically said that impeachments could become 
persecution by an intemperate or designing majority in the House. <clears throat> excuse me, in the House of Representatives. And, and that is what we have in this case. In fact, there was bipartisan opposition to the articles of impeachment here in the House. So this is one of the, it is the most divisive sort of uh, an impeachment that could be brought here. And it reflects very poorly on the process that was run in the House which did not have bipartisan support, and the charges that were ultimately adopted in the House. Because it is a purely partisan impeachment. And I think that that's important to bear in mind also that the House managers themselves and some of the members of this chamber at the time of the Clinton impeachment warned very eloquently against partisan impeachments. They recognized that a partisan impeachment would not be valid that it would do grave damage to our political community, to our polity, to the country. It would create deep divisions that would last for years. And in the Clinton impeachment, they made those warnings when it was not even arising in the context of an election year. Now we have a partisan impeachment, as we pointed out, when there's an election only nine months away. And it will be perceived, and is perceived by many in the country, as simply an attempt to interfere with the election and to prevent the voters from having their choice of who they want to be president for the next four years. And the House managers have said, we can't allow the voters to decide because we can't be sure it will be a fair election. That, that can't be the way we approach democracy in the United States. We have to respect the ability of, of the voters to take in information, because all the information is out now, They've had plenty of their opportunity with the, the process that they ran in the House to make all of the information public that they want and to be able to make their accusations against the president. We think they've been disproved and the voters should be able to decide. And the most important thing, the greatest danger from this partisan impeachment, I believe is the one that Minority Leader Schumer warned about back in 1998 which is that once we start down the road of purely partisan impeachments, once we start to normalize that process and make it all right to have a purely partisan impeachment, especially in an election year, then we just turn impeachment into a partisan political tool and it will be used again and again and again and more frequently and more frequently. And that's not a process, that is not a future for the country that this chamber should accept. Instead, this chamber should put an end to the growing pattern towards partisan impeachments in this country, put an end to that practice, and definitively make clear that a purely partisan impeachment, not based on adequate charges, not based on charges that meet the constitutional standard, will not get any consideration in this chamber and will be rejected. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Senator from Maryland. Mr. Chief Justice, on behalf of myself and Senator Klobuchar, I send a question to the desk directed to both parties. Thank you. The question from Senator Van Hollen uh, is to both parties. The President's counsel will go first. In his response to an earlier question this evening, Mr. Seculo cited individuals like the Bidens as being, quote, not irrelevant to our case, end quote. Are you opposed to having the Chief Justice make the initial determinations regarding the relevance of documents and witnesses? particularly as the Senate could disagree with the Chief Justice's ruling by a majority vote. The President's counsel first. Mr. Chief Justice, again, to make our position clear, we think constitutionally that would not be the appropriate way to go. We're, it's, again, no disrespect to the Chief Justice at all, who's presiding here as the presiding officer. But our view is that if there are issues that have to be resolved 
on constitutional matters that it should be done in the appropriate way. You have Senate rules that govern that as to what you would do. And then there's, you know, if litigation were to be necessary for a particular issue, that would have to be looked at. But this idea that we can short circuit the system, which is what they've been doing for three months, is not something we're willing uh, to go with. I'm, I've said that, I said it all day yesterday, and, and no, again, no disrespect to the Senator's question, but we're just, that's not a position that we will accept um, as, as far as moving these proceedings forward. Thank you. The Senator's uh, counsel for the President says that would not be constitutionally appropriate. Why not? Where is it prohibited in the Constitution that in an impeachment trial, upon the agreement of the parties, the Chief Justice cannot resolve issues of the materiality of witnesses? Of course, that is permitted by the Constitution. Um, now, counsel earlier said that the House managers want to decide on which witnesses the President should be able to call. Uh, we want them to call our witnesses. Well, you would think that Mick Mulvaney, the White House Chief of Staff, would be their witness if indeed he supports what the President is claiming, if indeed he is willing to say under oath what he's willing to say in a press statement. You would think he would be their witness. But I'm not saying that we get to decide. That's not the proposal here. The proposal is we take a week, the Senate goes about its business, we do depositions. The witnesses are not witnesses uh, on the President's behalf that we get a decision on as House managers, but rather that we entrust the Chief Justice of the United States to make a fair and impartial decision as to whether a witness is material or not, whether a witness has relevant facts or not, or whether a witness is simply being brought before this body for the purposes of retribution in the case of the whistleblower, or to smear the Bidens without material purpose relevant to these proceedings, we're not asking that you accept our judgment on that. We're proposing that the Chief Justice make that decision. And I think the reason, of course, they don't want the Chief Justice to make that decision, as I indicated the other night, is not because they don't trust the Chief Justice to be fair. It's because they fear the Chief Justice will be fair. Um, and I think that tells you everything you need to know about the lack of good faith when it comes to the arguments they make about why they went to court, why they refused to um, comply with any subpoenas, why they refused to provide any documents, why they're here before you saying that the House managers must sue to get witnesses and they're in court on the same day saying you can't sue to get witnesses. And this is why they don't want the Chief Justice to make that decision because they know the witnesses they're requesting are for purposes of retribution or distraction. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I sent a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senator Cruz. Thank you. Question from Senators Tillis and Cruz is for the House managers. <clears throat> you have based your case on the proposition that it was utterly baseless and a sham to ask for an investigation into possible corruption of Burisma and the Bidens. Chris Hines, the stepson of then Secretary of State John Kerry, emailed Kerry's chief of staff that, quote, apparently Devin and Hunter both joined the board of Burisma and a press release went out today. I can't speak to why they decided to, but there was no investment by <coughs> our firm in their company. <coughs> Hines subsequently terminated his business relationship with Devin Archer and Hunter Biden because, quote, working with Burisma is unacceptable, end quote, and showed a, quote, lack of judgment, end quote. Do you agree with Chris Hines that working with Burisma was unacceptable? Did John Kerry or Joe Biden agree with Chris Hines? If not, why not? Justice, the reason why uh, Joe Biden is not material to these proceedings, the reason why this is a baseless smear, 
is that the issue is not whether Hunter Biden should have sat on that board or not sat on that board. The issue is not whether Hunter Biden was properly compensated or improperly compensated or whether he speaks Ukrainian or he doesn't speak Ukrainian. What the president asked for was an investigation of Joe Biden. And the smear against Joe Biden is that he sought to fire a prosecutor because he was trying to protect his son. I guess that's the nature of the allegation. And that is a baseless smear. As we demonstrated, as the unequivocal testimony in the House demonstrated, when the vice president sought the dismissal of a corrupt and incompetent prosecutor, it had nothing to do with Hunter Biden's position on the board. It had everything to do with the fact that the State Department, our allies, the International Monetary Fund, were in unanimous agreement that this prosecutor was corrupt. And the uncontradicted testimony was also that in getting rid of that prosecutor, it would increase the chances of real corruption prosecutions going forward, not that it would decrease them. So the sham is this. The sham is that Joe Biden did something wrong when he followed United States policy, when he did what he was asked to do by our European allies, when he did what was, he was asked to do by international financial institutions. And the other sham is the Russian propaganda sham that this crowd strike kooky conspiracy theory, that the Ukrainians, not the Russians, hacked the DNC, and that someone whisked the server away to Ukraine to hide it. That is Russian intelligence propaganda. And yes, it's a sham. And it's worse than a sham. It's a Russian propaganda coup is what it is. Thank God, Putin says that they're not talking about Russian interference anymore, they're talking about Ukrainian interference. Now, counsel says, well, isn't it possible that two countries interfered? But you heard what our own director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, said. There is no evidence of Ukrainian interference in our election. There is no evidence. So yes, I think we can cite the FBI director for the proposition that that's a sham. And that's why, that's why we referred to it as such. But at the end of the day, what this is all about is the president using the power of his office, abusing the power of that office, to engage in soliciting investigations and actually just the announcement of them. If the president thought there was so much merit there, then why was it that he just needed their announcement? And what's more, as counsel just conceded before the break, Rudy Giuliani was not pursuing the policy of the United States. Okay, if it wasn't the policy of the United States, then what was it? If it wasn't the policy to pursue an investigation of the Bidens, then what was it? It was a domestic political errand is what it was. Mr. Chief Thank Justice. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Senator from Oregon. Mr. Chief Justice, on behalf of Senator Menendez, Senator Brown, and myself, I send a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. Senators Wyden, Menendez, and Brown ask the House managers. The President's counsel has argued that the President's actions are based on his desire to root out corruption. However, new reporting indicates that Attorney General Barr and former National Security Advisor Bolton shared concerns that the President was granting personal favors to autocratic foreign leaders like President Erojan of Turkey. The President has also acknowledged his private business interests in the country, like Trump Tower's Istanbul. The Treasury Department has not denied that the President directed Treasury and the Department of Justice to intervene in the criminal investigation of Halk Bank, the Turkish state-owned bank, which has been accused of a scheme to evade Iranian sanctions. Has the President engaged in a pattern of conduct in which he places his personal and political interests above the national security interests of the United States? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and also want to thank 
uh, the senators again for your hospitality and for listening uh, to both sides as we've endeavored to answer your questions. Thank you for that uh, question. I think, first and foremost, there has been a troubling pattern of possible conflicts of interest that we've seen from the beginning of this administration through this moment. But the allegation here related to the abuse of power charge is that in this specific instance, the president tried to cheat by soliciting foreign interference in an American election by trying to gin up phony investigations against a political opponent. Now, what counsel for the president has said is that what the president was really interested in is corruption, that he, he's an anti-corruption crusader. For you to believe the president's narrative, you have to conclude that he's an anti-corruption crusader. Perhaps his domestic record is part of what senators can reasonably consider, but let's look at the facts of the central charge here. The president had two calls with President Zelensky on April 21st and on July 25th. In both instances, he did not mention the word corruption once. Release the transcripts, the word corruption was not mentioned by Donald Trump once. We also know that in May of last year, President Trump's own Department of Just Defense indicated that the new Ukrainian government had met all necessary preconditions for the receipt of the military aid, including the implementation of anti-corruption reforms. That's President Trump's Department of Defense saying there is no corruption concern as it relates to the release of the aid. Now, I think we can all acknowledge, as the President's counsel indicated, that there was a general corruption challenge with Ukraine. I think the exact quote from Mr. Popora was, since the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has suffered from one of the worst environments for corruption in the world. Certainly, I believe that that's the case, but here's the key question. Why did President Trump wait until 2019 to pretend as if he wanted to do something about corruption? Let's explore. Did Ukraine have a corruption problem in 2017? Generally, the answer is yes. Did President Trump dislike foreign aid in 2017? The answer is yes. What did President Trump do about these alleged concerns in 2017? The answer is nothing. Under the same exact conditions that the president now claims motivated him to seek a phony political investigation against the Bidens and place a hold on the money, the president did nothing. He did not seek an investigation into the Bidens in 2017. He did not put a hold on the aid in 2017, but the Trump administration oversaw $560 million in military and security aid to Ukraine in 2017. In 2018, the same conditions existed if President Trump is truly an anti-corruption crusader. But what happened in 2018? He didn't seek an investigation into the Bidens. He didn't put a hold on the aid. Rather, the Trump administration oversaw $620 million in military and security aid to Ukraine. Which brings us to this moment. Why the sudden interest in Burisma, in the Bidens, and alleged corruption concerns about Ukraine. What changed in 2019? What changed is that Joe Biden announced his candidacy. The president was concerned with that candidacy. Polls had him losing to the former vice president, and he was determined to stop Joe Biden by trying to cheat in the election, smear him, solicit foreign interference, in 2020. 
That is an abuse of power. That is corrupt. Thank that you, Mr. Manager. Wrong. The Senator from Maine. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senator Rubio, and Senator Risch. Thank you. The question from Senators Collins, Rubio, and Risch is addressed to the House managers. The House of Representatives withdrew its subpoena to compel Charles Kupperman's testimony. Why did the House withdraw the Kupperman subpoena? Why didn't the House pursue its legal remedies to enforce its subpoenas? Senators, I thank you for the question. When we, our practice uh, in the House was to invite witnesses to come voluntarily uh, if they refused to give them a subpoena. In the case of Dr. Kupperman, he refused to come in voluntarily and we subpoenaed him. Almost instantly upon receipt of the subpoena, a lengthy complaint was filed in court where he sought to challenge that subpoena. Interestingly, and contrary to I think what you're hearing from the President's Council here today, the House took the position that a witness cannot challenge, does not have standing to challenge a congressional subpoena. We were joined, by the way, in that position by the Justice Department, which also said that, the, uh, that Dr. Kupperman didn't have jurisdiction to challenge or get a declaratory judgment as to the validity of a subpoena. So in that litigation, we were uh, often on the same page as the Justice Department. But more meaningful to us is we were simply not going to engage in a years-long process of delay to get the answers that we needed. Uh, and we proposed to Dr. Kupperman's counsel that if, as you claim, this is really about just wanting to get court blessing, there's a willingness to come forward, but we just want to make sure that we're, it's appropriate that we do so. If you're sincere about that, there's already a case that's been filed, the McGann case, that is about to be decided. Uh, let's agree to be bound by what conclusion Judge Jackson reaches in that case. And their answer was no. Uh, and indeed, that opinion would come out shortly thereafter. That opinion said this claim of absolute immunity is absolute nonsense. Um, and there's no precedent for it in the 250 years of jurisprudence on this subject. So we went back to Dr. Kupperman, and of course, Dr. Kupperman said, um, no, we'd like to get our own judicial opinion. Now, had we gone to fruition, even though we don't believe, and it would have created a bad precedent that they have standing to challenge subpoenas that way, had they lost, they would have gone to the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. They would have come back to the district court and now no longer arguing absolute immunity because that would have been, we believe, defeated. They would make claims of executive privilege, and they would litigate those up through the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. We knew that course because we're in it with Don McGahn. Nine months after he was subpoenaed, we're still litigating it. Uh, and they're in court saying Congress shouldn't do what they're saying that we should do before this body. Uh, so that's why we withdrew the subpoena. We were not going to go through that exercise. Um, now, you have to ask the question, I think, why did Fiona Hill feel that she could come and testify? Um, she worked for Dr. Kupperman. Why was she willing to show the courage to come and testify when her boss wasn't? There's not a good answer to that question. Um, but I'm awfully glad that she did. Because without her, we would be that much less knowledgeable about this president's scheme. Um, so that was the history of the Kupperman subpoena. Um, likewise, John Bolton, who has the same counsel, um, told us if we subpoenaed him, he would sue. Now, why is it that he is willing to testify now and he wasn't willing to testify before the House? You should ask him that question. But that was the predicament we faced. And in our view, a president should not be able to defeat an investigation into his wrongdoing by endlessly litigating the matter in court, particularly when they're in court saying, you can't use the court to enforce your subpoenas. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from Hawaii. I send a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you.
The question from Senator Hirono is for the House managers. Can you talk about what has happened to whistleblowers when they have been outed against their will? What are the consequences of revealing their identity, particularly when we have a president who has tried to bully and threaten impeachment witnesses? Senator, I don't know that we can give you examples of whistleblowers who were the subject of retaliation, although I have no doubt that there are many. Uh, we can seek by the latter part of this evening to get a list of some of the whistleblowers that have confronted retaliation. But I, I, this does give me an opportunity to speak a little more fuls in a more fulsome way about a point I made earlier about the unique importance of whistleblowers in the intelligence community. Our area of intelligence is unique in this respect. If you're a whistleblower who wants to blow the whistle on a fraudulent contract in a transportation project, you can go public. If you're blowing the whistle on misconduct in the area of housing, you can go public. You can have a press conference and you can declare the wrongdoing that you have seen. If you're a whistleblower in the intelligence community, however, you cannot go public. You have no recourse to bring to the public's attention wrongdoing except one of really two vehicles. You can go to an intelligence committee or you can go to the inspector general. And in this area where our hearings are in closed session, where you don't have outside stakeholders that can point out the flaws in what an agency is representing, if you're in the transportation committee and someone comes in and they say, this high-speed rail project is on time and under budget, you have outside validators and stakeholders that can say, that's just not true. In the intel world where our hearings are in closed session, there are not outside stakeholders that are listening that can hold those agencies to account. And so we are uniquely dependent when there's wrongdoing on two things, self-reporting by the agencies and the willingness of people of good faith to come forward and blow the whistle. And we do injury to that when we expose those whistleblowers to retaliation. Uh, I don't think any of us would have imagined a circumstance in which a president of the United States before now would have called a whistleblower a traitor or a spy, or suggested that people that blow the whistle on his wrongdoing are traitors and spies, and we should treat them as we used to treat traitors and spies. I don't think we could have imagined a circumstance where a President of the United States would have told a foreign leader that the U.S. ambassador, our anti-corruption champion in Ukraine, was going to go through some things. I don't think we could have imagined that happening before this presidency. And sometimes you just have to step back and realize just how striking and abhorrent this is and what a risk it is to, to civility, to decency, to our institutions. We become inured to it through endless repetition of attacks on anyone who will stand up to this president. And of course, the risk is the very reason we have a whistleblower protection, the very reason why whistleblowers should enjoy a right of anonymity is that in the absence of that, misconduct and wrongdoing will proliferate. If there's not a mechanism for people lawfully to expose wrongdoing, you can, you can bet that wrongdoing is going to increase. And that's why uh, there have been great champions like Senator Grassley of whistleblower protections, uh, Senator Burr and Senator Warner and many others because we all understand, at least we did heretofore, the vital importance and contribution uh, that are made by American citizens who bring wrongdoing to our attention. Thank you, Mr. Manager. The Senator from Missouri. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senators Hawley, Wicker, and Capito. Thank you. The question from Senator, uh, Senators Blunt, Hawley, Wicker, and Capito is addressed to counsel for the President. 
What responsibility does the President have to safeguard the use of taxpayer dollars for foreign aid and work to root out corruption? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate. The President has an important responsibility to safeguard taxpayer dollars that are used in foreign aid or used anywhere, frankly, and to root out corruption. Now, it's no secret that President Trump, from the beginning, from the time he came down the escalator, has been committed to ensuring that American taxpayer dollars are used appropriately, are used appropriately. And if they're going to foreign countries, he wants to make sure that they're used wisely. And there's ample evidence of that, ample evidence of that. I don't think that's even disputed or disputable. And he's fulfilling that obligation. And then the other point that he makes repeatedly is that if we're helping countries around the world, other countries should help us help them. We use the word burden sharing. Bur well, what does that mean? Burden sharing means that if American taxpayers are going to help with a problem in a country around the world, and we do, and we do a lot, we do it to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. When here in our country, we need to fix our roads, we need to fix our bridges. So if we're gonna take money away from those important projects here in America, that come from the hard-earned dollars of taxpayers, why can't other countries help us? That's called burden sharing. It's also called fairness. So he has that obligation, and every day he fulfills that obligation. Let me make another point in response to Senator Warren's question. The most important thing in terms of the fairness of this proceeding and that's why I've quoted repeatedly, I haven't played the videos over and over again, but you, you remember them. The wise words, the true words of the Democrats in the Clinton impeachment years. And the only point, the American people, under, they understand it. And I, I think everyone in this body understands it. That there can't be one standard for one political party and another for the other political party. That's important. Those words should be applied here. We can't have a standard that changes depend on, depending on what somebody thinks about political issues. In order to be fair, the st same standard has to be applied regardless, regardless of your party. So that's the critical issue here. And that's the bedrock principle. Not a double standard for justice, in the Senate, but one standard, the true standard, the standard that's been articulated eloquently by Democrats over and over again in the Clinton proceedings. That's the standard that's right. That's the standard that we ask for, regardless of political party. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Maine. I'm sending a question to the desk. Thank you. Senator King asks the President's counsel, would it be permissible for a President to inform the Prime Minister of Israel that he was holding congressional appropriated military aid unless the Prime Minister promised to come to the United States and publicly charge his opponent with anti-Semitism in the midst of an election campaign? Mr. Chief Justice and Senator, uh, thank you for the question. But the question really has nothing to do with this case. I mean, it seems to be uh, trying to get at the most extreme hypothetical related to um, a misinterpretation of what Professor Dershowitz was saying the other night. It's totally irrelevant here. What 
the charges that have been brought here articulated in the articles of impeachment are based on a theory of abuse of power that the House Democrats, the House managers have made clear depends for them to make their case to establish that when the President raised two issues on the call with President Zelensky of Ukraine, he raised the 2016 election interference and he mentioned the Biden and Burisma incident, that there was not any legitimate public policy or foreign policy interest in mentioning those things to the President of Ukraine. That's the standard they've set for themselves. It's on page five of the House Judiciary Committee report, and it's on page four. They say that they're going to show, they have to show it's a sham investigation, and I think it's on page six. They say it's a bogus investigation. That's their standard because they know they have to establish that there is no legitimate public policy interest at all in mentioning those in order to come anywhere close to being able to assert something that could be um, a wrongful conduct by the president. Because if there's a legitimate interest, if there's something there that's worth asking, they don't have a case. And that's why they've tried to tell you again and again there's not a scintilla of evidence. And this is really pretty preposterous for the House managers to come and say, particularly with respect to the Biden Burisma incident, there can't be any legitimate interest in raising that, questioning that, because it's all been debunked. And the question's been asked, where was it debunked? By whom was it debunked? Who conducted that investigation? Where's the report from that investigation? Who established that there's nothing there? There is no such report. They've been asked, they haven't been able to cite it. There's been no such investigation. But what do we know? We do know that every witness who was asked about it said, at a minimum, there was an appearance of a conflict of interest. We do know that at, two, at least two members of the Obama administration, Amos Hochstein and uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Kent, raised the issue of a conflict of interest with Vice President Biden's office. We know that uh, the uh, Chris Hines, the stepson of Secretary of State Kerry, who had been a business partner with Hunter Biden, broke off his business ties with him because Hunter Biden took a seat on the board of Burisma. So to say that there is nothing that could possibly merit asking a question about that is utterly disingenuous. It can't be said with a straight face. Every witness that was asked about it said that there was something at least it gave the appearance of a conflict of interest. There hasn't been any investigation to debunk this theory. There hasn't been any inquiry to find out is there there, there or not. And it doesn't have to do, as Manager Schiff was suggesting, just with, well, why was Hunter Biden on the board? Or were they paying him to it? It's the whole situation, the whole situation of all of a sudden, he's put on the board at the time when his father was put in charge of Ukraine policy. And there are people, there were witnesses who testified in the House proceedings that it appeared like Burisma was trying to whitewash their reputation by putting people with connections on their board. And then there's the prosecutor being fired. It's just not reasonable to say that no one could possibly say, that looks fishy. There's something maybe that somebody should look into there. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Alaska. I send a question to the desk. Thank you. Senator Murkowski asks counsel for the president. You explained that Ambassador Sondland and Senator Johnson both said the president explicitly denied that he was looking for a quid pro quo with Ukraine. The reporting on Ambassador Bolton's book suggests the president told Bolton directly that the aid would not be released until Ukraine announced the investigations the president desired. This dispute about material facts weighs in favor of calling additional witnesses with direct knowledge. Why should this body not call Ambassador Bolton? Mr. 
Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for the question. And I think the primary consideration here is to understand that the House could have pursued Ambassador Bolton. The House considered whether or not they would try to have him come testify and subpoena him. They chose not to subpoena him. And this all goes back to the most important consideration, I think, that this chamber has before it in some ways, especially on this thres threshold issue of whether there should be witnesses or not, has to do with the precedent that's established here for what kind of impeachment proceeding this body will accept from now going forward. Because whatever is accepted in this case becomes the new normal for every impeachment proceeding in the future. And it will do grave damage to this body as an institution to say that the proceedings in the House don't have to really be complete. You don't have to subpoena the witnesses that you think are necessary to prove your case. You don't really have to put it all together before you bring the package here. When you're impeaching the President of the United States, the gravest impeachment that they could possibly consider, you don't have to do all of that work before you get to this institution. Instead, when you come to this chamber, it can be kind of half-baked, not finished, we need other witnesses, and we want this chamber to do the investigation that wasn't done in the House of Representatives. And then this chamber will have to be issuing the subpoenas and dealing with that. And that's, that's not the way that this chamber should allow impeachments to be presented to it. And we've heard there was some exchange the other day about, well, there were a lot of witnesses in the Judge Porteous impeachment, and that that was able, this chamber was able to handle that. It's very different in the impeachment of a judge, which is being handled by a committee. My understanding is that under Rule 11 of the Senate procedures, there was a committee receiving that evidence. But in a presidential impeachment, there's not going to be just be a committee. It's the entire chamber that is going to have to be sitting as a court of impeachment, and that will, that will affect the business of the chamber. And so I think the idea that something comes out because someone makes an assertion in a book, allegedly, it's only an alleged, it's, it's simply alleged now that the manuscript says that. Ambassador Bolton hasn't come out to verify that, to my knowledge. That then we should start having this chamber call new witnesses and establish the new normal for impeachment proceedings as being that there doesn't have to be a complete investigation in the House. I think that's very damaging for the future of this institution. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The Senator from Hawaii. Mr. Chief Justice, I have a question on behalf of myself, Senators Whitehouse and Heinrich, and this is for the counsel for the President and the House managers. Thank you. Question from Senator Schatz, White House, and Heinrich for both parties. Can the White House really not admit that Senator King's hypothetical would be wrong? We begin with the, the House managers. Senator, we have no trouble uh, recognizing just how wrong that would be. Uh, but more than that, it's the natural extension of Professor Dershowitz's argument um, that if the president believed that that kind of quid pro quo would help his reelection, then it's perfectly fine and non-impeachable. There was a reason, of course, why they didn't want to address that hypothetical. But uh, let me go back also to the question that was asked about the other written reports that Ambassador Bolton and uh, Attorney General Barr were concerned that the president was intervening in cases in which he had business investments like Turkey. Under the theory of the president's lawyers, that's perfectly okay too. If the president thinks somehow that that's in the United States interest because it's in his interest, that's perfectly fine, it's unimpeachable. Now, is it, is it a crime to give preference to autocrats 
uh, to give special consideration to autocrats where you have business investments, that may not be criminal, but it is impeachable. It certainly should be impeachable uh, if we are going to sacrifice the national security of the country, if we're going to withhold military aid, if we're going to bestow uh, favors uh, in U.S. resources to countries where the president has investments, is that what we want driving U.S. policy? But that's the implication of what they have to say. Um, I agree with counsel about one thing they said. If we have a trial with no witnesses, that will be a new precedent. We should be very concerned about the precedent we set here because it will mean heretofore that when a president is impeached, that one party can deny the other witnesses and that will be the new normal, that will be trials without witnesses. And I don't think that's the precedent we should be setting here. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, Senator, thank you for the question. Let me just uh, begin by noting, I, I think it's a, it's a little bit rich for Manager Schiff to say that one party, i.e. the President, is going to deny them witnesses. It was the President who has denied any witnesses throughout this process up till now. But to get back to the question on um, Senator King's hypothetical, if, if the President insisted that a foreign leader come here and lie about someone else and he was holding up uh, military aid or a package of congressional aid and saying, you have to go out and lie about this, that, that would be wrong, but it's not this case. And it, and it has nothing to do with this case. But I'd like to address something that what Manager Schiff said, because he immediately pivoted now to the next thing, that what's in the newspapers? What else can we bring in from the newspapers? There's an allegation that the manuscript says something about conversations that Ambassador Bolton had with Attorney General Barr. Well, Attorney General Barr has issued a statement saying that that allegation, that that assertion is not accurate that that's false. And there are other allegations that are made about what might be in this manuscript. Mick Mulvaney has issued a statement saying that that's not true. So to sort of play the game of there's going to be another leak, somebody write, might, a book, write, might write a book, there's something else, and that's what, again, turning this body into the one doing investigations because the House didn't pursue the investigation, it's not prudentially a wise move for this chamber to take on that task. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Your Honor. Senator from Louisiana. I send a question to the desk for counsel for the president. Thank you. The question from Senator Kennedy is for counsel for the President. Has the House of Representatives in its impeachment proceedings or otherwise investigated the veracity of the statement by former Ukrainian Prosecutor General Viktor Shokin that Mr. Shokin, quote, believes his ouster was because of his interest in Burisma Holdings and his claim that had he remained in his post Shokin said he would have questioned Hunter Biden, end quote. As reported on July 22, 2019, in an article in the Washington Post entitled, As Vice President, Biden said Ukraine should increase gas production. Then his son got a job with a Ukrainian gas company by Michael Kranish and David Stern. Mr. Chief Justice, Senator, thank you for that question. And the answer, to the best of my knowledge, is no. The House of Representatives did not investigate the veracity or the truth of that reporting about the Prosecutor General Shokin. In fact, that was part of the point. And as Manager Schiff was saying here again, the House Democrats' position is that everything related to the entire incident of the Bidens and Burisma and what was going on with the prosecutor, it's all debunked. There's nothing to see there. Move along. Don't ask about it. But they didn't investigate it. 
and they can't point to anyone who's investigated it. They can't point to anyone who's really looked at it. And as I, as I said a minute ago, and I won't belabor the point, every witness who was asked said that they thought, yes, there's at least the appearance of a conflict of interest there. And at least one witness, and there's a public reporting of another person, Amos Hochstein in the Obama administration, raised the issue with Vice President Biden's office. But nothing was done about it. There have been questions about whether Vice President Biden sought or received an ethics opinion. We don't know. Um, I, not that I've heard of, not that I've seen anywhere, but it's just something that no one has actually inquired into. And there have been questions raised about why now? Why was it raised now? And the implication the House managers have tried to make is it's, uh, it's just because Joe Biden decided in April he was going to run for the presidency. But as I explained the other day, Rudy Giuliani, as the president's private counsel, was exploring matters in the Ukraine starting in the fall of 2018. He had tips because he was interested in finding out. Remember, the Mueller investigation was still ongoing at that point. It wasn't clear what the outcome of the Mueller investigation was going to be. And he was trying to find out what were the origins of Russian interference, of the, um, the, the Steele dossier, of allegations of collusion by the Trump campaign. And that led him in part to Ukraine. And he got information that led him to various strands to pursue. And one of them became the issue of the Biden and Burisma incident. And he prepared a little package on it based on interview notes. In January 23rd and January 25th of 2019, months before Joe Biden had announced that he was going to run for the presidency, Rudy Giuliani was interviewing Shokin and Lutz Lutsenko and wrote down in the interview notes the stuff about the Biden and Burisma incident and the firing of Shokin. He put it all in a package. He delivered it to the State Department in March, still before Joe Biden said he was going to be running for president. That didn't happen until April 25th. It was all done, all put in a package, all delivered. And that's public now because that little package that he sent to the State Department was released. I think it was under a FOIA litigation, but it's been released publicly. And the notes that he took, his interview notes, are there publicly. So the timing dates back to when Rudy Giuliani was pursuing that starting back in the fall of 2018, takes some time to pursue leads. He was trying to get Shokin to come to this country to interview him, couldn't get him a visa, had to interview him by phone. Lutsenko was in New York, and he prepares this package. That's why there's that, that timing. And then there were public articles published about the Biden-Burisma affair. One of them was just mentioned in the question, a Washington Post article, July 22, 2019, specifically about it, about the firing of Shokin, three days before the July 25th telephone call. It was in the news. It was topical. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Chief Justice. Senator from Michigan. Chief Justice, on behalf of myself and Senator Cornyn, I send a question to the desk for both House managers and the President's counsel. Thank you. The question from Senators Peters and Cornyn for both parties, how would the verdict in this trial alter the balance of power between the executive and legislative branches in the future? The President's counsel goes first. A verdict, a final judgment of acquittal would be the best thing for our country and would send a great message that will actually help in our separation of powers. Here's why. As I've said repeatedly, and according to the standard articulated so well during the Clinton impeachment, what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with a purely partisan impeachment with bipartisan opposition, no crime, no violation of law in an election year. Okay? Never happened before. No investigation. No due process, nothing. 
And what they're telling you, I mean, we can talk all we want, and we will, <laughs> but, but what are we talking about at the end of the day? We're talking about removing a president of the United States from a ballot in an election that's occurring in months. Who thinks that's a good idea? Particularly when, when you're dealing with a purely partisan impeachment that was warned about from the framers, okay? So the only appropriate result that won't damage our country horribly, maybe forever, but certainly for generations, is a verdict of acquittal. Here's the other point, getting back to the question of witnesses. Mr. Schiff's up here, let's make a deal. How about we have the Chief Justice and we have the greatest respect for the Chief Justice? Here's the problem. We're talking about critical constitutional rights that have been protected by the Supreme Court for our history. So what is he really saying? He's saying that the Senate, think about these questions, the Senate can decide about executive privilege by a vote, by a majority vote. If the Senate can decide, with the greatest respect, with the greatest respect, if the Senate can just decide there's no executive privilege, guess what? You're destroying executive privilege. Can the Senate decide the House's speech or debate protection? I mean, when we ask for documents from Mr. Schiff and his staff, and he says speech or debate, are you going to decide that? Are we going to, is that how we're going to do this? Are we going to flip a coin? Is that going to be your next suggestion? We're talking about an election of the president. There are critical constitutional issues that will alter our balance of power for generations if we go down that road. Down this road is the path provided by the Democrats so wisely during the Clinton administration and an election. Thank you. It may be different in the court than it is in this chamber and in the House, but when anybody begins the sentence with the phrase, I have the greatest respect for, you have to look out for what follows. Um, we trust the justice will make the right decision. Um, the justice has, I think, conducted these proceedings in an eminently fair way. There is nothing in the Constitution that would preclude us from taking a week to hear from witnesses and allowing the Chief Justice to make those calls. And I would say also with respect to an argument counsel made about the Porteous impeachment trial, where yes, the Senate designated 12 senators to hear the witness testimony. The implication is you can't do that in an impeachment of the president. That's only half correct. The other half is you could do depositions in which only a couple members of the body need participate. Uh, and so, it's a false argument to say or suggest that the whole body would need to conduct the whole of the depositions. So much as we would like live testimony, we've offered a compromise. But with respect to the question about what will this do to the balance of power, I would say this. As I mentioned earlier, our relationship with Ukraine will survive this debacle. But if we hold that a president can defy all subpoenas, can tie up the Congress endlessly with bad faith claims of privilege, claiming here one thing, claiming in court something else, it will eviscerate our oversight power. If the president is allowed to decide which subpoenas they will deign to consider valid and which they will deign to consider invalid, your oversight power, our oversight power is gone. That is an irrevocable change to the balance of power. And what's more, if we adopt their theory of the case, that a president can abuse his power, can do so by holding another country hostage, by withholding uh, congressionally appropriated funds, can violate the law in doing so, as long as they think it's in their interest. Imagine what that will do to the balance of power. Article two will really mean what the president says it means, which is he can do whatever he wants. So yes, the, the stakes are big here. Article two, goes to whether our oversight power, particularly in a case of investigating the president's own wrongdoing, continues to have any weight, whether the impeachment power itself is now a nullity. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Florida. 
I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Capito and Scott of South Carolina, with Thank all you. due respect. Thank you. The question from Senators Rubio, Capito, Scott, and Scott of South Carolina uh, is directed to both parties, and we begin with uh, counsel for the, for the House managers. The question reads, if I understand the manager's case, the president abused his power because he acted contrary to the advice of his advisors, but he is guilty of obstruction of Congress because he acted in accordance to the advice of his advisors. That's not our argument at all. The president is impeached on Article I not because he acted contrary to the advice of his advisors. That's a red herring offered by the president's legal team. We're not saying that the president is not free to disregard the advice of his counsel. He is. He is entitled to disregard even really good advice. What he is not free to do is engage in corruption. What he's not free to do is to withhold military aid, not for a valid policy disagreement. They've conceded Rudy Giuliani was not doing policy. What is not permitted is for a president to withhold congressionally appropriated money for a corrupt purpose, to secure help, illicit foreign help, to cheat in an election. That is no policy disagreement. Now, are we arguing in Article II that he should be impeached for following his lawyer's advice? No, they were following his advice. His advice was fight all subpoenas. They were giving the legal window dressing to that. They were going to court and arguing one thing and coming before you and arguing another. He was not following their advice. They were following his. You can say a lot about Donald Trump, but he is not led around by the nose by his legal counsel. Ask Don McGahn about that. Don McGahn stood up to the president. And Bob Mueller, if we're going to talk about the Mueller report, found several instances, and this goes to the pattern of the president's misconduct, in which he sought to obstruct that investigation by including telling the president's lawyer that he should fire the special counsel and then that he should lie about that instruction. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate. You're right. That's yet another way in which the House manager's theories of impeachment are incoherent and dangerous. With respect to Article II, and again, I, I won't respond to the ad hominem attacks that keep coming. I will say, just for the record, that you're right, I haven't been elected to anything. But when I say with the greatest respect, I mean it. Article II. The president's been impeached for ex exercising longstanding constitutional rights. He's looking out for constitutional rights in the face of a House process that violated all of them against all precedent. And he's looking out for future presidents and for the executive branch. How? If he had said, OK, fine, no rights, no counsel, no witnesses, no right to cross-examine. Here's everything you ask for. What sort of precedent would that set? It would, that would irreparably damage the separation of powers. So again, all you need to look at are the articles of impeachment. The articles of impeachment do not allege a crime. They do not even allege a violation of law. They are purely partisan. They were opposed by Democrats in the House. It is in an election year. And they're here saying, instead of an election, let's confront very consequential constitutional issues that have never really been confronted. And let's do it in a week. Let's destroy, let's destroy executive privilege. Maybe let's destroy speech or debate privilege. And let me point out one other thing. It's not right 
to accuse somebody falsely of something and then say, unless you waive your constitutional rights, you're guilty. That's not right. We shouldn't accept that in this country. These are longstanding privileges. They've been respected for hundreds of years, and we should continue to respect them. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The senator from West Virginia. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk on behalf of myself for the President's counsel and the House managers. Thank you. A question from Senator Manchin for both parties, and we'll begin with the President's counsel. Over the past two weeks, the White House counsel had detailed all the problems associated with the House's decision to move quickly through their impeachment proceedings. Why shouldn't this body heed their advice and slow down and at least allow the judge to rule in the McCann case to give the members of this body an official opinion from the judiciary on Article II? Mr. Chief Justice, Senator, thank you for the question. And I, I think the key point here is the McGahn case is not going to directly resolve something related to the obstruction charges here. It's going to address a legal issue with respect to uh, an assertion of absolute immunity for Don McGahn. There should be a decision from the D.C. Circuit sometime soon, but that will almost certainly go to the Supreme Court. I mean, if that immunity is being challenged and it's been relied upon by the executive for over 40 years, that's an issue distant for the Supreme Court. So the idea, it's not going to be just slow down here a little bit. This trial can't be held open pending the final resolution of that litigation. And that's an important point because this is something that Alexander Hamilton pointed out in Federalist Number 65 when he was discussing who should be the body to try impeachments. And one consideration was potentially drawing in judges from various states to create a new body to try impeachments. And the rationale that Hamilton gave for that would be a bad idea is that there has to be a swift progression from an impeachment to the trial to a verdict to having it finished, precisely because this is where he talked about the persecution of an intemperate or designing majority in the House of Representatives. He recognized there could be partisan impeachments and that accusation, that impeachment, shouldn't be hanging out there. There should be a swift trial to determine things finally. And that's why all of the preparation ought to be done in the House of Representatives to ensure that there's an investigation, there's a case put together, and if they're ready to impeach the President of the United States, they had better be finished, have everything buttoned down, and have their case ready, because they can't have a trial of the President Hamilton warned against that specifically, hanging over the country for months on end. And so to, to push off this trial, to say, well, we'll wait for litigation then at that point, that's a very dangerous idea. And that's not the way that the trial here should operate. It ought to be finished on the basis of the case that the House managers came ready to present. If they weren't ready to present a case that can win, there should be an acquittal. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. We have another half of the presentation. Oh, uh, If we could, um, Senator, if we could pull up slide uh, 37. This is what the district court had to say in the McGahn litigation now on appeal. Executive branch officials are not absolute immune from compulsory congressional process, no matter how many times the executive branch has asserted as much over the years. That is consistent with the decision in the Myers case where the court said, clear precedent and persuasive policy reasons confirm that the executive cannot be the judge of its own privilege and hence Ms. Myers is not entitled to absolute immunity. Let's look at what the court said uh, on slide 38 where Judge Jackson said, 
Stated simply, the primary takeaway from the past 250 years of recorded American history is that presidents are not kings. Compulsory appearance by dint of a subpoena is a legal construct, not a political one, and per the Constitution, no one is above the law. This is the district court saying, thou shalt appear, and this claim of absolute immunity is absolute nonsense. Um, the court, now this is what the Justice Department is arguing in that case, if we could see slide 39. The committee lacks Article III standing to sue to enforce a congressional subpoena demanding testimony from an individual on matters related to his duties as an executive branch official. And so here we are, we're now in the Court of Appeals, the Justice Department is saying that you cannot enforce congressional subpoenas. And they're saying, well, let's continue to litigate the matter. Let's, let's let this play out further. To what end? To what end? Yes, I suppose we could wait for a Court of Appeals decision, but of course they would say they're not satisfied with that court throwing out this idea either. Well, look, we've got a perfectly good justice right here that can make these decisions. Let's let him make the call. Let's make, let him make the call. Let's, let's trust that he will be fair and impartial. Thank you, Mr. Manager. The Senator from South Carolina. Thank you, sir. I sent a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senators Hawley, Sass, and Brassel. Thank you. Question from Senator Scott of South Carolina, Hawley, Sass, and Barrasso is to the counsel for the president. During their presentation, the House managers referenced Chairman Gowdy and the House Benghazi investigation. The final report on Benghazi flatly says, quote, the administration did not cooperate with the investigation, end quote. That committee fought for two years to access information and often had information requests ignored or denied. Yet this House investigation, after just three months, already supposedly justifies impeachment. Does President Trump owe more compliance than other presidents did? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Part of what we're seeing, I believe, is, is a kind of a two-fold attack or approach. We, we just saw a citation to two district court opinions as if the final arbiter of an issue of this magnitude is going to be the district court or, for that matter, the Court of Appeals. You're right. It's going to be the Supreme Court of the United States if it goes that, in that direction. Now, with regard to the question about the statement in the Benghazi report that the administration did not cooperate, the same was also true with Fast and Furious and the investigation there. And in that particular investigation, it reached such a significant point that members of the House determined that the then Attorney General of the United States should be held in contempt. Now, President Obama exercised executive privilege over documents and testimony related to Fast and Furious. The constitutional process was followed. Now, I'm not the one that makes the decision whether that was privileged or not privileged. If there was going to be a challenge, it would have been adjudicated. But the fact of the matter is, at least 10 times tonight, Manager Schiff has said, we have complete confidence in the Chief Justice, ignoring the fact that it's not his call. And I mean that with all sincerity, since you're making fun of people that are saying with due respect. It, it's not, that's not the way it's set up. Now, you could agree to anything. Sure, you can negotiate, you can negotiate that all the witnesses that'll be called will be the witnesses they requested. Or you can negotiate that, well, since they had 17 and we had none, we get 17 and they get four. All kinds of things can be negotiated under their view. But this is, this is brought to you by the, the managers who have an overwhelming case that they've proved over and over again. That's what they say. 
They proved it. It's overwhelming. It's incredible. We were able to put it together in a record amount of time. And now we want you, the United States Senate, to start calling witnesses for our overwhelmingly proved case. I would just lay this down if we're negotiating. Why don't we just go to closing arguments, see what this body decides. But I respect the process. The process is we have two days of questioning. Tomorrow there'll be an argument on the motion. There'll be a decision on the motion, and we have to, that's the system that's in place. That's the system we should follow. But this idea that two district court judges have decided an issue of this magnitude, and that is now the determination, they wouldn't accept it if they were in our position. They would say, well, the district court decided, so that's going to be it. So I think when we have to look at what's really at stake, these are really significant issues. These are serious. I mean, the idea that executive privilege should just be waived or doesn't exist, that in your view, absolute immunity it can't possibly be, exist, it's only been utilized for administrations for 50 years or more. Professor Dershowitz gave you the list of presidents that have, have put forward executive privilege in a lot of his writings, he talks about it. But to say tonight, we're just going to, you know, we'll just cut a deal. We'll do it in a week. We'll get some depositions, and that'll make everyone happy. Doesn't make the Constitution happy. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Supreme, Mr. Chief Justice. The senator from Ohio. I uh, send a question to the desk uh, on behalf of Senators Casey, Klobuchar, Warren, and Wyden for the House managers. Thank you. The question uh, for the House managers from Senator Brown and the other senators is as follows. Yesterday, you referenced how President Trump's perpetuating and propagating Russian conspiracy theories undercut our national security objectives. If acquitted in the Senate, what would prevent the President from continuing to side with Putin and other adversaries instead of our intelligence community and career diplomats? And what are the implications on our national security agenda if such behavior continues unchecked? Mr. Chief Justice, uh, Senators, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I've talked a lot tonight uh, and throughout the last week about uh, what's at stake here, because, you know, it's getting late into the night. We've been having this debate for several days now. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on the legal aspects of this. Um, so I don't, I don't want to get in again to, you know, the issues of our troops in Europe. Um, the, the hot war that continues to happen right now as we're speaking in Ukraine. But um, I, I will reiterate the precedent that we set with re regard to Russia and foreign adversaries. You know, this idea that it's okay to continue to peddle in Russian propaganda uh, and debunked conspiracy th theories. Because counsel for the president would have you believe that you know, this is a, a policy discussion, that, that you know, we have not resolved this, that there's a lot of debate about this issue. Uh, and, and if that is indeed the case, if we concede that, then there are some witnesses that we can call on, including Ambassador Bolton, that could shed additional light on it. But the fact pattern that we're sitting at right now, uh, what we're talking about right now, uh, is 17 witnesses that were called in the House, uh, none of whom uh, had any uh, indicia or had any um, data to provide that any of these theories were accurate. We have the entire intelligence and law enforcement community of the United States unanimously saying that there's no indication that Ukraine was involved in 2016 election, that it was Russia, 
And, and don't buy the red herring, by the way, that the Council for the President has brought forth this idea that, oh, it can only be Russia. You know, they said earlier that we were claiming that it can only be Russia. That's not what we're saying. Nobody on this team has ever said it can only be Russia, because indeed we know, as many of these people in the chamber know well, that there's a lot of male actors out there, that there's a lot of countries out there that have the capability uh, and the will and that regularly try to attack us in a variety of ways. What we are saying is with respect to this issue that's before this body right now, is unanimously the law enforcement agencies of the United States and the intelligence communities of the United States have said that it was Russia that interfered in the 2016 elections and that there's no data that suggests Ukraine was involved. That's the issue. So the precedent, bringing, bringing it all the way around to the beginning of the question, the precedent is that all of our adversaries, including Vladimir Putin, will understand that they can play to the whims of one person, whether that be President Trump or some future president, Democrat or Republican. They can play to the whims and the interests and the personal political ambitions of one person and get that individual to propagate their propaganda, get, get, uh, get them to undermine our own intelligence and law enforcement communities. That is a precedent that I don't think anybody here is willing and interested in sending, and that is truly what's at stake. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from North Dakota. I'm sending a question to the desk for myself, uh, for Senator Bozeman, Senator Wicker, and Senator Capito. Thank you. The question for counsel for the president from Senator Hoven, Bozeman, Wicker, and Capito. House managers contend that they have an overwhelming case and that they have made their case in clear and convincing fashion. Doesn't that assertion directly contradict their request for more witnesses? Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for the question. And I think it does directly contradict their claim now that they need more witnesses. They said for weeks that it was an overwhelming case. They came here and they've said 63 times that it's overwhelming or proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Manager Nadler said twice today that based on what they've already shown you, it's been proved beyond any doubt. All right? If that's their position, why do they need more witnesses or evidence? It's completely self-contradictory. And I'd like to address a couple of other points while I'm here and I have the time. And we've gone back and forth on this, and I don't know why I have to say it again. The House managers keep coming up here and saying and acting as if, if you mention Ukraine in connection with election interference, you even mention it, you're a pawn of Vladimir Putin, because only the Russians interfered in the election. And there's not any evidence in the record, they say, that the Ukrainians did anything. I read it before, I'll read it again. One of their star witnesses, Fiona Hill, said that some Ukrainian officials, quote, bet on Hillary Clinton winning the election, end quote. So it was, quote, unquote, quite evident that they were trying to curry favor with the Clinton campaign, including by trying to collect information on Mr. Manafort and on other people as well. So that was Fiona Hill. There was also the evidence in the record from a political article in 2017 that listed a whole bunch of Ukrainian officials who had done things to try to help the Clinton campaign and the DNC and to harm the Trump campaign. In addition, two news organizations, both Politico and the Financial Times, did their own investigative reporting. And the Financial Times concluded that the opposition to President Trump led Kiev's wider political leadership to do something they would never have attempted before, to intervene, however indirectly, in a U.S. election. 
That's the Financial Times. So the idea that there is no evidence whatsoever of Ukrainians doing anything to interfere in any way is just not true. They come up here and say it again and again. It's just not true. The other thing I'd like to point out, Manager Schiff keeps suggesting that somehow we're coming here and saying one thing, and the Department of Justice is saying something else in court about litigation. That's also not true. We've been very clear every time. The position of the Trump administration, like the Obama administration, is that when Congress sues in an Article III court to try to enforce a subpoena against an executive branch official, that is not a justiciable controversy, and there is not jurisdiction over it. The House managers in the House, though, take the position that they have that avenue open to them. So our position is when we go to court, we will resist jurisdiction in the court. But if the House managers want to proceed to impeachment, where they claim that they have an alternative mechanism available to them, our position is the Constitution requires incrementalism in conflicts between the branches. And that means that first there should be an accommodation process. And then Congress can consider other mechanisms at its disposal, such as contempt, or such as squeezing the president's policies by withholding appropriations, or other mechanisms to deal with that interbranch conflict. Or if they claim that they can sue in court, sue in court. But that impeachment is a measure of last resort. Now, earlier, Manager Schiff suggested that today, in court, the Department of Justice went in and said, there's no jurisdiction. And when the judge said, well, if there's no jurisdiction to sue, then what can Congress do? And the DOJ, as he represented it, simply said, well, if, if they can't sue, then they can impeach, as if that was the, the direct answer, just go from, if you can't sue, the next step is impeachment. Now, that didn't seem right to me, because I didn't think that was what DOJ would be saying. And DOJ has put out a statement. I don't have a transcript of the hearing. They don't have a transcript ready yet, as far as I know. But DOJ said, and this is a quote from the statement, the point we made in court is simply that Congress has numerous political tools it can use in battles with the executive branch. Appropriations, legislation, nominations, and potentially, in some circumstances, even impeachment. For example, it can hold up funding for the president's preferred programs, pass legislation he opposes, or refuse to confirm his nominees. And this is continuing their statement. But it is absurd for Chairman Schiff to portray our mere description of the Constitution as somehow endorsing his rushed impeachment process. So, Thank you. Mr. Chief Justice. Senator from Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. Question from Senator Blumenthal to the House managers. On April 24, 2019, one day after the media reported that former Vice President Biden would formally enter the 2020 U.S. presidential race, the St State Department executed President Trump's order to recall Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch, a well-regarded career diplomat and anti-corruption crusader. Why did President Trump want, in his words, to, quote, take her out, end quote. Well, uh, Mr. Giuliani has provided the answer to that question. He stated publicly that the reason they needed to get Ambassador Yovanovitch out of the way was that she was going to get in, way, in the way of these investigations that they wanted. This is the president's own lawyer's explanation for why they had to push out, why they had to smear Ambassador Yovanovitch. So the president's own lawyer gives us the answer. Uh, and that ought to tell us something that, in a couple of respects. One, that the president's own agent has said that she was an impediment to getting these investigations, this anti-corruption champion. 
this uh, anti-corruption champion who's at an award ceremony or a recognition ceremony for a Ukrainian anti-corruption fighter, a woman who had acid thrown in her face and who died a painful death after months. She's at that very ceremony acknowledging this other champion fighting corruption when she gets the word, you need to come back on the next plane. Now, one of the reasons the Ukrainians knew they had to deal with Rudy Giuliani is that Rudy Giuliani was trying to get this ambassador replaced, and you know, he succeeded. He succeeded. And that sent a message to the Ukrainians that if Rudy Giuliani had the, had the juice with the President of the United States, had the power with the President of the United States to recall an ambassador from her post, this was somebody that not only had the ear of the President that could make things happen. So the short answer is Rudy Giuliani tells us why she had to go. Now why they had to smear her, why the President couldn't simply recall her, that's harder to explain. But the reason they wanted her out of the way is they wanted to make these investigations go forward and they knew someone there fighting corruption was getting in the way of that. Um, now I want to uh, say with respect to some of the arguments against having the testimony of John Bolton. These are some of the former National Security Advisors who have been called to hearings and depositions. Zbigniew Brzezinski, the National Security Advisor for President Carter, provided eight hours of public hearing testimony and additional deposition testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee subcommittee to investigate individuals regarding the interests of foreign governments. Admiral Poindexter, testified, provided over 25 hours of public hearing testimony and 20 hours of deposition testimony before the House Select Committee to investigate covert arms transactions with Iran. Robert McFarland, former National Security Advisor for Pro President Ronald Reagan, provided over 20 hours of public hearing testimony and three additional hours of deposition testimony. Sam, Samuel Berger, National Security Advisor for President Clinton, provided two hours of public hearing testimony before the Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs. Its inquiry into campaign finance practices. Condoleezza Rice, National Security Advisor for President George W. Bush, three hours of public testimony, additional closed session testimony. Susan Rice uh, provided closed session testimony to the House Select Committee on how the Obama administration handled identification of U.S. citizens and U.S. intelligence reports. There is ample precedent where it is necessary to have testimony of national security advisors. Now, you, you saw, I think, the President's counsel dancing on the head of a pin and trying to explain why they're before you arguing, we can't have these people come here, the House should sue in court, and why they're in court saying the court can't hear it. And I have to say I have great uh, um, understanding for the difficulty of that position. I wouldn't want to be in a position of having to advocate that argument. But it goes to the demonstration of bad faith here. How can you be before this body, body saying, you got to go to court, the House was derelict because it didn't go to court, and go to the same court and say, the House shouldn't be here? How do you do that? Now they say, well, the House is in court, so the House must think it's okay, even though we don't think so, and we're arguing that, and we'll take it all the way up to the Supreme Court if we have to. We don't think that's an adequate remedy. That's the whole problem. When you have bad faith invocation of privilege, when you have non, in fact, assertion of privilege, when you have a president who wants to continue to cover up his wrongdoing indefinitely, a president who is trying to get foreign help in the very next election, that process of going endlessly up and down the courts with a duplicitous counsel for the president arguing in one place you could do it and the other place you can't shows the, the flaw with a precedent that Congress must exhaust all remedies before it can insist on answers with the ultimate remedy of impeachment. If, the majority leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I <clears throat> suggest we take a five minute break. Without objection, so ordered.
And during this Senate break, we want to hear your voices and we want to see your texts. We want to get your reaction, hear what questions you would like to have asked. Over 150 questions have been asked in the last two days. The senators are down to their last two hours or so. 202 is the area code 7488920. If you live in the East and Central time zones, 202-7488921 for those of you in the Mountain and Pacific. And you can send a text if you can't get through on the phone lines, 202-748-8903. And a reminder that you can continue the conversation on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash C-SPAN. Edward in Phoenix, Arizona, you've been listening all night. What have you heard? So I've heard a lot of testimony from back and forth from the House managers and the uh, President Council. And... I've heard a lot of good questions from both Republicans and Democrats, but the major issue I have is I've heard people constantly articulate that this will void the 2016 election, but a fair investigation, a fair trial of Donald Trump will instead determine whether or not he broke the trust of the 61 million people that voted for him. I don't think that's voiding the election. I think that's proving whether or not he is doing what he was voted into office to do. Thank you, sir. Miranda in Columbus, Ohio, texts in. White House counsel, please bring up the fact that defense is not required to present witnesses or documents. It is the defense's choice. The defense's job is to answer and disprove the prosecutions and allegations. Richards in Dayton, Ohio. Richard, has your question been asked by the senators? Uh uh, yes, it has. As a matter of fact, uh, um, one of our great senators from the state of Ohio, Senator Portman, uh, addressed uh, uh, things very well yesterday in stating, um, why are we, uh, and I'm paraphrasing and, and such, why are we going through this process and taking up the Senate's time when a lot of the Republicans and Democrats have publicly stated they know how they're going to vote? Um, and I've heard many folks that's called in that says, this country's infrastructure needs attention. We have to get the business of the people back in order on the House and the Senate side and really get some infrastructure in this company um, handled with. We, we send these elected officials to D.C. for a reason, and it's not to play these political games that are airing out on TV. Kyle, Roy, Utah, it's your turn. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm really concerned where the House Democrats are always complaining and saying that they want fairness. How can this be fair when you've got four people that are actually running against this president that are actually sitting and, and being involved in this? How can that be fair? Well, Kyle, we could argue that that's four votes out of 100. It doesn't matter. That's four votes. How can that be fair? They should recuse themselves. All right. That's Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas. Let's see if he has anything to say. And I apologize, we can't quite hear Senator Roberts. Edward, Brooklyn, New York, you are on C-SPAN 2. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you for taking my call. I've been watching this from the beginning on C-SPAN, and I'd like to know why the question wasn't asked that this is a complete coup by the Democratic Party. I mean, if you listen to all the evidence, what evidence do they have? If they don't want to go forward with what they brought and they were so positive about everything that they had, then why aren't we just finished up with this already? I mean, it's getting out of hand. It now, should have been done. And tomorrow's still to go. Uh, that's the four hours of debate on witnesses and more testimony. Um, you going to watch that as well? Absolutely. All right, 166 questions have been asked so far. Ron Issaquah, Washington. What's a question that you'd like to see asked? 
Yes, I, I'm inquiring. I, I've I've read uh, in uh, looking up Joe Biden's background, and I've heard testimony both on the uh, House side and on the president side that makes me want to believe a theory that was thrown at me uh, by a Democrat several weeks ago that Joe Biden entered the race to basically cause this fiasco because he was being investigated and found out that he and his son were being investigated and that this was a way to disrupt the election. And where did you see that theory, Ron? Well, I didn't see the theory. I uh, was looking up the candidates here several weeks ago and uh, the backgrounds of the candidates. And uh, Joe Biden had indicated all the way up through uh, November of of uh, 2019 that he wasn't sure he was going to enter the race. Uh, about that time, I guess it was Giuliani that was doing some investigation. And uh, from what I've heard from and I'm and I'm and I'm truly an independent. I voted for Obama his first run. I didn't vote for him his second run. I did vote for Trump because I thought Trump's uh, uh, policies were something that uh, lent to my way of thinking, particularly draining the swamp. Uh, it just the the data that I'm hearing on these uh, floors in the last couple of days, and I've watched 99.9 percent of it. Uh, that leads me to believe that maybe that context uh, has something to play into this. Thank you, Ron, for your time. Uh, Larry Waterford, California. Larry, what do you think of the 166 questions so far? Well, I don't. I think they're all all fixed to uh, placate to the House and the and the President's. Um, my problem is I'm 66. I've been watching uh, the Democrats and Republicans. I'm not either one. And I've been watching them for all my life. The Democrats have lied. Every time they come into uh, office or try to do something in the office, they make promises and they don't keep it. I think it's time for the American people to get rid of the Democratic Party. So, Larry, at this point, at this point, would you vote to acquit the president or impeach the president? I would I would vote to acquit the president, period. Chris is in Corum, New York. Good evening, Chris. Good, e good evening, thanks for taking my call. Uh, I, I've been watching, you know, since this has started, and I feel that it's just sheer gamesmanship, meaning that the Democrats just want to perpetuate as much media attention as they possibly can get for as long as they can get, and, and they just keep perpetuating this this situation here. Okay, uh, but that's what I truly believe that they don't want this to end. They just want it to keep going so they have the media coverage. That's Chris in New York. Terrence from Illinois. Texts in, why does Chairman Schiff say he can bring in witnesses to the Senate in a week when he keeps saying subpoenas in the House would have taken a year? That's his question. Ched in Zeeland, Michigan. Good evening. Thomas, Frederick, Maryland. Thomas, you're on. What's your question for the, for the uh, House Hello. impeachment managers Hello, and the for, uh... Trump defense team? Uh, hello, sir. Thank you for taking my time. Uh, I was just wondering, with you know the president personally attacking Adam Schiff, is it kind of hypocritical when the uh, defense man, when his defense team tries to? Whoops, not sure where he went. But we'll go on to Brandon in Ringgold, Georgia. Brandon, what's your question? Uh, yes, yeah, thanks for uh, your time today. I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts, he is really overstepping his authority, in my opinion, by blocking Rand Paul's questions. Uh, I'm not sure he has the authority to block any questions by, by any senator. Uh, and I was going to get your thoughts on that. Well, I have no thoughts on that. Um, we will move on then to Stephen in Boone, Iowa. Hi, Stephen. 
Hi, how are you doing? My, my question is for the House managers, and I'm not Democrat or Republican, but if they have such an ironclad case, why do they need m more evidence presented? And they're, they're quoting a book that hasn't even been released, and they just bring these lies, and then they're, they're, they're disproven, and then they just walk by it like nothing happens. Why, if they had an ironclad case, do they need to present any other evidence than what they've already presented? Stephen, thank you for that question. Uh, we've got a couple hours left of questioning, so maybe that will be asked. Um, are you caucusing on Monday, Stephen, in the Iowa caucuses? Yes, I am. For whom? Um, actually, with the Democratic Party, because I'm a committee, I'm a committee member of my ward, so I. Do you have a favorite candidate at this point? Um, no, no. See, there you go again. It's, I don't listen to the news too much, but I do like C-SPAN, because you guys tell it how it is. You don't throw in your opinions or nothing. You just put it out there, unlike most of the major networks. At Stephen in Boone, Iowa, a reminder to all our callers, turn down your TVs, speak clearly into your mobile phone so we can all hear you. LaVon, Clearwater, Florida. Hi, hi LaVon. Hi. Our ambassadors have been listening to the fake news, and uh, Professor Hill has uh, been getting her information from the foundation research that's found. And the Senate is back in session. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Iowa. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk for myself and Senator Lankford. The question from Senator Ernst and Langford is for the counsel for the president. Members of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, of which Manager Schiff sits as chairman, conducted a number of depositions related to this impeachment inquiry. One of the individuals deposed was Intelligence Community Inspector General Michael Atkinson. Has the White House been provided a copy of this deposition transcript? Do you believe this transcript would be helpful? If so, why? Mr. Chief Justice and Senator, thank you for that question. Uh, we have not been provided that transcript. My understanding is that the Inspector General for the Intelligence Community, uh, Mr. Atkinson, testified in executive session and HIPSI has retained that transcript in executive session and has, was not transmitted to the House Judiciary Committee and therefore under the terms of House Resolution 660 was not turned over to the White House Counsel, so we have not seen it. Um, I just want to clarify, I, we don't think there's any need to start getting into more evidence or witnesses, but if one were to start going down that road, I think that that transcript could be relevant because my understanding from public reports is that there were questions asked of the Inspector General about his interactions with the whistleblower. And there was some question in public reports about whether the whistleblower was entirely truthful with the Inspector General on forms that were filled out and whether or not uh, you know, the certain representations were made about whether or not there had been any contact with Congress. And that then ties into the contact that the whistleblower apparently had with the staff of the committee, which we also don't know about. So if we were to go down the road, we don't think it's necessary. We think that this, these articles of impeachment should be rejected. But if one were to go down the road of any more evidence or witnesses, it would certainly be relevant to find out what the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community had to say about the whistleblower, along with the other issues that we've mentioned about whistleblower's bias, motivation, 
what were his connections with the whole situation of the Bidens? And apparently, if he worked with Vice President Biden, did he work on he worked on Ukraine issues, according to public reports. How does that all tie in? All of those things would become relevant in that event. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, the Senator from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I send uh, a question to the desk on behalf of myself, Senators Manchin and Senator Sinema. Thank you. Question from Senators Jones, Manchin, and Cinema is directed to the House managers. So much of the questions and answers, as well as the presentations, have focused on the completeness of the House record. Should the House have initiated a formal accommodations process with the administration to negotiate for documents and witnesses after the passage of House Resolution 660? And regardless of whether the House record is sufficient or insufficient, to find the President guilty or not guilty, what duty, if any, does the Senate owe to the American public to ensure that all relevant facts are made known in this trial and not at some point in the future? Senators, uh, thank you for the question. It was apparent from the very beginning when the President announced that they would fight all subpoenas, when the White House counsel uh, issued its uh, October 8th diatribe saying they would not participate uh, in the inquiry, that they were not interested in any accommodation. Uh, we tried uh, to get uh, Don McGahn to testify. We tried uh, that route. Uh, we've been trying that route uh, for nine months now. We tried for quite some time before we took that matter to court with absolutely no success. And I think what we've seen is there was no desire on the part of the President to reach any accommodation. Uh, quite the contrary, the President was, quite, was adamant that they were going to fight in every single way. Now, if they had an interest in accommodation, we wouldn't be before you without a single document. There would have been hundreds and hundreds of documents provided. We would have entered an accommodation process over claims of narrow claims of privilege as to this sentence or that sentence. They would have had to make a particularized claim that we could have negotiated over. But of course, they did none of that. They said, your subpoenas are invalid. Uh, you have to depart from the bipartisan rules of how you conduct your depositions. Essentially, our idea of accommodation is you have to do it our way or the highway. And the President's instructions, the President's marching orders were go pound sand. Now, what is the Senate's responsibility in the context of a House impeachment for which there was such blanket obstruction? And bear in mind, if you compare this to the Nixon impeachment, Richard Nixon told his people to cooperate, provided documents to the Congress. Yes, there were some that were withheld, and that led to litigation, and the President lost that litigation. But the circumstances here are very different. Frankly, the President could have made this a difficult case, but didn't because of the wholesale nature of the obstruction. Now, in terms of the Senate responsibility, the Constitution says the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. And so you have the sole power. That expression is used, I believe, only twice in the Constitution. One, when it tells the House that we have the sole power to conduct an impeachment proceeding, and again, the process we used, and they can repeat this as often as they'd like, is the same process used in the Clinton and Nixon impeachments. And I'm sure Clinton and Nixon thought that was unfair, but nonetheless, we use the same process. But here, you have the sole power to try the case. And if you decide that one week is not too long in the interest of a fair trial, to have depositions of key witnesses, that is for you to decide. You get to decide how to try the case. And so if you decide 
that you have confidence in the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to make decisions about materiality and relevance and privilege and make those line-by-line -line redactions if they're warranted? If you decide, you trust the Chief Justice to decide whether privilege is being applied properly or improperly to conceal crime or fraud or for legitimate national security purpose, you have the sole power to make that happen. That is within every bit within your right. And we would urge you to do so. Now, counsel for the President says the Constitution doesn't require that. The Constitution doesn't prohibit that. It gives you the sole power to try this case. And under your sole power, you can say, we've made a decision. We're going to give the parties one week. We're going to let the Chief Justice make a fair determination of who's pertinent and who's not. We're not going to let the House decide who the President's witnesses are. We're not going to let the President decide who the House witnesses are. We're going to let them both submit their top priorities, and we're going to let the Chief Justice decide who's material and who's not. That is fully within your power. And so, in sum and substance, there's no evidence of an intention, a willingness in any way, shape, or form to accommodate in the House. If there was, we wouldn't be here. Instead, there was, we will fight all subpoenas, and under Article II, I can do whatever I want. And now we're here. And they make the, the astounding claim if their case is so good, let them try it without witnesses. That wouldn't fly before any judge in America, and it shouldn't fly here either. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Just. Senator, I'm sorry. Yes, the senator from Tennessee. I send to the desk a question on behalf of myself and Senators Lee and Johnson. Thank you. The question from Senator Blackburn and Senators Lee and Johnson is for counsel, counsel for the President. What was the date of the first contact between any member of the House Intelligence Committee staff and the whistleblower regarding the information that resulted in the complaint? How many times have House Intelligence Committee members or staff communicated in any form with the whistleblower since that first date of contact? Mr. Chief Justice, Senator, thank you for that question. The answer is, we don't know. Nobody knows. We don't know when the first contact was. We don't know how many contacts there were. We don't know what the substance of the contact was. That all remains shrouded in some secrecy. And as I said a moment ago, we think that the way this case has been presented this body should simply acquit. There's no need to get more evidence to probe into that. But if we were to go down the road of any evidence or witnesses, then those are certainly relevant questions and relevant things to know about, to understand what those contacts were, what the whistleblower's motivation was, what the connection between the whistleblower and any staffers and how that played any role in the formulation of the complaint that it all be relevant to understand how this whole process began. Now, I do want to mention something else while I, I have the moment um, in response to some things that Manager Schiff said. Again, the House managers come up and it seems like they keep saying the same thing and we keep pointing to actual evidence and letters that disprove what they're saying. They come up and say that the President said, it's my way or the highway, blanket defiance, there's nothing you can do. And they say that, well, it, they would have accommodated if we were willing to participate in the accommodation process. The October 8th letter that the counsel for the president, who Mr. Schiff says acts in bad faith and called duplicitous here on the floor of the Senate, 
sent uh, a letter on October 8th to Mr. Schiff and others explaining, quote, if the committees wish to return to the regular order of oversight requests, we stand ready to engage in that process as we have in the past in a manner consistent with well-established bipartisan constitutional protections and a respect for the separation of powers enshrined in our Constitution. That was followed up in an October 18th letter that I mentioned before, a letter that specified the defects in the subpoenas that had been issued, not blanket defiance, not simply we don't cooperate, specifying the legal errors in the subpoenas. And it concluded, quote, as I stated in my letter of October 8th, if the committees wish to return to the regular order of oversight requests, we stand ready to engage in that process as we have in the past in a manner consistent with well-established constitutional protections and a respect for the separation of powers enshrined in our Constitution. The President stood ready to engage in an accommodations process. If anyone said my way or the highway here, it was the House, because the House was determined that they wanted just to get their impeachment process done on the fastest track they could. They didn't want to do any accommodation. They didn't want to do any litigation. They didn't want anything to slow them down. They wanted to get it done as fast as they could so it was finished by Christmas. It was a partisan charade from the beginning. It resulted in a partisan impeachment with bipartisan opposition, and it's not something this chamber should condone. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Nevada. I have a question from the, for the desk for the House managers. Thank you. Question from Senator Rosen is for the House managers. <clears throat> During the President's phone call with Ambassador Sondland, he insisted there was no prid pro quo involving the exchange of aid and a White House meeting for an investigation. But he also said, according to Sondland, that the stalemate over aid will continue until President Zelensky announces the investigations. Isn't that the definition of the exact quid pro quo that the president claimed didn't exist. The short answer is yes. That's exactly what a quid pro quo is. Um, when someone says, I'm not gonna ask you to do this, but then says, I'm ask you, gonna ask you to do this, that's exactly what happened here. Um, Sondland calls the president, and the first words out of his mouth are no quid pro quo. Now, that's suspicious enough. Um, when someone blurts out their, what we would find out as a false exculpatory, but then the president goes on nonetheless to say no quid pro quo. At the same time, Zelensky has got to go to the mic to announce these investigations, that's the implication, and he should want to do it. So no quid pro quo over the money, but Zelensky's got to go to the mic. Um, and if you have any question about the accuracy of that, you should demand to see Ambassador Taylor's notes, Tim Morrison's notes, um, and of course, Sondland goes and tells Ukraine about this uh, coupling of the money in order to get the investigations. And let me just, if I can, go through a little of the history of that. You've got Rudy Giuliani uh, and others trying to make sure the Ukrainians make these statements in the run-up to that July phone call. This is the quid pro quo over the meeting. So they're trying to get the statement that they want. They're trying to get the announcement of the investigations. And around this time, prior to the call, the president puts a freeze on the military aid. And then you have that call, and the minute that Zelensky brings up the defense support and the desire to buy more javelins, that's when the president immediately goes to the favor he wants. So the Ukrainians at this point know 
that the White House meeting is conditioned on getting these investigations announced. But in that call, the minute military aid is brought up, the President pivots to the favor he wants of these investigations they already know about. Now, after that call, the Ukrainians quickly find out about the freeze in aid. According to the former Deputy Foreign Minister, they found out within days. July 25th is the call. By the end of July, Ukraine finds out the aid is frozen. The Deputy Foreign Minister is told by Andrei Yermak, keep this secret. We don't want this getting out. She had planned to come to Washington. They cancel her trip to Washington because they don't want this made public. And so in August, there's this effort to get the investigations announced. That's the only priority for the President and his men. So the Ukrainians know the aid is withheld. They know they can't get the meeting. They know what the President wants these investigations. And the Ukrainians, like the Americans, can add up 2 plus 2 equals 4. But if they had any question about that, Sondland removes all doubt on September 1st in Warsaw, when Sondland goes over after the Pence-Zelensky meeting, he goes over to Yermak and he says that until you announce these investigations, you're not getting this aid. He makes explicit what they already knew, that not just the meeting, but the aid itself was tied. And on September 7th, Sondland tells Zelensky directly, the aid is tied to your doing the investigations. And it's at that point, on September 7th, when Zelensky is told by Sondland directly of the quid pro quo that Zelensky finally capitulates and says, all right, I'll make the announcement on CNN. And then the president is caught. The scheme is exposed. The president is forced to release the aid. And what does Zelensky do? He cancels the CNN interview because the money was forced to be released when the president got caught. But that's the chronology here. It's make no mistake. Ukrainians are sophisticated actors. As one of the witnesses said, they found out very shortly after the hold, the Ukrainians had good tradecraft. They understood very quickly about this hold. And what would you expect when you're fighting a war and your ally is withholding military aid without explanation, and the only thing they tell you that they want from you are the announcement of these investigations? And if it wasn't clear enough, they hammer them over the head with it. They told Yermak on September 1st, you're not getting the money without announcing these investigations. They tell Zelensky himself on September 7th, you're not getting the money without these investigations. And finally, the resistance of this anti-corruption reformer, Zelensky, is broken down. He desperately needs the aid. Finally, the resistance is broken down. All right, I'll do it. He's going to go on CNN. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Senator Justice, from Kansas. thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, I have a uh, message to be sent to the desk, a question, and it's uh, on my behalf, on the behalf of Senator Rubio, Senator Crapo, and Senator Risch. Thank you. question from Senator Moran, Crapo, and Risch reads as follows. Impeachment uh, for the counsel for the president. Impeachment and removal are dramatic and consequential responses to presidential conduct, especially in an election year with a highly divided citizenry. Yet checks and balances is an important constitutional principle. Does the Congress have other means, such as appropriations, confirmations, and oversight hearings less damaging to our nation. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for the question. Um, and yes, Congress has a lot of incremental steps, a lot of means short of impeachment to address um, friction or conflicts with the executive branch. And that was a point that I was making a moment ago with respect to what the Department of Justice had said um, in litigation today, uh, where the um, 
absolute immunity for senior advisors. Actually, I think it's a different issue in that case, a bigger part, but in any event, there's a dispute in that case about information requests. And the point that DOJ was making there is the Constitution requires incremental steps where there's friction between the branches. As I mentioned the other day, friction between the branches and between Congress and the executive on information requests in particular is part of the constitutional design. It's been with us since the first administration. George Washington denied requests from Congress for information about the negotiation of the Jay Treaty. And so from the very beginning, there has been this friction leading to jockeying for position and accommodations and confrontation and leading to ways of working things out when Congress demands information from the executive and the executive asserts to protect the institutional authorities of the executive branch, the sphere where the executive can be able to keep information confidential. But the first step in response to that should be the accommodations process. And the courts have described that as constitutionally mandated, as something that actually furthers the constitutional scheme to have the branches negotiate and try to come to an arrangement that addresses the legitimate needs of both branches of the government. Part of that accommodations process, as, or as it gets, as uh, the confrontation continues, can involve Congress exercising the levers of authority that it has under Article I to try to put pressure on the executive. So, for example, appropriations, not funding the policy priorities, uh, priorities of a particular administration, or cutting funding on some policy priorities, or legislation, not passing legislation that the president favors, or passing other legislation that the president doesn't favor. Or the Senate has the power not to approve nominees, and as I'm sure many of you well know, holding up nominees in committee can be effective in some points in putting pressure on an administration to get particular uh, policies kicked loose, things accomplished in a particular department or agency. All of these elements of the interplay of the branches of government, that's part of the constitutional design. But impeachment is the very last resort for the very most serious conflict where there is no other way to resolve it. So there are all of these multiple intermediate steps and they all should be used. They all should be exercised in an incremental fashion. And that's exactly what didn't happen in this case. There was no attempt at the accommodations. There was no attempt even to respond to the legal issues, the legal defects that the counsel for the president and the departments and agencies pointed out in each of the subpoenas that were issued by the House committees. And even the issue of agency counsel, there was no attempt to try to negotiate on that. And, and that's really something that in the past, even last April, with the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with Chairman Cummings, there was a dispute about that. And we wouldn't allow a witness to go without agency counsel. And then we had a meeting with Chairman Cummings and it got worked out. And it was turned into um, a transcribed interview, I think, and, uh, the, but agency counsel was permitted to be there. But the committee got the interview, they got to talk to the person and they got the information they wanted, but the executive branch got to have agency counsel there to protect executive branch interests. And that's the way it's supposed to work. But there was no attempt at anything like that from the House in this case. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The Senator from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I send a question to the desk for the House managers. Thank you. Senator Markey's question for the House managers reads as follows. It has recently been reported that the Russians have hacked the Ukrainian natural gas company Burisma, presumably looking for information on Hunter Biden. Our intelligence community has warned us that the Russians will be interfering in the 2020 election. If Donald Trump is acquitted of these pending charges, but is later found to have invited Russian or other foreign interference in our 2020 election, what recourse will there be for Congress under the Dershowitz standard for impeachment, which requires a president to have committed a statutory crime? Uh, 
Uh, Senator, absolutely no recourse, uh, no recourse whatsoever. Um, if, in fact, it were later to be shown that not only did the Russians hack Burisma to try to get dirt on the Bidens uh, and drip, drip, drip it out as they did in the 2016 election, let's say it were found that they did so at the request of the President of the United States, that in one of these meetings that the President had with Vladimir Putin, uh, whose contents is unknown, that the President of the United States asked the President of Russia to hack Burisma because he couldn't get the Ukrainians to do what he wanted, so now he was turning to the Russians to do it. Under the Dershowitz theory of the case, under the President's theory of the case, that's perfectly fine. But that's not, that's not how bad it is, because it goes further than that. If the President went further and said to Putin in that secret meeting, I want you to hack Burisma. I couldn't get the Ukrainians to do it. And I'll tell you what. If you hack Burisma and you get me some good stuff, then I'm going to stop sending money to Ukraine. And I'll go a step further. I'm going to stop sending money to Ukraine so that they can't fight you and Donbass. Uh, and what's more, those sanctions that we imposed on you for your intervention on my behalf in the last election, I'm going to make those go away. I'm going to simply refuse to enforce them. I'm going to call it a policy difference. That's perfectly fine under their standard. That's not an abuse of power. You can't say that's criminal. Yeah, it's akin to crime, or maybe it's not, but that's what an acquittal here means. It means that the president is free to engage in all the rest of that conduct, and it's perfectly fine. And what's the remedy that my colleagues representing the president say that you have to that abuse? Well. You can hold up a nominee. That seems wholly in, out of scale with the magnitude of the problem. That process of appropriations or nominations is not sufficient for a chief executive officer of the United States who will betray the national security for his own personal interest. He got on the phone with Zelensky asking for this favor the day after Bob Mueller testifies. What do you think he will be capable of doing the day after he's acquitted here? The day after he feel, feels, I dodged another bullet. I really am beyond the reach of the law. My attorney general says I can't be indicted. I can't even be investigated. He closed the investigation into this matter before he even opened it. And I can't be impeached either. I got the best of both worlds. I got Bill Barr saying I can't be investigated. I can't be prosecuted. I can be impeached, however. That's what Bill Barr says. But I've got other lawyers that say I can't be impeached. That's a recipe for a president who is above the law. That only is not required by the Constitution. Quite the contrary. The founders knew coming from a monarchy that if they were going to give extraordinary powers to their new executive, they needed an extraordinary constraint. They needed a constraint commensurate with the evil which they sought to contain. That remedy is not holding up a nomination. The remedy they gave for an executive that would abuse their power and endanger the country, that would endanger the integrity of our elections, was the power of impeachment. As one of the experts said in the House, if this conduct isn't an impeachable offense, then nothing is. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from South Carolina. Uh, I send a question to, to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Alexander, Cruz, Portman, Toomey, Sullivan, Murkowski to the counsel for the president. Thank you.
The question from Senator Graham and the other senators is for the counsel for the president. Assuming for argument's sake that Bolton were to testify in the light most favorable to the allegations contained in the articles of impeachment, isn't it true that the allegations still would not rise to the level of an impeachable offense and that, therefore, for this and other reasons, his testimony would add nothing to this case? Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for the question. Let me start by just making very clear that there was no quid pro quo. There was no, uh, and there is no evidence to show that, there was not that sort of linkage that the House managers have suggested. But let me answer the question directly, which I understand to be assuming for the sake of argument that Ambassador Bolton would come and testify the way the New York Times article alleges, the way his book describes the conversation, then it is correct that even if that happened, even if he gave that testimony, the articles of impeachment still wouldn't rise to an impeachable offense. And that's for at least two reasons. Let me explain that. The first is, on their face, the articles of impeachment, as they've been laid out by the House, by the House managers, even if you take everything that's alleged in them, they don't, as a matter of law, rise to the level of an impeachable offense. Because even the House managers haven't characterized them as involving a crime. So that's one level of the answer, that an impeachable offense would require a crime. Even going beyond that to the, a second level, the theory of abuse of power that they've alleged, put aside whether or not it's a crime, the theory of abuse of power that they have asserted is not something that conforms with the constitutional standard of high crimes and misdemeanors. It depends entirely on subjective intent, and it is subjective intent alone. And as Professor Dershowitz explained, and as I've explained, and I don't mean in the more radical portion of his explanation of his theory, I mean just in terms of what is high crimes and misdemeanors, he explained that something that based, is based entirely on subjective intent is equivalent to maladministration. It's equivalent to exactly the standard that the framers rejected, because it's completely malleable. It doesn't define any real standard for an offense. It allows you to take any conduct that on its face is perfectly permissible, and on the basis of your projection of a disagreement with that conduct, a disagreement with the reasons for it to attribute a bad motive to try to say there's a bad subjective motive for doing that and we'll make it impeachable. That doesn't conform to the constitutional standard. So in, at the common law, they would call the reaction to a charge like this a demur. You demur and simply say, even if everything you say is true, that's not an impeachable offense under the law. And that is an appropriate response here. Even if everything you allege is true, even if John Bolton would say it's true, that is not an impeachable offense under the constitutional standard. Because the way you've tried to define the constitutional standard, this theory of abuse of power is far too malleable. It, 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 doesn't, it goes purely to subjective intent, and it, it can't be relied upon. Then the third level of my answer is this. We've demonstrated that there is a legitimate public policy interest in both of the matters that were raised on that telephone call, the 2016 election interference and the Biden-Burisma affair. Because there is a legitimate public policy interest in both of those issues, even if it were true that there was some connection, even if it were true that the president had suggested and, or thought that, well, maybe I should hold up this aid until they do something, that's perfectly permissible where there is that legitimate public policy interest. It's just the same as if there, there is an investigation going on, the president wants a foreign country to provide some assistance. It's a legitimate foreign policy interest to get that assistance. It's legitimate to use the levers of foreign policy to secure that assistance. So because there is a legitimate public policy interest in both of those issues, and I think we've demonstrated that clearly, it would be permissible for there to be that linkage. But again, I'll close with where I began, which is 
There was no such linkage here. I just want to make that clear. But taking for the sake of argument the question as phrased, even if Ambassador Bolton would testify to that, even if you assumed it were true, there is no impeachable offense stated in the articles of impeachment. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The senator from Illinois. Thank you. Question from Senator Durbin for the House managers. Would you please respond to the answer that was just given by the President's counsel? Senators, uh, it's been a long couple days, so let me be blunt about where I think we are. I think we all know what happened here. I think we all understand what the President did here. I don't think there's really much question at this point about why the military aid was withheld or why President Zelensky couldn't get in the door of the Oval Office. I don't think there's any confusion about why he wanted Joe Biden investigated or why he was pushing the crowd strike conspiracy theory. I don't think there's really much question about that and, and I don't think there's any question about what we could expect if and when John Bolton testifies, although the details of which we certainly don't know. I don't think there's really much question about that. But what's extraordinary is, although they can claim that this was a radical mistake or notion of Professor Dershowitz that they seem to be distancing themselves from right now, I guess they, they, they're accusing Dershowitz now of some maladministration in his argument of the defense, they're still embracing that idea. Because what they just told you, admittedly, in outline of A, B, and C, what they just told you is, accept everything the House said, except the President withheld the military aid to coerce Ukraine into helping him cheat in the election, except that these investigations are a sham, except that he obstructed all subpoenas and witnesses Accept all of that, too bad, there's nothing you can do. That's not impeachable. A President of the United States, this is now where we've come to in this moment of our history, a President of the United States can withhold hundreds of millions of dollars in aid that we appropriated, can do so in violation of the law, can do so to coerce an ally in order to help him cheat in an election and you can't do anything about it except hold up a nomination. That's non-impeachable. They can abuse their power all they want. The president, this president, next president, can abuse their power all they want in the furtherance of their reelection as long, here's the limiting principle, as long as they think their reelection is in the national interest. Well, that's quite a constraint. That's where we've come now after two and a half centuries of our history. I think our founders would be aghast that anyone would make that argument on the floor of the Senate. I think they'd be aghast. You know, having come out of a, a monarchy, having, you know, literally risked their lives, having taken this great gamble that, that people could be entrusted to run their own government and choose their own leaders, recognizing that we are not angels, setting up a system that would have ambition counter ambition, that we would so willingly abdicate that responsibility and say that a chief executive now has the full power to coerce our ally, a foreign power to intervene in our election because they think it's in the national interest that they get reelected. Is that really what we think the founders would have condoned? Or do we think that this is precisely the kind and character of conduct that they provided a remedy for? 
I think we know the answer to that. They, they wrote a beautiful constitution. They understood a lot about human nature. They understood, as we do, that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And they provided a constraint. But it will only be as good and as strong as the men and women of this institution's willingness to uphold it, to not look away from the truth. The truth is staring us in the eyes. We know why they don't want John Bolton to testify. It's not because we don't really know what happened here. They just don't want the American people to hear it in all of its ugly graphic detail. They don't want the president's national security advisor on live TV or even a non-live deposition to say, I talked with the president and he told me in no uncertain terms, John. Thank you, Mr. Manager. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> The Senator from Georgia. Question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senators Hawley, Cruz, Purdue, Gardner, Lankford, Hoven, Scott of Florida, Portman, and Fisher. Thank you. Excuse me. The question from Senator Loeffler and the other senators is for the counsel for the president. As reported by Politico, quote, in January 1999, then Senator Joe Biden argued strongly against deposing additional witnesses or seeking new evidence in a memo sent to fellow Democrats ahead of, <coughs> excuse me, of Bill Clinton's impeachment trial, end quote. Politico reports that Senator Schumer agreed with Biden. Why should the Biden rule not apply here? Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, in a memorandum dated January 5, 1999, that is captioned, Arguments in Support of Summary Impeachment Trial, Senator Biden discussed some history first regarding two Senate impeachment proceedings that were put forward in the Senate that were summarily decided. And this is what he said, these two cases demonstrate that the Senate may dismiss articles of impeachment without holding a full trial or taking any evidence. Put another way, the Constitution does not, <coughs> excuse me, impose on the Senate the duty to hold a trial. In fact, the Senate need not hold a trial even though the House wishes to present evidence and hold a full trial and the elements of jurisdiction are present. He went on to say, in a number of previous impeachment trials, the Senate has reached the judgment that its constitutional role as sole trier of impeachment does not require it to take new evidence or hear live witness testimony. This follows from the Senate's considerations for motions for summary disposition in at least three trials, and it listed the three trials of Judges Ritter, Claiborne, and Nixon. In each, the Senate considered a motion for summary disposition on the merits. In no case did the Senate decline to consider a motion for summary disposition as beyond the Senate's authority or forbidden by the Constitution. The framers did not mean that this political process was to be a partisan process. Instead, they meant it to be political in the higher sense. The process was to be conducted in the way that would best secure the public interest, or in their phrase, the general welfare. That was the Biden doctrine of impeachment proceedings. Now, some members in this chamber agreed with that. Some members that serve on the, as managers also agreed with that. But now the rules are different. The rules are different because Manager Schiff just moments ago did what he's now famous for and created a conversation purportedly from the President of the United States regarding Russia hacking of Burisma. And he did the same thing he did when he started his hearings. So this is a common practice. But if we want to look at common practice and common procedures, the Biden rule is one. I'd like to address something else because we've heard it time and time again about 
Two judges have decided this issue of executive privilege. I want to address two things very quickly. My very first case at the Supreme Court of the United States, and it was a long time ago, over 30, well, 30, over 30 years ago, 33 years ago. My client lost in the district court. They said, well, we'll appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, was not so successful, we didn't win there either. My client said, well, what do we do? I said, well, we have one option. We could file a petition for certiorari to the Supreme Court of the United States. Chances are they're not going to take the case, but at this point, it's an important issue to you, so why don't we proceed? My client agreed to proceed. A petition for certiorari was granted, and the court reversed nine to zero, the Court of Appeals in the District Court. And that's why you continue to utilize courts when appropriate. That's why you do it. And you don't rely on what a district court judge says. And the last thing I want to say, they are asking you, as a Senate body, to waive executive privilege on the President of the United States. Now, I want to think about that for a moment. They are asking you to vote to determine, or have the Chief Justice in his individual capacity as presiding judge, vote to waive executive privilege as it relates to the President of the United States. And that is what they think is the appropriate role for this proceeding to continue. I think you should adopt the Biden rule. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Chief Justice. Yes, the Senator from Colorado. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to send a question to the desk on behalf of myself and Senator Warner. Thank you. Question from Senators Bennett and Warner is to the House managers. Mr. Seculo said that if the Senate votes for witnesses, he will call a long chain of witnesses that will greatly lengthen the trial. Isn't it true that the Senate will establish by majority vote which and how many witnesses there will be? Isn't it also true that prior impeachment trials in the Senate commonly have heard witnesses who did not testify in the House? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I thank the uh, distinguished senators for their questions. Certainly this is the case that all we are asking the Senate to do is to hold a full and fair trial, consistent with the Senate's responsibility. Article 1, Section 3 of this Constitution, the Senate shall have the sole power with respect to an impeachment trial. And this great institution has interpreted that during the 15 different impeachment trials that have taken place during our nation's history. That a full and fair trial means witnesses, because this institution, every time it's held a trial, has heard witnesses all 15 times, including in several instances where there were witnesses who did not testify in the House who testified in the Senate. Now, the point was raised earlier about Benghazi. And Trey Gowdy, he's a good man. I served with him. He's a very talented lawyer. I'm sure he's pleased, the distinguished gentleman from the Palmetto State, that his name has been brought into this proceeding. But Trey Gowdy, according to one of the questions, said that the administration didn't cooperate. The White House, in that instance, and the State Department turned over tens of thousands of documents pursuant to a House subpoena. That's cooperation. Several witnesses appeared voluntarily in Benghazi, including General David Petraeus, former CIA director, Susan Rice, who at the time was the National Security 
advisor, Ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor, Admiral Mike Mullen, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Carter Ham, former Commander of AFRICOM, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, he also showed up. General Michael Flynn, former DIA Director. Who else showed up? The former Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. She testified publicly under oath for 11 hours. That's cooperation. What happened in this particular instance in the House? No documents, no witnesses, no information, no cooperation, no negotiation, no reasonable accommodation, blanket defiance. That's what resulted in the obstruction of Congress article. So all we're asking is for the Senate to hold a fair trial, consistent with past practice. And every single trial the Senate has held, the average number of witnesses is 33. We cannot normalize lawlessness. We cannot normalize corruption. We cannot normalize abuse of power, a fair trial. Lastly, of the witnesses that did testify, voluntarily showed up, what did they have to say? These were Trump administration witnesses. Ambassador Sondland, how did he characterize the shakedown scheme, the geopolitical shakedown at the heart of these allegations? Ambassador Sondland, quid pro quo. Ambassador Taylor, crazy. Dr. Fiona Hill, a domestic political errand. Lieutenant Colonel Vinman, improper. John Bolton, drug deal. What would the framers have said? The highest of high crimes against the Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Manager. I have a question. The Senator from Utah. I have a question to send to the desk. Thank you. The question from Senator Romney is for both parties, and I believe the House manager will go first. Uh, do you have any evidence that anyone was directed by President Trump to tell the Ukrainians that security assistance was being held upon the condition of an investigation into the Bidens? Uh, Senator, the evidence that's currently in the record, there are two people who had direct conversations with the President about the conditioning of aid on the performance of the investigations. Uh, the first was Gordon Sondland, who on September 7th had a conversation with the President that thereafter he related to Tim Morrison uh, as well as Ambassador Taylor. And in the conversation that Ambassador Sondland described at the time, he said the President on the one hand said no quid pro quo, but then went on to say that Zelensky has to announce these investigations and he should want to. So the President made the direct link to Ambassador Sondland. Ambassador Sondland then made the direct link, uh, or had already made the direct link to uh, Andrei Yermak, but after the conversation with the President, had a conversation with Zelensky himself and conveyed what he had been informed by the President that Zelensky was gonna have to conduct these investigations. Uh, and that's when Zelensky made the commitment to go on CNN. So Ambassador Sondland has acknowledged the tie between the two. Uh, so did Mick Mulvaney. Um, and I think that video is now etched in our minds for all of history. Um, walk, try to walk that back as he may. He was quite adamant when he was asked about that. And the reporter even followed up when he said that part of the reason why they held up the aid was the desire for this investigation into 2016. And the reporter said, well, well, what you're saying is a quid pro quo. You don't get the money unless you do this, the investigation of the Democrats. And the chief of staff's answer was, 
We do it all the time. Get over it. So you have it from the President's own Chief of Staff. You have it from one of the three amigos, one of the President's point people. And, and bear in mind, Ambassador Sondland, of course, not a never-Trumper, million-dollar donor to the Trump inaugural, someone the President deputized uh, to have a, a significant part of the Ukraine portfolio, someone who, given that he's the EU ambassador, if this was about burden sharing, would have said this was about a burden sharing, but he didn't, of course. He said it was about the investigations. The third direct witness will be John Bolton, uh, if we are allowed to bring him before you. But there already are witnesses and evidence in the record of people who spoke directly to the President about this. Uh, and to which the conditionality was made clear. After the conversation... Mr. Chief Justice. Senator, thank you for your question. I believe the question was, is there any evidence that anyone told that President Trump had anyone tell the Ukrainians directly that the aid was linked? I believe that that was the question. Uh, and the answer in the House record is no. And I described this on Saturday when I walked through at length, and so I'd refer back to that presentation, Ambassador Sondland and Senator Johnson. Uh, Ambassador Sondland indicated in approximately the September 9th time frame, as we all heard the statement, he asked the President, and the President said, I want nothing, I want nothing, I want no quid pro quo. And you've heard a lot from the House managers about go out to the microphones or make, he needs to do the right thing, but I believe the statement was he needs to do the right thing, he needs to do what he campaigned on. Even earlier, Senator Johnson, again, because Ambassador Sondland told, Ambassador, told Senator Johnson that there was a linkage. So Senator Johnson asked the President directly, and we know the answer to that. The President said, was there any connect, when Senator Johnson asked if there were, was any connection between security assistance and investigations, the President answered, no way, I would never do that. Who told you that? And the answer was Sondland. And Ambassador Sondland had come to that presumption prior to speaking to the President. And we saw the montage from Ambassador Sondland about presumptions and assumptions and guessing and speculating and belief. So we also remember the montage in which Ambassador Sondland was asked, did anyone on the planet tell you that the aid was linked to the investigations? And his answer was no. So in the House record before us, there is no evidence that the President told anyone to tell the Ukrainians that the aid was linked. And in fact, the article from the Daily Beast yesterday Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Oregon. Mr. Chief Justice, I send a question to the desk for Senator Schatz, for Senator Carper, and for myself. Thank you. The question is for the House managers from Senators Merkley, uh, Schatz, and Carper. Yesterday, Alan Dershowitz stated that a president cannot be impeached for soliciting foreign interference in his re-election campaign if he thinks it's in the public interest. The president's counsel stated that the president cannot be prosecuted for committing a crime. And the president himself has said, quote, I have the right to do whatever I want as president, end quote. Aren't these views exactly what our framers warned about, an imperial president escaping accountability? If these arguments prevail, 
won't future presidents have the unchecked ability to use, <coughs> to use their office to manipulate future elections like corrupt foreign leaders in Russia and Venezuela? Senator, thank you uh, for the question, Senators. Um, before I address it, I just want to complete my answer to the, the last question. On September 7th, the President has a conversation with Gordon Sondland. And the President says, no quid pro quo, but Zelensky has got to go to the mic and he should want to do so. This is in the context of whether the aid is being withheld in order to secure the investigations. After that call, on the same day, Sondland calls Zelensky, the President of Ukraine, and says, you're not going to get the money unless you do the investigations. So you've got the communication between the President and Sondland, and Sondland conveying the message to the Ukrainians uh, in short succession. Um, and so I think you see that the message the President gave to Sondland was in fact communicated immediately to the Ukrainians. Uh, and of course, Sondland went on to explain to Ambassador Taylor and to Tim Morrison that the President wanted Zelensky in a public box. And what was meant by that is he wanted to have to go out and announce publicly these investigations if he was going to get the money. Remember, Sondland explained that the President's a businessman, and before he gives away something, he wants to, before he signs the check, he wants to get the deliverable. And Ambassador Taylor says, that doesn't make any sense. Ukraine doesn't owe him anything. So it was clear to everyone, including the Ukrainians, they weren't going to get the money unless they did the investigations that the President wanted. Uh, and that's the, the connection on September 7th makes it crystal clear. Um, in terms of the Dershowitz argument, when coupled with a President who believes that under Article 2 he can do whatever he wants, Yes, I mean, this is a prescription of a president, not just an imperial president, but an absolute president with absolute power. Because if a president can take this action and extort one country, he can extort any country. Uh, if he can make a deal with the president of Venezuela or take an action antagonistic to what Congress uh, has legislated with respect to that country, can violate the law in doing it to get help in his reelection. And I think that example that Senator King asked about is directly on point. There's no limiting principle here as long as the president thinks it's in the interest of his reelection. So, yes, he can ask the Israeli prime minister to come to the United States and call his opponent an anti Semite if he wants to get. U.S. military aid. And that principle can be applied anywhere to anything, to the grave danger of the country. That is the logical extension, not just of what Professor Dershowitz said yesterday, but to what the President's Council said today. You can accept every fact in the articles. We still think it's fine and beyond the reach of the Constitution. The President can extort an ally by withholding military aid, can with hold meetings, can ask them to do sham investigations, even if you acknowledge the fact that they are sham, in fact, they don't even have to be done, they just have to be announced, and there's nothing Congress can do about it. Now, that is a prescription for a president with, with no constraint. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Indiana. I, along with uh, Senator Lee, sent to the desk a question for the President's counsel. Thank you. Question from Senators Braun and Lee is for the counsel for the President. Under Professor Dershowitz's theory, is what Joe Biden is alleged to have done potentially impeachable in contrast to what has been alleged against President Trump?
Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, thank you for the question. Uh, and I believe that under uh, Professor Dershowitz's theory, remember he um, tried to categorize things into three buckets. One is purely good motives. One is, well, you might have some motive for your personal political gain as well as um, public interest motives for doing something or intent. And then there was the third bucket of purely private pecuniary gain. And he said, that's the one if you're doing it for purely private pecuniary gain, that's a problem. And I think that would be the distinguishing factor in the, what is potentially uh, present in the facts known about the Biden and Burisma incident. Because the conflict of interest that would be apparent on the face of the facts that are known is that there would be a personal family financial interest in that situation. Vice President Biden is in charge of Ukraine policy. His son is sitting on the board of a company that is known for corruption. The public reports are that apparently the, the prosecutor general was investigating that company and its owner, the oligarch at the time. Then Vice President Biden has quite openly said that he leveraged a billion dollars in US loan guarantees to ensure that that particular prosecutor was fired at that time, one could put together fairly easily from those known facts the suggestion that there was a family financial benefit coming from the end of that investigation because it protected the position of the younger Biden on the board. Um, so, and that would be a purely private pecuniary financial gain. That's the third bucket that Professor Dershowitz was describing and the one that is necessarily problematic where he said, that's where there's going to be a problem. That's where you would have a crime and a potentially impeachable offense. So I think that would be the distinction there, that that is one that, if all of those facts lined up uh, under Professor Dershowitz's categorization of things, would be the problematic category. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Chief Justice, on behalf of myself and Senator Cardin and Senator Van Hollen, I have a question for the House managers that I will submit to the desk. Thank you. Question from Senator Klobuchar uh, and the other senators. Yeah, it's this one. I'm sorry. This one's from Senator Cardin. I think this is the right question, if, and it, it is directed to the House managers. Uh, no, we don't have the question before us. From Senator Cardin. Thank you very much. The question from Senator Klobuchar is to the House managers. Could you please respond to the answer just given by the President's counsel and provide any other comments the Senate would benefit from hearing before we adjourn for the evening? Mr. Chief Justice, members of the uh, Senate, We've just heard from the House, from the uh, President's counsel, is the usual nonsense. There are only three, as we draw to a close tonight, there are only three things to remember. One, this is a trial. As a trial, as any 10 year old knows, we should have witnesses. We are told we can't have witnesses because, after all, the House says we proved our case, as we have. And so why should we need witnesses? 
Well, that's like saying that in a bank robbery, the DA announces that he's proved his case. He's had all the witnesses. And then an eyewitness shows up, and he shouldn't be allowed to testify because, after all, the DA was sure he proved his case first. That's absurd. Any 10-year-old knows it's absurd. And that's the president's case against witnesses, that we've had enough. There's always more. There aren't too many more here. But the fact is, when there are witnesses to be asked, they should be asked. Second, there's only one real question in this trial. Everything else is a distraction, a three-card Monty game being played by the President's counsel. Distractions. Don't look at the real question. Look at everything else. Everything else irrelevant. Look at the whistleblower. Irrelevant. Look at the House procedures. Irrelevant. Look at Hunter Biden. Irrelevant. Look at whether President Obama's policy was as good as or better than President Trump's policy with respect to uh, Ukraine. Irrelevant. Look at the Steele dossier. Irrelevant. There's only one relevant question. Did the President abuse his power by violating the law to withhold military aid from a foreign country to extort that country into helping him, into helping his reelection campaign by slandering his opponent? That's the only relevant question for this trial. The House managers have proved that question beyond any doubt. The one thing the House managers, the President's counsel got right was quoting me as saying it was beyond any doubt. It is indeed beyond any doubt. That's why all these distractions. That's why the President's people are telling you to avoid witnesses, because they are afraid of the witnesses. They know the witnesses they know Mr. Bolton and others will only strengthen the case. And yes, we hear, well, if the House managers say the case is so strong, why do you need more witnesses? Because the truth can be bolstered. I yield back. Thank you, counsel. The majority leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I ask unanimous consent that the trial adjourn until 1 p.m. Friday, January 31st. Without objection, the trial is adjourned. And that concludes the senator's 16 hours of asking questions. They'll be back tomorrow at 1 p.m. In the meantime, we want to get your reaction to what you've heard. 175 or so questions were asked of the House impeachment managers and the Trump defense team. 202 is the area code for all of our numbers, 7488920. If you live in the East and Central time zones, 202-228-2020.